Story 86 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Fox and the Geese. The fox once came to a meadow in which was a flock of fine fat geese, on which he smiled and said, I come in the nick of time. You are sitting together quite beautifully, so that I can eat you up one after the other. The geese cackled with terror, sprang up and began to wail and beg piteously for their lives. But the fox would listen to nothing and said, There is no mercy to be had. You must die. At length one of them took heart and said, If we poor geese are to yield up our vigorous young lives, show us the only possible favor, and allow us one more prayer, that we may not die in our sins, and then we will place ourselves in a row, so that you can always pick yourself out the fattest. Yes, said the fox, that is reasonable and a pious request. Pray away, and I will wait till you are done. Then the first began a good long prayer, forever saying, Ga, ga, and as she would make no end, the second did not wait until her turn came, but began also, Ga, ga. The third and fourth followed her, and soon they were all cackling together. When they have done praying, the story shall be continued further, but at present they are still praying without stopping. End of story 86「Story 87 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Household Tales » by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Poor Man and the Rich Man In olden times, when the Lord himself still used to walk about on this earth amongst men, it once happened that he was tired and overtaken by the darkness before he could reach an inn. Now there stood on the road before him two houses facing each other, the one large and beautiful, the other small and poor. The large one belonged to a rich man, and the small one to a poor man. Then the Lord thought, I shall be no burden to the rich man. I will stay the night with him. When the rich man heard someone knocking at his door, he opened the window and asked the stranger what he wanted. The Lord answered, I only ask for a night's lodging. Then the rich man looked at the traveler from head to foot, and as the Lord was wearing common clothes, and did not look like one who had much money in his pocket, he shook his head and said, No, I cannot take you in. My rooms are full of herbs and seeds, and if I were to lodge every one who knocked at my door, I might very soon go begging myself. Go somewhere else for a lodging. And with this, he shut down the window and left the Lord standing there. So the Lord turned his back on the rich man, and went across to the small house and knocked. He had hardly done so when the poor man opened the little door and bade the traveller come in. "'Pass the night with me. It is already dark,' said he. "'You cannot go any further to-night.' This pleased the Lord, and he went in. The poor man's wife shook hands with him and welcomed him, and said he was to make himself at home and put up with what they had got. They had not much to offer him, but what they had, they would give him with all their hearts. So she put the potatoes on the fire, and while they were boiling, she milked the goat, that they might have a little milk with them. When the cloth was laid, the Lord sat down with the man and his wife, and he enjoyed their coarse food, for there were happy faces at the table. When they had had supper, and it was bedtime, the woman called her husband apart and said, Hark you, dear husband, let us make up a bed of straw for ourselves to-night, and then the poor traveller can sleep in our bed, and have a good rest, for he has been walking the whole day through, and that makes one weary. With all my heart, 
he answered, I will go and offer it to him. And he went to the stranger and invited him, if he had no objection, to sleep in their bed and rest his limbs properly. But the Lord was unwilling to take their bed from the two old folks. However, they would not be satisfied until, at length, he did it, and lay down in their bed while they themselves lay on some straw on the ground. Next morning they got up before daybreak and made as good a breakfast as they could for the guest. When the sun shone in through the little window, and the Lord had got up, he again ate with them, and then prepared to set out on his journey. But as he was standing at the door, he turned round and said, As you are so kind and good, you may wish three things for yourselves, and I will grant them. Then the man said, What else should I wish for but eternal happiness, and that we too, as long as we live, may be healthy, and have every day our daily bread? For the third wish I do not know what to have. And the Lord said to him, Will you wish for a new house instead of this old one? Oh, yes, said the man. If I can have that too, I should like it very much. And the Lord fulfilled his wish and changed their old house into a new one, again gave them his blessing, and went on. The sun was high when the rich man got up and leaned out of his window and saw on the opposite side of the way a new clean-looking house with red tiles and bright windows where the old hut used to be. He was very much astonished, and called his wife and said to her, "'Tell me, what can have happened?' Last night there was a miserable little hut standing there, and today there is a beautiful new house. Run over and see how that came to pass. So his wife went and asked the poor man, and he said to her, Yesterday evening a traveler came here and asked for a night's lodging, and this morning when he took leave of us, he granted us three wishes, eternal happiness, health during this life, and our daily bread as well, and besides this a beautiful new house instead of our old hut. When the rich man's wife heard this, she ran back in haste and told her husband how it happened. The man said, I could tear myself to pieces if I had but known that. The traveler came to our house too and wanted to sleep here, and I sent him away. Quick, said his wife, get on your horse. You can still catch that man up, and then you must ask to have three wishes granted to you. The rich man followed the good counsel and galloped away on his horse and soon came up with the Lord. He spoke to him softly and pleasantly and begged him not to take it amiss that he had not let him in directly. He was looking for the front door key and in the meantime the stranger had gone away. If he returned the same way he must come and stay with him. Yes, said the Lord, if I ever come back again I will do so. Then the rich man asked if he might not wish for three things, too, as his neighbor had done. Yes, said the Lord. He might, but it would not be to his advantage, and he had better not wish for anything. But the rich man thought that he could easily ask for something, which would add to his happiness, if only he knew that it would be granted. So the Lord said to him, Ride home, then, and three wishes which you shall form shall be fulfilled. The rich man had now gained what he wanted, so he rode home and began to consider what he should wish for. As he was thus thinking, he let the bridle fall and the horse began to caper about, so that he was continually disturbed in his meditations and could not collect his thoughts at all. He patted its neck and said, Gently, Lisa. But the horse only began new tricks. Then at last he was angry and cried quite impatiently, I wish your neck was broken. Directly he had said the words, down the horse fell on the ground, and there it lay dead, and never moved again. And thus was his first wish fulfilled. As he was miserly by nature, he did not like to leave the harness lying there, so he cut it off and put it on his back, and now he had to go on foot. I still have two wishes left said he, and comforted himself with that thought. And now, as he was walking slowly through the sand, 
and the sun was burning hot at noonday, he grew quite hot-tempered and angry. The saddle hurt his back, and he had not yet any idea what to wish for. If I were to wish for all the riches and treasures in the world, said he to himself, I should still to think of all kinds of other things later on. I knew that beforehand, but I will manage so that there is nothing at all left me to wish for afterwards. Then he sighed and said, Ah, if I were but that Bavarian peasant who likewise had three wishes granted to him, I knew quite well what to do, and in the first place wished for a great deal of beer, and in the second for as much beer as he was able to drink, and in the third for a barrel of beer into the bargain. Many a time he thought he had found it, but then it seemed to him to be, after all, too little. Then it came into his mind, what an easy life his wife had, for she stayed home in a cool room and enjoyed herself. This really did vex him, and before he was aware, he said, I just wish she was sitting there on the saddle and could not get off it, instead of my having to drag it along on my back. And, as the last word was spoken, the saddle disappeared from his back, and he saw that his second wish had been fulfilled. Then he really did feel warm. He began to run and wanted to be quite alone in his own room at home to think of something really large for his last wish. But when he arrived there and opened the parlor door, he saw his wife sitting in the middle of the room on the saddle, crying and complaining and quite unable to get off it. So he said, Do bear it, and I will wish for all the riches on earth for thee, only stay where thou art. She, however, called him a fool, and said, What good will all the riches on earth do me, if I am to sit on the saddle? Thou hast wished me on it, so thou must help me off. So, whether he would or not, he was forced to let his third wish be that she would be quit of the saddle and able to get off it, and immediately the wish was fulfilled. So he got nothing by it but vexation, trouble, abuse, and the loss of his horse. But the poor people lived happily, quietly, and piously until their happy death. End of story 87「Story 88 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Singing Springing Lark. There was once on a time a man who was about to set out on a long journey, and on parting he asked his three daughters what he should bring back with him for them, whereupon the eldest wished for pearls, the second wished for diamonds, but the third said, Dear father, I should like a singing, soaring lark. The father said, Yes, if I can get it, you shall have it, kissed all three and set out. Now, when the time had come for him to be on his way home again, he had brought pearls and diamonds for the two eldest, but he had sought everywhere in vain for a singing, soaring lark for the youngest, and he was very unhappy about it, for she was his favorite child. Then his road lay through a forest, and in the midst of it was a splendid castle, and near the castle stood a tree, but quite on top of the tree he saw a singing, soaring lark, "'Ah, you come just at the right moment,' he said, quite delighted, and called to his servant to climb up and fetch the little creature. But as he approached the tree, a lion leapt from beneath it, shook himself, and roared till the leaves on the trees trembled. "'He who tries to steal my singing, soaring lark,' he cried, "'will I devour.' Then the man said, "'I did not know that the bird belonged to thee.' I will make amends for the wrong I have done, and ransom myself with a large sum of money. Only spare my life. The lion said, Nothing can save thee unless thou wilt promise to give me for my own what first meets thee on thy return home. 
and if thou wilt do that, I will grant thee thy life, and thou shalt have the bird for thy daughter, into the bargain. And the man hesitated and said, That might be my youngest daughter. She loves me best, and always runs to meet me on my return home. The servant, however, was terrified and said, Why should your daughter be the very one to meet you? It might as easily be a cat or a dog. Then the man allowed himself to be over-persuaded, took the singing, soaring lark, and promised to give the lion whatsoever should first meet him on his return home. When he reached home and entered his house, the first who met him was no other than his youngest and dearest daughter, who came running up, kissed and embraced him, and when she saw that he had brought with him a singing, soaring lark, she was beside herself with joy. The father, however, could not rejoice, but began to weep and said, My dearest child, I have bought the little bird dear. In return for it, I have been obliged to promise thee to a savage lion, and when he has thee, he will tear thee in pieces and devour thee. And he told her all, just as it had happened, and begged her not to go there, come what might. But she consoled him and said, Dearest father, indeed your promise must be fulfilled. I will go thither and soften the lion, so that I may return to thee safely. Next morning she had the road pointed out to her, took leave, and went fearlessly out into the forest. The lion, however, was an enchanted prince, and was by day a lion, and all his people were lions with him. But in the night they resumed their natural human shapes. On her arrival she was kindly received and led into the castle. When the night came, the lion turned into a handsome man, and their wedding was celebrated with great magnificence. They lived happily together, remained awake at night, and slept in the daytime. One day he came and said, "'Tomorrow there is a feast in thy father's house, because your eldest sister is to be married, and if thou art inclined to go there, my lion shall conduct thee,' she said. "'Yes, I should very much like to see my father again,' and went thither, accompanied by the lions. There was great joy when she arrived, for they had all believed that she had been torn in pieces by the lion, and had long ceased to live. But she told them what a handsome husband she had, and how well off she was, remained with them while the wedding feast lasted, and then went back again to the forest. When the second daughter was about to be married, and she was again invited to the wedding, she said to the lion, This time I will not be alone. Thou must come with me. The lion, however, said that it was too dangerous for him, for if when there a ray from a burning candle fell on him, he would be changed into a dove, and for seven years long would have to fly about with the doves. She said, Ah, but do come with me. I will take great care of thee, and guard thee from all light. So they went away together, and took with them their little child as well. She had a chamber built there, so strong and thick, that no ray could pierce through it. In this he was to shut himself up, when the candles were lit for the wedding feast. But the door was made of green wood, which warped and left a little crack, which no one noticed. The wedding was celebrated with magnificence, but when the procession with all its candles and torches came back from church and passed by this apartment, a ray about the breadth of a hair fell on the king's son, and when this ray touched him he was transformed in an instant, and when she came in and looked for him, she did not see him, but a white dove was sitting there. The dove said to her, For seven years must I fly about the world, but at every seventh step that you take, I will let fall a drop of red blood and a white feather, and these will show thee the way, and if thou followest the trace, thou canst release me. Thereupon the dove flew out at the door, and she followed him, and at every seventh step a red drop of blood and a little white feather fell down and showed her the way. So she went continually further and further in the wide world, never looking about her or resting, and the seven years were almost past. Then she rejoiced, and thought that they would soon be delivered, 
and yet they were so far from it. Once, when they were thus moving onwards, no little feather and no drop of red blood fell, and when she raised her eyes, the dove had disappeared, and as she thought to herself, In this no man can help thee, she climbed up to the sun and said to him, Thou shinest into every crevice, and over every peak. Hast thou not seen a white dove flying? No, said the sun, I have seen none, but I present thee with a casket. Open it when thou art in sorest need. Then she thanked the sun, and went on until evening came, and the moon appeared. She then asked her, Thou shinest the whole night through, on every field and every forest. Hast thou not seen a white dove flying? No, said the moon, I have seen no dove, but here I give thee an egg, break it when thou art in great need. She thanked the moon and went on until the night wind came up and blew on her. Then she said to it, Thou blowest over every tree and under every leaf. Hast thou not seen a white dove flying? No, said the night wind, I have seen none, but I will ask the three other winds. Perhaps they have seen it. The east wind and the west wind came and had seen nothing. But the south wind said, I have seen the white dove. It has flown to the Red Sea, where it has become a lion again, for the seven years are over, and the lion is there fighting with a dragon. The dragon, however, is an enchanted princess. The night wind then said to her, I will advise thee. Go to the Red Sea. On the right bank are some tall reeds. Count them. Break off the eleventh, and strike the dragon with it then the lion will be able to subdue it, and both then will regain their human form. After that, look around, and thou wilt see the griffin, which is by the Red Sea. Swing thyself with thy beloved onto his back, and the bird will carry you over the sea to your own home. Here is a nut for thee. When thou art above the center of the sea, let the nut fall. It will immediately shoot up, and a tall nut tree will grow out of the water on which the griffin may rest, for if he cannot rest, he will not be strong enough to carry you across, and if thou forgettest to throw down the nut, he will let you fall into the sea. Then she went thither, and found everything as the night wind had said. She counted the reeds by the sea, and cut off the eleven, struck the dragon therewith, whereupon the lion overcame it, and immediately both of them regained their human shapes. But when the princess, who had before been the dragon, was delivered from enchantment, she took the youth by the arm, seated herself on the griffin, and carried him off with her. There stood the poor maiden, who had wandered so far, and was again forsaken. She sat down and cried, but at last she took courage and said, Still I will go as far as the wind blows and as long as the cock crows, until I find him. And she went forth by long, long roads, until at last she came to the castle, where both of them were living together. There she heard that soon a feast was to be held, in which they would celebrate their wedding. But she said, God still helps me, and opened the casket that the sun had given her. A dress lay therein as brilliant as the sun itself. So she took it out and put it on, and went up into the castle, and every one, even the bride herself, looked at her with astonishment. The dress pleased the bride so well that she thought it might do for her wedding dress, and asked if it was for sale. Not for money or land, answered she, but for flesh and blood. The bride asked her what she meant by that, so she said, Let me sleep a night in the chamber where the bridegroom sleeps. The bride would not, yet wanted very much to have the dress. At last she consented, but the page was to give the prince a sleeping draught. When it was night, therefore, and the youth was already asleep, she was led into the chamber. She seated herself on the bed and said, I have followed after thee for seven years. I have been to the sun and the moon and the four winds and have inquired for thee and have helped thee against the dragon. Wilt thou then quite forget me? 
but the prince slept so soundly that it only seemed to him as if the wind were whistling outside in the fir trees when therefore day broke she was led out again and had to give up the golden dress and as that even had been of no avail she was sad went out into a meadow sat down there and wept while she was sitting there she thought of the egg which the moon had given her she opened it and there came out a clucking hen with twelve chickens all of gold and they ran about chirping and crept again under the old hen's wings nothing more beautiful was ever seen in the world then she arose and drove them through the meadow before her until the bride looked out of the window the little chickens pleased her so much that she immediately came down and asked if they were for sale not for money or land but for flesh and blood let me sleep another night in the chamber where the bridegroom sleeps the bride said yes intending to cheat her as on the former evening but when the prince went to bed he asked the page what the murmuring and rustling in the night had been on this the page told all that he had been forced to give him a sleeping draught because a poor girl had slept secretly in the chamber and that he was to give him another that night the prince said pour out the draught by the bedside at night she was again led in and when she began to relate how ill all had fared with her he immediately recognized his beloved wife by her voice sprang up and cried now i really am released i have been as it were in a dream for the strange princess has bewitched me so that i have been compelled to forget thee but god has delivered me from the spell at the right time then they both left the castle secretly in the night for they feared the father of the princess who was a sorcerer and they seated themselves on the griffin which bore them across the red sea and when they were in the midst of it she let fall the nut immediately a tall nut tree grew up whereon the bird rested and then carried them home where they found their child who had grown tall and beautiful and they lived thenceforth happily until their death End of story 88、Storyeighty-nine-of-household-tales.This-is-a-LibriVox-recording.All-LibriVox-recordings-are-in-the-public-domain.For-more-information-or-to-volunteer.Please-visit-LibriVox.org.Recording-by-Jennifer-Fournier
and lie down and drink out of the water. I don't choose to be your servant. So in her great thirst the princess alighted, bent down over the water in the stream and drank, and was not allowed to drink out of the golden cup. Then she said, Ah, heaven! And the three drops of blood answered, If thy mother knew, her heart would break. But the king's daughter was humble, said nothing, and mounted her horse again. She rode some miles further, but the day was warm, the sun scorched her, and she was thirsty once more. And when they came to a stream of water, she again cried to her waiting maid, Dismount, and give me some water in my golden cup, for she had long ago forgotten the girl's ill words. But the waiting maid said still more haughtily, If you wish to drink, drink as you can. I don't choose to be your maid. Then, in her great thirst, the king's daughter alighted, bent over the flowing stream, wept, and said, Ah, heaven! And the drops of blood again replied, If thy mother knew this, her heart would break. And as she was thus drinking and leaning right over the stream, the handkerchief with the three drops of blood fell out of her bosom and floated away with the water without her observing it, so great was her trouble. The waiting maid, however, had seen it, and she rejoiced to think that she had now power over the bride. For since the princess had lost the drops of blood, she had become weak and powerless. So now, when she wanted to mount her horse again, the one that was called Falada, the waiting maid said, Falada is more suitable for me, and my nag will do for thee. And the princess had to be content with that. Then the waiting maid, with many hard words, bade the princess exchange her royal apparel for her own shabby clothes, and at length she was compelled to swear by the clear sky above her that she would not say one word of this to anyone at the royal court, and if she had not taken this oath, she would have been killed on the spot. But Falada saw all this, and observed it well. The waiting maid now mounted Falada, and the true bride the bad horse, and thus they traveled onwards, until at length they entered the royal palace. There were great rejoicings over her arrival, and the prince sprang forward to meet her, lifted the waiting maid from her horse, and thought she was his consort. She was conducted upstairs, but the real princess was left standing below. Then the old king looked out of the window, and saw her standing in the courtyard, and how dainty and delicate and beautiful she was, and instantly went to the royal apartment and asked the bride about the girl she had with her, who was standing down below in the courtyard, and who she was. I picked her up on my way for a companion. Give the girl something to work at, that she may not stand idle. But the old king had no work for her, and knew of none. So he said, I have a little boy who tends the geese. She may help him. The boy was called Conrad, and the true bride had to help him to tend the geese. Soon afterwards, the false bride said to the young king, Dearest husband, I beg you do me a favor. He answered, I will do so most willingly. Then send for the knacker and have the head of the horse on which I rode here cut off, for it vexed me on the way. In reality, she was afraid that the horse might tell how she had behaved to the king's daughter. Then she succeeded in making the king promise that it should be done, and the faithful Falada was to die. This came to the ears of the real princess, and she secretly promised to pay the knacker a piece of gold if he would perform a small service for her. There was a great, dark-looking gateway in the town, through which morning and evening she had to pass with the geese. Would he be so good as to nail up Falada's head on it, so that she might see him again more than once? The knacker's man promised to do that, and cut off the head, and nailed it fast beneath the dark gateway. Early in the morning, when she and Conrad drove out their flock beneath this gateway, she said in passing, Alas, Falada, hanging there? Then the head answered, Alas, young queen, how ill you fare! If this your tender mother knew, 
her heart would surely break in two. Then they went still further out of the town, and drove their geese into the country. And when they had come to the meadow, she sat down and unbound her hair, which was like pure gold. And Conrad saw it, and delighted in its brightness, and wanted to pluck out a few hairs. Then she said, Blow, blow thou gentle wind, I say, blow Conrad's little hat away, and make him chase it here and there, until I have braided all my hair and bound it up again. And there came such a violent wind that it blew Conrad's hat far away across country, and he was forced to run after it. When he came back, she had finished combing her hair and was putting it up again, and he could not get any of it. Then Conrad was angry and would not speak to her, and thus they watched the geese until the evening, and then they went home. Next day, when they were driving the geese out through the dark gateway, the maiden said, Alas, Falada, hanging there? Falada answered, Alas, young queen, how ill you fare! If this your tender mother knew, her heart would surely break in two. And she sat down again in the field and began to comb out her hair, and Conrad ran and tried to clutch it. So she said in haste, Blow, blow, thou gentle wind, I say, blow Conrad's little hat away, and make him chase it here and there, until I have braided all my hair and bound it up again. Then the wind blew and blew his little hat off his head and far away, and Conrad was forced to run after it. And when he came back, her hair had been put up a long time, and he could get none of it. And so they looked after their geese till evening came. But in the evening after they got home, Conrad went to the old king and said, I won't tend the geese with that girl any longer. Why not? inquired the aged king. Oh, because she vexes me the whole day long. Then the aged king commanded him to relate what it was that she did to him. And Conrad said, In the morning, when we pass beneath the dark gateway with the flock, there is a sorry horse's head on the wall, and she says to it, Alas, Falada, hanging there. And the head replies, Alas, young queen, how ill you fare. If this your tender mother knew, her heart would surely break in two. And Conrad went on to relate what happened on the goose pasture, and how, when there, he had to chase his hat. The aged king commanded him to drive his flock out again next day, and as soon as morning came, he placed himself behind the dark gateway, and heard how the maiden spoke to the head of Falada. And then he too went into the country, and hid himself in the thicket in the meadow. There he soon saw with his own eyes the goose girl and the goose boy bringing their flock, and how after a while she sat down and unplaited her hair, which shone with radiance. And soon she said, Blow, blow, thou gentle wind, I say, blow Conrad's little hat away, and make him chase it here and there, until I have braided all my hair and bound it up again. Then came a blast of wind and carried off Conrad's hat, so that he had to run far away, while the maiden quietly went on combing and plaiting her hair, all of which the king observed. Then, quite unseen, he went away, and when the goose girl came home in the evening, he called her aside and asked why she did all these things. I may not tell you that, and I dare not lament my sorrows to any human being, for I have sworn not to do so by the heaven which is above me. If I had not done that, I should have lost my life. He urged her and left her no peace, but he could draw nothing from her. Then he said, If thou wilt not tell me anything, tell thy sorrows to the iron stove there. And he went away. Then she crept into the iron stove and began to weep and lament and emptied her whole heart and said, Here am I, deserted by the whole world, and yet I am a king's daughter, and a false waiting maid has by force brought me to such a pass that I have been compelled to put off my royal apparel, and she has taken my place with my bridegroom, 
and I have to perform menial service as a goose girl. If my mother did but know that, her heart would break. The aged king, however, was standing outside by the pipe of the stove, and was listening to what she said and heard it. Then he came back again and bade her come out of the stove, and royal garments were placed on her, and it was marvelous how beautiful she was. The aged king summoned his son and revealed to him that he had got the false bride, who was only a waiting maid, but that the true one was standing there as the sometime goose girl. The young king rejoiced with all his heart when he saw her beauty and youth, and a great feast was made ready to which all the people and all good friends were invited. At the head of the table sat the bridegroom with the king's daughter on one side of him and the waiting maid on the other. But the waiting maid was blinded and did not recognize the princess in her dazzling array. When they had eaten and drunk and were merry, the aged king asked the waiting maid as a riddle, what a person deserved who had behaved in such and such a way to her master, and at the same time related the whole story, and asked what sentence such a one merited. Then the false bride said, she deserves no better fate than to be stripped entirely naked and put in a barrel which is studded inside with pointed nails, and two white horses should be harnessed to it, which will drag her along through one street after another till she is dead. It is thou, said the aged king, and thou hast pronounced thine own sentence, and thus shall it be done unto thee. And when the sentence had been carried out, the young king married his true bride, and both of them reigned over their kingdom in peace and happiness. End of 89「ninety of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt. The Young Giant once on a time a countryman had a son who was as big as a thumb and did not become any bigger and during several years did not grow one hair's breadth once when the father was going out to plow the little one said father i will go out with you thou wouldst go out with me said the father stay here thou wilt be of no use out there besides thou mightest get lost then Thumbling began to cry, and for the sake of peace his father put him in his pocket and took him with him. When he was outside in the field, he took him out again and set him in a freshly cut furrow. Whilst he was there, a great giant came over the hill. Do thou see that great boogie? said the father, for he wanted to frighten the little fellow to make him good. He is coming to fetch thee. The giant, however, had scarcely taken two steps with his long legs before he was in the furrow he took up little thumbling carefully with two fingers examined him and without saying one word went away with him his father stood by but could not utter a sound for terror and he thought nothing else but that his child was lost and that as long as he lived he should never set eyes on him again the giant however carried him home suckled him and thumbling grew and became tall and strong after the manner of giants when two years had passed, the old giant took him into the forest, wanted to try him, and said, Pull up a stick for thyself. Then the boy was already so strong that he tore up a young tree out of the earth by the roots. But the giant thought, We must do better than that, took him back again, and suckled him two years longer. When he tried him, his strength had increased so much that he could tear an old tree out of the ground. That was still not enough for the giant. He again suckled him for two years, and when he then went with him into the forest and said, Now just tear up a proper stick for me. The boy tore up the strongest oak tree from the earth, so that it split, and that was a mere trifle to him. Now that will do, said the giant. Thou art perfect, 
and took him back to the field from whence he had brought him. His father was there following the plough. The young giant went up to him and said, Does my father see what a fine man his son has grown into? The farmer was alarmed and said, No, thou art not my son. I don't want thee. Leave me. Truly I am your son. Allow me to do your work. I can plough as well as you, nay, better. No, no, thou art not my son, and thou canst not plough. Go away. However, as he was afraid of this great man, he left go of the plough, stepped back, and stood at one side of the piece of land. Then the youth took the plough, and just pressed it with one hand, but his grasp was so strong that the plough went deep into the earth. The farmer could not bear to see that, and called to him, If thou art determined to plough, thou must not press so hard on it. That makes bad work. The youth, however, unharnessed the horses and drew the plough himself, saying, Just go home, father, and bid my mother make ready a large dish of food, and in the meantime I will go over the field. Then the farmer went home and ordered his wife to prepare the food. But the youth ploughed the field, which was two acres large, quite alone, and then he harnessed himself to the harrow and harrowed the whole of the land, using two harrows at once. When he had done it, he went into the forest and pulled up two oak trees, laid them across his shoulders, and hung on them one harrow behind and one before, and also one horse behind and one before, and carried all as if it had been a bundle of straw to his parents' house. When he entered the yard, his mother did not recognize him, and asked, Who is that horrible tall man? The farmer said, That is our son. She said, No, that cannot be our son. We never had such a tall one. Ours was a little thing. She called to him, Go away, we do not want thee. The youth was silent, but led his horses to the stable, gave them some oats and hay and all that they wanted. When he had done this, he went into the parlor, sat down on the bench, and said, Mother, now I should like something to eat. Will it soon be ready? Then she said, Yes, and brought in two immense dishes full of food, which would have been enough to satisfy herself and her husband for a week. The youth, however, ate the whole of it himself, and asked if she had nothing more to set before him. No, she replied, that is all we have. But that was only a taste. I must have more. She did not dare to oppose him, and went and put a huge cauldron full of food on the fire, and when it was ready, carried it in. At length come a few crumbs, said he, and ate all there was, but it was still not sufficient to appease his hunger. Then said he, Father, I see well that with you I shall never have food enough. If you will get me an iron staff which is strong, and which I cannot break against my knees, I will go out into the world. The farmer was glad, put his two horses in his cart, and fetched from the smith a staff so large and thick that the two horses could only just bring it away. The youth laid it across his knees, and snap he broke it in two in the middle like a beanstalk, and threw it away. The father then harnessed four horses, and brought a bar which was so long and thick that the four horses could only just drag it. The son snapped this also in twain against his knees, threw it away, and said, Father, this can be of no use to me. You must harness more horses and bring a stronger staff. So the father harnessed eight horses, and brought one which was so long and thick that the eight horses could only just carry it. When the son took it in his hand, he broke off a bit from the top of it also, and said, Father, I see that you will not be able to procure me any such staff as I want. I will remain no longer with you. So he went away, and gave out that he was a smith's apprentice. He arrived at a village wherein lived a smith who was a greedy fellow, who never did a kindness to anyone, but wanted everything for himself. The youth went into the smithy, and asked if he needed a journeyman. Yes, said the smith, and looked at him and thought, That is a strong fellow who will strike out well and earn his bread. So he asked, How much wages dost thou want? I don't want any at all, he replied. Only every fortnight, when the other journeymen are paid, I will give thee two blows, and thou must bear them. The miser was heartily satisfied, and thought he would thus save much money. 
Next morning, the strange journeyman was to begin to work, but when the master brought the glowing bar and the youth struck his first blow, the iron flew asunder and the anvil sank so deep into the earth that there was no bringing it out again. Then the miser grew angry and said, Oh, but I can't make any use of you. You strike far too powerfully. What will you have for the one below? Then said he, I will only give you quite a small blow, that's all. And he raised his foot and gave him such a kick that he flew away over four loads of hay. Then he sought out the thickest iron bar in the smithy for himself, took it as a stick in his hands, and went onwards. When he had walked for some time, he came to a small farm, and asked the bailiff if he did not require a head servant. Yes, said the bailiff, I can make use of one. You look a strong fellow who can do something. How much a year do you want as wages? He again replied that he wanted no wages at all, but that every year he would give him three blows which he must bear. Then the bailiff was satisfied, for he too was a covetous fellow. Next morning all the servants were to go into the wood, and the others were already up, but the head servant was still in bed. Then one of them called to him, Get up! It is time we are going into the wood, and thou must go with us. Ah, said he quite roughly and surlily, you may just go then. I shall be back again before any of you. Then the others went to the bailiff and told him that the head man was still lying in bed and would not go into the wood with them. The bailiff said they were to awaken him again and tell him to harness the horses. The head man, however, said as before, just go there. I shall be back again before any of you. And then he stayed in bed two hours longer. At length he arose from the feathers, but first he got himself two bushels of peas from the loft, made himself some broth with them, ate it at his leisure, and when that was done, went and harnessed the horses and drove into the wood. Not far from the wood was a ravine through which he had to pass. So he first drove the horses on and then stopped them, and went behind the cart took trees and brushwood and made a great barricade so that no horse could get through. When he was entering the wood, the others were just driving out of it with their loaded carts to go home. Then said he to them, Drive on, I will still get home before you do. He did not drive far into the wood, but at once tore two of the very largest trees of all out of the earth, threw them on his cart, and turned round. When he came to the barricade, the others were still standing there, not able to get through. Don't you see, said he, that if you had stayed with me, you would have got home just as quickly and would have had another hour's sleep? He now wanted to drive on, but his horses could not work their way through, so he unharnessed them, laid them on top of the cart, took the shafts in his own hands and pulled it all through, and he did this just as easily as if it had been laden with feathers. When he was over, he said to the others, There, you see, I have got over quicker than you and drove on, and the others had to stay where they were. In the yard, however, he took a tree in his hand, showed it to the bailiff, and said, Isn't that a fine bundle of wood? Then said the bailiff to his wife, The servant is a good one. If he does sleep long, he is still home before the others. So he served the bailiff for a year, and when that was over and the other servants were getting their wages, he said it was time for him to take his too. The bailiff, however, was afraid of the blows which he was to receive, and earnestly entreated him to excuse him from having them, for rather than that he himself would be head-servant, and the youth should be bailiff. No, said he, I will not be a bailiff. I am a head-servant, and will remain so, but I will administer that which we agreed on. The bailiff was willing to give him whatsoever he demanded, but it was of no use. The head-servant said no to everything. Then the bailiff did not know what to do, and begged for a fortnight's delay, for he wanted to find some way of escape. The head servant consented to this delay. The bailiff summoned all his clerks together, and they were to think the matter over and give him advice. The clerks pondered for a long time, but at last they said that no one was sure of his life with the head servant, for he could kill a man as easily as a midge, and that the bailiff ought to make him get into the well and clean it. And when he was down below, they would roll up one of the millstones which was lying there and throw it on his head, and then he would never return to daylight. The advice pleased the bailiff, and the head servant was quite willing to go down the well. 
When he was standing down below at the bottom, they rolled down the largest millstone and, and thought they had broken his skull. But he cried, Chase away those hens from the well. They are scratching in the sand up there and throwing the grains into my eyes so that I can't see. So the bailiff cried, Shh, shh and pretended to frighten the hens away. When the head servant had finished his work, he climbed up and said, Just look what a beautiful necktie I have on. And behold, it was the millstone which he was wearing round his neck. The head servant now wanted to take his reward, but the bailiff again begged for a fortnight's delay. The clerks met together and advised him to send the head servant to the haunted mill to grind corn by night, for from thence as yet no man had ever returned in the morning alive. The proposal pleased the bailiff. He called the head servant that very evening, and ordered him to take eight bushels of corn to the mill and grind it that night, for it was wanted. So the head servant went to the loft, and put two bushels in his right pocket and two in his left, and took four in a wallet, half on his back and half on his breast, and thus laden, went to the haunted mill. The miller told him that he could grind there very well by day, but not by night, for the mill was haunted, and that up to the present time whosoever had gone into it at night had been found in the morning lying dead inside. He said, I will manage it. Just you go away to bed. Then he went to the mill and poured out the corn. About eleven o'clock he went into the miller's room and sat down on the bench. When he had sat there a while, a door suddenly opened, and a large table came in, and on the table wine and roasted meats placed themselves, and much good food besides, but everything came of itself, for no one was there to carry it. After this the chairs pushed themselves up, but no people came, until all at once he beheld fingers, which handled knives and forks and laid food on the plates, but with this exception he saw nothing. As he was hungry and saw the food, he too placed himself at the table, ate with those who were eating, and enjoyed it. When he had had enough, and the others also had quite emptied their dishes, he distinctly heard all the candles being suddenly snuffed out. And as it was now pitch dark, he felt something like a box on the ear. Then he said, If anything of that kind comes again, I shall strike out in return. And when he had received a second box on the ear, he too struck out. And so it continued the whole night. He took nothing without returning it, but repaid everything with interest, and did not lay about him in vain. At daybreak, however, everything ceased. When the miller had got up, he wanted to look after him, and wondered if he were still alive. Then the youth said, I have eaten my fill, have received some boxes on the ears, but I have given some in return. The miller rejoiced and said that the mill was now released from the spell and wanted to give him much money as a reward. But he said, Money? I will not have. I have enough of it. So he took his meal on his back, went home, and told the bailiff that he had done what he had been told to do and would now have the reward agreed on. When the bailiff heard that, he was seriously alarmed and quite beside himself. He walked backwards and forwards in the room, and drops of perspiration ran down from his forehead. Then he opened the window to get some fresh air, but before he was aware, the head servant had given him such a kick that he flew through the window out into the air, and so far away that no one ever saw him again. Then said the head servant to the bailiff's wife, If he does not come back, you must take the other blow. She cried, No, no, I cannot bear it, and opened the other window, because drops of perspiration were running down her forehead. Then he gave her such a kick that she too flew out, and as she was lighter, she went much higher than her husband. Her husband cried, Do come to me. But she replied, Come thou to me, I cannot come to thee. And they hovered about there in the air, and could not get to each other. And whether they are still hovering about or not, I do not know. But the young giant took up his iron bar and went on his way. End of Story 90「Story 91 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. 
Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Gnome There was once upon a time a rich king who had three daughters, who daily went to walk in the palace garden, and the king was a great lover of all kinds of fine trees. But there was one for which he had such an affection that if anyone gathered an apple from it, he wished him a hundred fathoms underground. And when harvest time came, the apples on this tree were all as red as blood. The three daughters went every day beneath the tree and looked to see if the wind had not blown down an apple, but they never by any chance found one, and the tree was so loaded with them that it was almost breaking, and the branches hung down to the ground. Then the king's youngest child had a great desire for an apple, and said to her sisters, Our father loves us far too much to wish us underground. It is my belief that he would only do that to people who are strangers. And while she was speaking, the child plucked off quite a large apple and ran to her sisters, saying, Just a taste, my dear little sisters, for never in my life have I tasted anything so delightful. Then the two sisters also ate some of the apple, whereupon all three sank deep down into the earth, where they could hear no cock crow. When midday came, the king wished to call them to come to dinner, but they were nowhere to be found, and he sought them everywhere in the palace and garden, but could not find them. Then he was much troubled, and made known to the whole land that whosoever brought his daughters back again should have one of them to wife. Hereupon so many young men went about the country in search that there was no counting them, for every one loved the three children because they were so kind to all, and so fair of face. Three young huntsmen also went out, and when they had travelled about for eight days, they arrived at a great castle, in which were beautiful apartments, and in one room a table was laid on which were delicate dishes, which were so warm that they were smoking, but in the whole of the castle no human being was either to be seen or heard. They waited there for half a day, and the food still remained warm and smoking, and at length they were so hungry that they sat down and ate, and agreed with each other that they would stay and live in that castle, and that one of them who should be chosen by casting lots should remain in the house and the two others seek the king's daughters. They cast lots, and the lot fell to the eldest. So next day the two younger went out to seek, and the eldest had to stay at home. At midday came a small, small mannikin, and begged for a piece of bread. Then the huntsman took the bread, which he had found there, and cut a round off the loaf, was about to give it to him, but whilst he was giving it to the mannikin, the latter let it fall, and asked the huntsman to be so good as to give him that piece again. The huntsman was about to do so, and stooped, on which the mannikin took a stick, seized him by the hair, and gave him a good beating. Next day the second stayed at home, and he fared no better. When the two others returned in the evening, the eldest said, "'Well, how have we got on?' "'Oh, very badly,' said he, and then they lamented their misfortune together. But they said nothing about it to the youngest, for they did not like him at all and always called him Stupid Hans, because he did not exactly belong to the forest. On the third day, the youngest stayed at home, and again the little mannikin came and begged for a piece of bread. When the youth gave it to him, the elf let it fall as before, and asked him to be so good as to give him that piece again. Then said Hans to the little mannikin, What, canst thou not pick up that piece thyself? And if thou wilt not take as much trouble as that for thy daily bread, thou dost not deserve to have it. Then the mannikin grew very angry and said he was to do it, but the huntsman would not, and took my dear mannikin and gave him a thorough beating. Then the mannikin screamed terribly and cried, Stop, stop, and let me go, and I will tell thee where the king's daughters are. When Hans heard that, he left off beating him, and the mannikin told him that he was an earth mannikin, 
and that there were more than a thousand like him, and that if he would go with him, he would show him where the king's daughters were. Then he showed him a deep well, and there was no water in it, and the elf said that he knew well that the companions Hans had with him did not intend to deal honorably with him. Therefore, if he wished to deliver the king's children, he must do it alone. The other two brothers would also be very glad to recover the king's daughters, but they did not want to have any trouble or danger. Hans was therefore to take a large basket, and he must seat himself in it, and his hanger and a bell, and let down. Below were three rooms, and in each of them was a princess, with a many-headed dragon, whose head she was to comb and trim, but he must cut them off, and having said all this, the elf vanished. When it was evening, the two brothers came and asked how he had got on, and he said, pretty well so far, and that he had seen no one except at midday, when a little mannikin had come and begged for a piece of bread, that he had given some to him, but that the mannikin had let it fall, and had asked him to pick it up again. But as he did not choose to do that, the elf had begun to lose his temper, and that he had done what he ought not, and had given the elf a beating, on which he had told him where the king's daughters were. Then the two were so angry at this, that they grew green and yellow. Next morning they went to the well together and drew lots, who should first seat himself in the basket, and again the lot fell on the eldest, and he was to seat himself in it, and take the bell with him. Then he said, If I ring, you must draw me up again immediately. When he had gone down for a short distance, he rang, and they at once drew him up again. Then the second seated himself in the basket, and did just the same as the first. And then it was the turn of the youngest, but he let himself be lowered quite to the bottom. When he had got out of the basket, he took his hanger, and went and stood outside the first door and listened, and heard the dragon snoring quite loudly. He opened the door slowly, and one of the princesses was sitting there, and had nine dragon's heads lying upon her lap, and was combing them. Then he took his hanger, and hewed at them, and the nine fell off. The princess sprang up, threw her arms round his neck, embraced and kissed him repeatedly, and took her stomacher, which was made of pure gold, and hung it around his neck. Then he went to the second princess, who had a dragon with five heads to comb, and delivered her also, and the youngest, who had a dragon with four heads, and he went likewise. And they all rejoiced, and embraced him, and kissed him without stopping. Then he rang very loud, so that those above heard him, and he placed the princesses, one after the other, in the basket, and had them all drawn up. But when it came to his own turn, he remembered the words of the elf, who had told him that his comrades did not mean well by him. So he took a great stone which was lying there and placed it in the basket, and when it was about halfway up, his false brothers above cut the rope, so that the basket with the stone fell to the ground, and they thought that he was dead, and ran away with the three princesses, making them promise to tell their father that it was they who had delivered them, and then they went to the king, and each demanded a princess in marriage. In the meantime, the youngest huntsman was wandering about the three chambers in great trouble, fully expecting to have to end his days there, when he saw, hanging on the wall, a flute. Then he said, Why dost thou hang there? No one can be merry here. He looked at the dragon's heads likewise and said, You too cannot help me now. He walked backwards and forwards, for such a long time that he made the surface of the ground quite smooth, and at last other thoughts came to his mind, and he took the flute from the wall and played a few notes on it, and suddenly a number of elves appeared, and with every note that he sounded one more came. Then he played until the room was entirely filled, and they all asked what he desired. So he said he wished to get above ground 
back to the daylight, on which they seized him by every hair that grew on his head, and thus they flew with him onto the earth again. When he was above ground, he at once went to the king's palace, just as the wedding of one princess was about to be celebrated, and he went to the room where the king and his three daughters were. When the princesses saw him, they fainted. Hereupon the king was angry, and ordered him to be put to prison at once, because he thought he must have done some injury to the children. When the princesses came to themselves, however, they entreated the king to set him free again. The king asked why, and they said that they were not allowed to tell that, but their father said that they were to tell it to the stove, and he went out, listened at the door, and heard everything. Then he caused the two brothers to be hanged on the gallows, and the third he gave his youngest daughter, and on that occasion I wore a pair of glass shoes, and I struck them against a stone, and they said, Clink, and were broken. End of Story 91「Story 92 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roktai Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt the king of the golden mountain there was a certain merchant who had two children a boy and a girl they were both young and could not walk and two richly laden ships of his sailed forth to sea with all his property on board and just as he was expecting to win much money by them news came that they had gone to the bottom and now instead of being a rich man he was a poor one, and had nothing left but one field outside the town. In order to drive his misfortune a little out of his thoughts, he went out to this field, and as he was walking forwards and backwards in it, a little black mannequin stood suddenly by his side and asked why he was so sad and what he was taking so much to heart. Then said the merchant, if thou couldst help me, I would willingly tell thee. Who knows? replied the black dwarf. Perhaps I can help thee. Then the merchant told him that all he possessed had gone to the bottom of the sea, and that he had nothing left but this field. Do not trouble thyself, said the dwarf. If thou wilt promise to give me the first thing that rubs itself against thy leg, when thou art at home again, and to bring it here to this place in twelve years' time, thou shalt have as much money as thou wilt. The merchant thought, What can that be but my dog? And did not remember his little boy, so he said yes gave the black man a written and sealed promise and went home. When he reached home, his little boy was so delighted that he held by a bench, tottered up to him and seized him fast by the legs. The father was shocked, for he remembered his promise and now knew what he had pledged himself to do. As, however, he still found no money in his chest, he thought that the dwarf had only been jesting. A month afterwards he went up to the garret, intending to gather together some old tin and to sell it, and saw a great heap of money lying. Then he was happy again, made purchases, became a greater merchant than before, and felt that this world was well governed. In the meantime, the boy grew tall and at the same time sharp and clever. But the nearer the twelfth year approached, the more anxious grew the merchant, so that his distress might be seen in his face. One day his son asked what ailed him, but the father would not say. The boy, however, 
persisted so long that at last he told him that, without being aware of what he was doing, he had promised him to a black dwarf and had received much money for doing so. He said likewise that he had set his hand and seal to this, and that now, when twelve years had gone by, he would have to give him up. Then said the son, O oh, father, do not be uneasy, all will go well. The black man has no power over me. The son had himself blessed by the priest, and when the time came, father and son went together to the field, and the son made a circle and placed himself inside it with his father. Then came the black dwarf and said to the old man, Hast thou brought with thee that which thou hast promised me? He was silent, but the son asked, What dost thou want here? Then said the black dwarf, I have to speak with thy father, and not with thee. The son replied, Thou hast betrayed and misled my father. Give back the writing. No, said the black dwarf, I will not give up my rights. They spoke together for a long time after this, but at last they agreed that the son, as he did not belong to the enemy of mankind, nor yet to his father, should seat himself in a small boat which should lie on water, which was flowing away from them, and that the father should push it off with his own foot, and then the son should remain given up to the water. So he took leave of his father, placed himself in a little boat, and the father had to push it off with his own foot. The boat capsized so that the keel was uppermost, and the father believed his son was lost, and went home and mourned for him. The boat, however, did not sink, but floated quietly away, and the boy sat safely inside it, and it floated thus for a long time, until at last it stopped by an unknown shore. Then he landed and saw a beautiful castle before him and set out to go to it. But when he entered it, he found that it was bewitched. He went through every room, but all were empty until he reached the last, where a snake lay coiled in a ring. The snake, however, was an enchanted maiden who rejoiced to see him and said, Hast thou come, O oh, my deliverer? I have already waited twelve years for thee. This kingdom is bewitched, and thou must set it free. How can I do that? he inquired. Tonight come twelve black men, covered with chains, who will ask what thou art doing here. Keep silent, give them no answer, and let them do what they will with thee. They will torment thee, beat thee, stab thee. Let everything pass, only do not speak. At twelve o'clock they must go away again. On the second night twelve others will come. On the third four and twenty who will cut off thy head. But at twelve o'clock their power will be over. And then, if thou hast endured all and hast not spoken the slightest word, I shall be released. I will come to thee, and will have in a bottle some of the water of life. I will rub thee with that, and then thou wilt come to life again, and be as healthy as before. Then said he, I will gladly set thee free. And everything happened just as she had said. The black man could not force a single word from him and on the third night the snake became a beautiful princess who came with the water of life and brought him back to life again. So she threw herself into his arms and kissed him, and there was joy and gladness in the whole castle. After this 
their marriage was celebrated and he was king of the golden mountain they lived very happily together and the queen bore a fine boy eight years had already gone by when the king bethought of his father his heart was moved and he wished to visit him the queen however would not let him go away and said i know beforehand that it will cause my unhappiness but he suffered her to have no rest until she consented at their parting she gave him a wishing ring and said take this ring and put it on thy finger and then thou wilt immediately be transported whithersoever thou wouldst be only thou must promise me not to use it in wishing me away from this place and with thy father that he promised her put the ring on his finger and wished himself at home just outside the town where his father lived instantly he found himself there and made for the town but when he came to the gate the sentries would not let him in because he wore such strange and yet such rich and magnificent clothing then he went to a hill where a shepherd was watching his sheep changed clothes with him put on his old shepherd's coat and then entered the town without hindrance when he came to his father he made himself known to him but he did not at all believe that the shepherd was his son and said he certainly had had a son but that he was dead long ago however as he saw he was a poor needy shepherd he would give him something to eat then the shepherd said to his parents i am verily your son do you know of no mark on my body by which you could recognize me yes said his mother our son had a raspberry mark under his right arm he slipped back his shirt and they saw the raspberry under his right arm and no longer doubted that he was their son then he told them that he was king of the golden mountain and a king's daughter was his wife and that they had a fine son of seven years old then said the father that is certainly not true it is a fine kind of a king who goes about in a ragged shepherd's coat on this the son fell in a passion and without thinking of his promise turned his ring round and wished both his wife and child with him they were there in a second but the queen wept and reproached him and said that he had broken his word and had brought misfortune upon her he said i have done it thoughtlessly and not with evil intention and tried to calm her and she pretended to believe this but she had mischief in her mind then he led her out of the town into the field and showed her the stream where the little boat had been pushed off and then he said i am tired sit down i will sleep a while on thy lap and he laid his head on her lap and fell asleep when he was asleep she first drew the ring from his finger then she drew away the foot which was under him leaving only the slipper behind her and she took her child in her arms and wished herself back in her own kingdom when he awoke there he lay quite deserted and his wife and child were gone and so was the ring from his finger the slipper only was still there as a token home to thy parents thou canst not return thought he they would say that thou wast a wizard thou must be off and walk on until thou arrivest in thy own kingdom so he went away and came at length to a hill by which three giants were standing disputing with each other because they did not know how to divide their father's property when they saw him passing by they called to him and said the little man had quick wits and that he was to divide their inheritance for them the inheritance however consisted of a sword which had this property that if any one took it in his hand and said all heads off but mine every head would lie on the ground secondly of a cloak which made any one who put it on invisible thirdly of a pair of boots which could transport the wearer to any place he wished in a moment he said give me the three things that i may see if they are still in good condition 
They gave him the cloak, and when he had put it on, he was invisible and changed into a fly. Then he resumed his own form and said, The cloak is a good one. Now give me the sword. They said, No, we will not give thee that. If thou wert to say, All heads off but mine, all our heads would be off, and thou alone wouldst be left with thine. Nevertheless, they gave it to him with the condition that he was only to try it against a tree. This he did, and the sword cut into the trunk of a tree, as if it had been a blade of straw. Then he wanted to have the boots likewise, but they said, No, we will not give them. If thou hadst them on thy feet, and wert to wish thyself at the top of the hill, we should be left down here with nothing. Oh no! said he, I will not do that. So they gave him the boots as well. And now, when he had got all these things, he thought of nothing but his wife and his child, and said as though to himself, Oh, if I were but on the golden mountain! And at the same moment he vanished from the sight of the giants, and thus their inheritance was divided. When he was near his palace, he heard sounds of joy and fiddles and flutes, and the people told him that his wife was celebrating her wedding with another. Then he fell into a rage and said, False woman! She betrayed and deserted me whilst I was asleep. So he put on his cloak and, unseen by all, went into the palace. When he entered the dining hall, a great table was spread with delicious food, and the guests were eating and drinking and laughing and jesting. She sat on a royal seat in the midst of them, in splendid apparel, with a crown on her head. He placed himself behind her, and no one saw him. When she put a piece of meat on a plate for herself, he took it away and ate it. And when she poured out a glass of wine for herself, he took it away and drank it. She was always helping herself to something, and yet she never got anything, for plate and glass disappeared immediately. Then, dismayed and ashamed, she arose and went to her chamber and wept, but he followed her there. She said, Has the devil power over me, or did my deliverer never come? Then he struck her in the face and said, Did thy deliverer never come? It is he who has thee in his power, thou traitor. Have I deserved this from thee? Then he made himself visible, went into the hall and cried, The wedding is at an end. The true king has returned. The king's princes and counsellors who were assembled there ridiculed and mocked him. But he did not trouble to answer them, and said, Will you go away or not? On this they tried to seize him, and pressed upon him, but he drew his sword and said, All heads off but mine! And all the heads rolled on the ground, and he alone was master, and once more king of the golden mountain. End of story 92「Story number 93 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and William Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Raven. There was once upon a time a queen who had a little daughter who was still so young that she had to be carried. One day the child was naughty, and the mother might say what she liked, but the child would not be quiet. Then she became impatient, and as the ravens were flying about the palace, she opened the window and said, I wish you were a raven and would fly away, and then I should have some rest. Scarcely had she spoken the words before the child was changed into a raven and flew from her arms out of the window. It flew into a dark forest and stayed in it a long time, and the parents heard nothing of their child. 
Then one day a man was on his way through this forest, and heard the raven crying, and followed the voice. And when he came near, the bird said, I am a king's daughter by birth, and am bewitched, but thou canst set me free. What am I to do? asked he. She said, Go further into the forest, and thou wilt find a house, wherein sits an aged woman, who will offer thee meat and drink, but you must accept nothing. For if you eatest and drinkest anything, thou wilt fall into a sleep, and then thou wilt not be able to deliver me. In the garden behind the house there is a great heap of tan, and on this thou shalt stand and wait for me. For three days I will come every afternoon at two o'clock in a carriage. On the first day, four white horses will be harnessed to it, then four chestnut horses, and lastly, four black ones. But if thou art not awake but sleeping, I shall not be set free. The man promised to do everything that she desired. But the raven said, Alas, I know already that thou wilt not deliver me. Thou wilt accept something from the woman. Then the man once more promised that he would certainly not touch anything either to eat or to drink. But when he entered the house, the old woman came to him and said, Poor man, how faint you are. Come and refresh yourself. Eat and drink. No, said the man, I will not eat or drink. She, however, let him have no peace at all, and said, If you will not eat, take one drink out of the glass. One is nothing. Then he let himself be persuaded and drank. Shortly before two o'clock in the afternoon, he went into the garden to the tan heap to wait for the raven. As he was standing there, his weariness all at once became so great that he could not struggle against it, and lay down for a short time. But he was determined not to go to sleep. Hardly, however, had he lain down, than his eyes closed, of their own accord, and he fell asleep and slept so soundly that nothing in the world could have aroused him. At two o'clock the raven came driving up with four white horses, but she was already in deep grief and said, I know he is asleep. And when she came into the garden, he was indeed lying there asleep on the heap of tan. She alighted from the carriage, went to him, shook him, and called him, but he did not awake. Next day about noon, the old woman came again and brought him food and drink, but he would not take any of it. But she let him have no rest and persuaded him until at length he again took one drink out of the glass. Towards two o'clock he went into the garden to the tan heap to wait for the raven but all at once felt such a great weariness that his limbs would no longer support him. He could not help himself and was forced to lie down and fell into a heavy sleep. When the raven drove up with four brown horses, she was already full of grief and said, I know he is asleep. She went to him, but there he lay sleeping, and there was no wakening him. Next day the old woman asked what was the meaning of this. He was neither eating nor drinking anything. Did he want to die? He replied, I am not allowed to eat or drink, and will not do so. But she set a dish with food and a glass with wine before him, and when he smelt it, he could not resist, and swallowed a deep draught. When the time came, he went out into the garden to the heap of tan, and waited for the king's daughter. But he became still more weary than on the day before and lay down and slept as soundly as if he had been a stone. At two o'clock the raven came with four black horses, and the coachman and everything else was black. She was already in the deepest grief and said, I know that he is asleep and cannot deliver me. But when she came to him, there he was lying fast asleep. She shook him and called him, but she could not waken him. Then she laid a loaf beside him, and after that a piece of meat and thirdly a bottle of wine, and he might consume as much of all of them as he liked, but they would never grow less. After this she took a gold ring from her finger and put it on his, and her name was graven on it. Lastly she laid a letter beside him wherein was written what she had given him, and that none of the things would ever grow less. And in it was also written, I see right well that here you will never be able to deliver me. But if thou art still willing to deliver me, come to the golden castle of Stromberg. It lies in thy power, of that I am certain. And when she had given him all of these things, she seated herself in her carriage and drove to the golden castle of Stromberg.
when the man awoke and saw that he had slept he was sad at heart and said she has certainly driven by and i have not set her free then he perceived the things which were lying beside him and read the letter wherein was written how everything had happened so he arose and went away intending to go to the golden castle of stromberg but he did not know where it was after he walked about the world for a long time he entered into a dark forest and walked for fourteen days and still could not find his way out then it was once more evening and he was so tired that he lay down in a thicket and fell asleep next day he went onwards and in the evening as he was again about to lie down beneath some bushes he heard such a howling and crying that he could not go to sleep and at the time when people light the candles he saw one glimmering and arose and went towards it then he came to a house which seemed very small for in front of it a great giant was standing he thought to himself if i go in and the giant sees me it will very likely cost me my life at length he ventured it and went in when the giant saw him he said it is well that thou comest for it is long since i have eaten i will at once eat thee for my supper i'd rather you would leave that alone said the man i do not like to be eaten but if thou hast any desire to eat i have quite enough here to satisfy thee if that be true said the giant thou mayst be easy i was only going to devour thee because i had nothing else then he went and sat down to the table and the man took out the bread wine and meat which would never come to an end this pleases me well said the giant and ate to his heart's content then the man said to him canst thou tell me where the golden castle of stromberg is the giant said i will look at my map all the towns and villages and the houses are to be found on it he brought out the map which he had in the room and looked for the castle but it was not to be found on it it's no matter said he i have some still larger maps in my cupboard upstairs and we will look in them but there too it was in vain the man now wanted to go onwards but the giant begged him to wait a few days longer until his brother who had gone out to bring some provisions came home when the brother came home they inquired about the golden castle of stromberg he replied when i have eaten and, and have had enough i will look in the map then he went with them up to his chamber and they searched in his map but could not find it then he brought out still older maps and they never rested until they found the golden castle of stromberg but it was many thousand miles away how am i to get there asked the man the giant said i have two hours time during which i will carry you into the neighborhood but after that i must be at home to suckle the child that we have so the giant carried the man to about a hundred leagues from the castle and said thou canst very well walk the rest of the way alone and he turned back but the man went onwards day and night until at length he came to the golden castle of stromberg it stood on a glass mountain and the bewitched maiden drove in her carriage round the castle and then went inside he rejoiced when he saw her and wanted to climb up to her but when he began to do so he always slipped down the glass again and when he saw that he could not reach her he was filled with trouble and said to himself i will stay down here below and wait for her so he built himself a hut and stayed in it for a whole year and every day saw the king's daughter driving about above but never could go to her then one day he saw from his hut three robbers who were beating each other and cried to them god be with ye they stopped when they heard the cry but as they saw no one they once again began to beat each other and that too most dangerously so he again cried god be with ye again they stopped looked around about but as they saw no one they went on beating each other then he cried for the third time god be with thee and thought i must see what these three are about and went thither and asked why they were beating each other so furiously one of them said that he found a stick and that when he struck a door with it that door would spring open the next said that he had found a mantle and that whenever he put it on he was invisible but the third said he had found a horse on which a man could ride everywhere even up the glass mountain and now they did not know whether they ought to have these things in common or whether they ought to divide them 
Then the man said, I will give you something in exchange for these three things. Money indeed have I not, but I have other things of more value. But first I must try yours to see if you have told the truth. Then they put him on the horse, threw the mantle round him, and gave him the stick in his hand. And when he had all these things, they were no longer able to see him. So he gave them some vigorous blows and cried, Now, vagabonds, you have got what you deserve. Are you satisfied? And he rode up the glass mountain. But when he came in front of the castle at the top, it was shut. Then he struck the door with his stick, and it sprang open immediately. He went in and ascended the stairs until he came to the hall where the maiden was sitting with a golden cup full of wine before her. She, however, could not see him because he had the mantle on. And when he came up to her, he drew from his finger the ring which she had given him, and threw it into the cup so that it rang. Then she cried, That is my ring, so the man who is to set me free must be here. They searched the whole castle and did not find him, but he had gone out and had seated himself on the horse and thrown off the mantle. When they came to the door, they saw him and cried aloud in their delight. Then he alighted and took the king's daughter in his arms. But she kissed him and said, Now hast thou set me free, and to-morrow we will celebrate our wedding. End of story number 93 Read by April 6090, California United States of America. Story 94 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret hunt the peasant's wise daughter there once was a poor peasant who had no land but only a small house and one daughter then said the daughter we ought to ask our lord the king for a bit of newly cleared land when the king heard of their poverty he presented them with a piece of land which she and her father dug up and intended to sow with a little corn and grain of that kind when they had dug nearly the whole of the field they found in the earth a mortar made of pure gold. Listen, said the father to the girl, as our lord the king has been so gracious and presented us with the field, we ought to give him this mortar in return for it. The daughter, however, would not consent to this, and said, Father, if we have the mortar without having the pestle as well, we shall have to get the pestle so you had much better say nothing about it. He would, however, not obey her, but took the mortar and carried it to the king, said that he had found it in the cleared land, and asked if he would accept it as a present. The king took the mortar and asked if he had found nothing besides that? No, answered the countryman. Then the king said that he must now bring him the pestle. The peasant said that they had not found that, but he might as well just have spoken to the wind. He was put in prison and was to stay there until he produced the pestle. The servants had daily to carry him bread and water, which is what people get in prison, and they heard how the man cried out continually, Ah, if I had only but listened to my daughter! Alas, alas! If I had but listened to my daughter, and would neither eat nor drink, so he commanded the servants to bring the prisoner before him, and then the king asked the peasant why he was always crying. Ah, if I had but listened to my daughter, and what it was that his daughter had said, she told me that I ought to not take the mortar to you, for I should have to produce the pestle as well. If you have a daughter who is as wise as that, let her come here. She was therefore obliged to appear before the king, who asked if she really was so wise, and said he would set her a riddle, and if she could guess that, he would marry her. She at once said yes, she would guess it. 
then said the king come to me not clothed not naked not riding not walking not in the road not out of the road and if thou canst do that i will marry thee so she went away put off everything she had on and then she was not clothed and took a great fishing net and seated herself in it and wrapped it entirely round and round her so that she was not naked and she hired an ass and tied the fisherman's net to its tail so that it was forced to drag her along and that was neither riding nor walking the ass had to drag her in the ruts so that she only touched the ground with her great toe and that was neither being in the road nor out of the road and when she arrived in that fashion the king said she had guessed the riddle and fulfilled all the conditions then he ordered her father to be released from the prison took her to wife and gave into her care all the royal possessions now when some years had passed the king was once drawing up his troops on parade when it happened that some peasants who had been selling wood stopped with their wagons before the palace some of them had oxen yoked to them and some horses there was one peasant who had three horses one of which was delivered of a young foal and it ran away and lay down between two oxen which were in front of the wagon when the peasants came together they began to dispute to beat each other and make a disturbance and the peasant with the oxen wanted to keep the foal and said one of the oxen had given birth to it and the other said his horse had had it and that it was his the quarrel came before the king and he gave the verdict that the foal should stay where it had been found and so the peasant with the oxen to whom it did not belong got it then the other went away and wept and lamented over his foal now he had heard how gracious his lady the queen was because she herself had sprung from poor peasant folks so he went to her and begged her to see if she could not help him to get his foal back again she said yes yes i will tell you what to do if thou wilt promise not to betray me early to-morrow morning when the king parades the guard place thyself in the middle of the road by which he must pass take a great fishing net and pretend to be fishing go on fishing too and empty out the net as if thou hast got it full and then she told him also what he was to say if he was questioned by the king the next day therefore the peasant stood there and fished on dry ground when the king passed by and saw that sent his messenger to ask what the stupid man was about he answered i am fishing the messenger asked how he could fish where there was no water there the peasant said it's easy for me to fish on dry land as it is for an ox to have a foal the messenger went back and took the answer to the king who ordered the peasant to be brought to him and told him that this was not his own idea and he wanted to know whose it was the peasant must confess this at once the peasant however would not do so and said always god forbid he should the idea was his own they laid him however on a heap of straw and beat him and tormented him so long that at last he admitted that he had got the idea from the queen when the king reached home again and said to his wife why hast thou behaved so falsely to me i will not have thee any longer for a wife thy time is up go back to the place where whence thou camest to thy peasant's hut one favor however he granted her she might take with her one thing that was dearest and best in her eyes and thus was she dismissed she said yes my dear husband if you command this i will do it and she embraced him and kissed him and said she would take leave of him then she ordered a powerful sleeping draught to be brought to drink farewell to him the king took a long draught but she took only a little he soon fell into a deep sleep 
and when she perceived that she called a servant and took a fair white linen cloth and wrapped the king in it and the servant was forced to carry him into a carriage that stood before the door and she drove with him to her own little house she laid him in her own little bed he slept one day and one night without awakening and when he awoke he looked round and said good god where am i he called his attendants but none of them were there at length his wife came to his bedside and said my dear lord and king you told me i might bring away with me from the palace that which was dearest and most precious in my eyes i have nothing more precious and dear than yourself so i have brought you with me tears rose to the king's eyes he said dear wife thou shalt be mine and i will be thine and he took her back with him to the royal palace and was married again to her and at the present time they are very likely still living end of story 94story 95 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by melvin lee household tales by jacob and willem grimm translated by margaret hunt old hildebrand once upon a time lived a peasant and his wife and the parson of the village had a fancy for the wife and had wished for a long while to spend a whole day happily with her the peasant woman too was quite willing one day therefore he said to the woman listen my dear friend i have now thought of a way by which we can for once spend a whole day happily together i tell you what on wednesday you must take to your bed and tell your husband you are ill and if you only complain and act being ill properly and go on doing so until sunday when i have to preach i will then say in my sermon that whosoever has at home a sick child a sick husband a sick wife a sick father a sick mother a sick brother or whosoever else it may be and makes a pilgrimage to the gawkerly hill in italy where you can get a peck of laurel leaves for a cruiser the sick child, the sick husband, the sick wife, the sick father, the sick mother, the sick sister, or whoever else it may be, will be restored to health immediately. I will manage it, said the woman promptly. Now, therefore, on the Wednesday, the peasant woman took to her bed and complained and lamented as agreed on, and her husband did everything for her that he could think of, but nothing did her any good. And when Sunday came, the woman said, i feel as ill as if i were going to die at once but there is one thing i should like to do before my end i should like to hear the parson's sermon that he is going to preach to-day on that the peasant said ah my child do not do it thou mightest make thyself worse if thou wert to get up look i will go to the sermon and i will attend to it very carefully and will tell thee everything the parson says well said the woman go then and pay great attention and repeat to me all that thou hearest so the peasant went to the sermon and the parson began to preach and said if any one had at home a sick child a sick husband a sick wife a sick father a sick mother a sick sister brother or any one else and would make a pilgrimage to the gawkerly hill in italy where a peck of laurel leaves costs a cruiser the sick child sick husband sick wife sick father sick mother sick sister brother or whoever else it might be would be restored to health and instantly and whosoever wished to undertake the journey was to go to him after the service was over and he would give him the sack for the laurel leaves and the cruiser then no one was more rejoiced than the peasant and after the service was over he went at once to the parson who gave him the bag for the laurel leaves and the cruiser after he went home and even at the house door he cried hurrah dear wife it is now almost the same thing 
as if thou wert well. The parson has preached today that whosoever had at home a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or whoever it might be, and would make a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a peck of laurel leaves cost a cruiser, the sick child, sick husband, sick wife, sick father, sick mother, sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it was, would be cured immediately. And now I have already got the bag for the cruiser from the parson, and will at once begin my journey, so that thou mayest get well the faster. And thereupon he went away. He was, however, hardly gone before the woman got up, and the parson was there directly. But now we will leave these two for a while, and follow the peasant, who walked on quickly without stopping, in order to get the sooner to the Gockerly Hill, and on his way he met his gossip. His gossip was an egg merchant, and was just coming from the market, where he had sold his eggs. "'May you be blessed,' said the gossip. "'Where are you off to so fast?' "'To all eternity, my friend,' said the peasant. "'My wife is ill, and I have begun today to hear the parson's sermon. And he preached that if anyone had in his house a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or anyone else, and made a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a pack of laurel leaves cost a cruiser, the sick child, the sick husband, the sick wife, the sick fathers, the sick mother, the sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it was, would be cured immediately. And so I have got the bag for the laurel leaves, and the cruiser from the parson, and now I am beginning my pilgrimage. But listen, gossip, said the egg merchant to the peasant, are you then stupid enough to believe such a thing as that? Don't you know what it means? The parson wants to spend a whole day alone with your wife in peace, so he has given you this job to do to get you out of the way. My word, said the peasant, how I'd like to know if that's true. Come then, said the gossip, I'll tell you what to do. Get into my egg basket and I will carry you home, and then you will see for yourself. So that was settled, and the gossip put the peasant into his egg basket and carried him home. When they got to the house, hurrah! But all was going merrily there. The woman had already had nearly everything killed that was in the farmyard, and had made pancakes, and the parson was there, and had brought his fiddle with him. The gossip knocked at the door, and the woman asked, Who's there? It is I, gossip, said the egg merchant. Give me shelter this night. I have not sold my eggs at the market, so now I have to carry them home again, and they are so heavy that I shall never be able to do it, for it is dark already. Indeed, my friend, said the woman, thou comest at a very inconvenient time for me, but as thou art here it cannot be helped. Come in, and take a seat there on the bench by the stove. Then she placed the gossip and the basket which he carried on his back, on the bench by the stove. The parson, however, and the woman, were as merry as possible. At length the parson said, Listen, my friend, thou canst sing beautifully. Sing something to me. Oh, said the woman, I cannot sing now. In mong young days, indeed, I could sing well enough, but that's all over now. Come, said the parson once more, do sing some little song. On that, the woman began and sang, I've sent my husband away from me to the Gockerly Hill in Italy. Thereupon the parson sang, I wish twas a year before he came back. I'd never ask him for the laurel leaf sack. Hallelujah. Then the gossip, who was in the background, began to sing. But I ought to tell you, the peasant was called Hildebrand. So the gossip sang, What art thou doing, my Hildebrand, dear? There on the bench by the stove so near. Hallelujah. And then the peasant sang from his basket. All sing. I ever shall hate from this day. And here in this basket no longer I'll stay. Hallelujah. And he got out of the basket and cudgeled the parson out of the house. End of story 95
Story 96 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Three Little Birds. About a thousand or more years ago, there were in this country nothing but small kings. And one of them who lived on the Kutenberg was very fond of hunting. Once on a time, when he was riding forth from his castle with his huntsmen, three girls were watching their cows upon the mountain, and when they saw the king with all his followers, the eldest girl pointed to him and called to the other two girls, If I do not get that one, I will have none. Then the second girl answered from the other side of the hill, and pointed to the one who was on the king's right hand. Hello, hello! If I do not get him, I will have no one. These, however, were the two ministers. The king heard all this, and when he had come back from the chase, he caused the three girls to be brought to him, and asked them what they had said yesterday on the mountain. This they would not tell him. So the king asked the eldest, if she really would take him for her husband. Then she said yes, and the two ministers married the two sisters, for they were all three fair and beautiful of face, especially the queen, who had hair like flax. But the two sisters had no children, and once when the king was obliged to go from home, he invited them to come to the queen in order to cheer her, for she was about to bear a child. She had a little boy, who brought a bright red star into the world with him. Then the two sisters said to each other that they would throw the beautiful boy into the water. When they had thrown him in, I believe it was into the vaser, a little bird flew up into the air, which sang, To thy death art thou sped, until God's word be said, In the white lily bloom, brave boy, is thy tomb. When the two heard that, they were frightened to death, and ran away in great haste. When the king came home, they told him that the queen had been delivered of a dog. And the king said, What God does is well done. But a fisherman who dwelt near the water fished the little boy out again while he was still alive. And, as his wife had no children, they reared him. When a year had gone by, the king again went away, and the queen had another little boy, whom the false sisters likewise took and threw into the water. Then up flew a little bird again and sang, To thy death art thou sped, until God's word be said, In the white lily bloom brave boy is thy tomb. And when the king came back, they told him that the queen had once more given birth to a dog, and he again said, what God does is well done. The fisherman, however, fished this one also out of the water and reared him. Then the king again journeyed forth, and the queen had a little girl, whom also the false sisters threw into the water. Then again a little bird flew up on high and sang, To thy death art thou sped, until God's word be said. In the white lily bloom, bonny girl, is thy tomb. And when the king came home, they told him that the queen had been delivered of a cat. Then the king grew angry, and ordered his wife to be cast into prison, and therein was she shut up for many long years. In the meantime the children had grown up. Then eldest once went out with some other boys to fish, but the other boys would not have him with them, and said, Go thy way, foundling. Hereupon he was much troubled, and asked the old fisherman if that was true. The fisherman told him that once when he was fishing he had drawn him out of the water. So the boy said he would go forth and seek his father. The fisherman, however, entreated him to stay, but he would not let himself be hindered, and at last the fisherman consented. Then the boy went on his way and walked for many days, and at last he came to a great piece of water by the side of which stood an old woman fishing. "'Good day, mother,' said the boy. "'Many thanks,' said she. "'Thou wilt fish long enough before thou catchest anything.' 
and thou wilt seek long enough before thou findest thy father. How wilt thou get over the water? said the woman. God knows. Then the old woman took him up on her back and carried him through it, and he sought for a long time, but could not find his father. When a year had gone by, the second boy set out to seek his brother. He came to the water, and all fared with him just as with his brother, and now there was no one at home but the daughter, and she mourned for her brothers so much that at last she also begged the fisherman to let her set forth, for she wished to go in search of her brothers. Then she likewise came to the great piece of water, and she said to the old woman, "'Good day, mother.' "'Many thanks,' replied the old woman. "'May God help you with your fishing,' said the maiden. When the old woman heard that, she became quite friendly, and carried her over the water, gave her a wand, and said to her, "'Go, my daughter, ever onwards by this road, and when you come to a great black dog, you must pass it silently and boldly, without either laughing or looking at it. Then you will come to a great high castle, on the threshold of which you must let the wand fall, and go straight through the castle and out again on the other side. There you will see an old fountain, out of which a large tree has grown, whereon hangs a bird in a cage which you must take down. Take likewise a glass of water out of the fountain, and with these two things go back by the same way, pick up the wand again from the threshold, and take it with you, and when you again pass by the dog, strike him in the face with it, but be sure that you hit him, and then just come back here to me. The maiden found everything exactly as the old woman had said, and on her way back she found her two brothers, who had sought each other over half the world. They went together to the place where the black dog was lying on the road. She struck it in the face, and it turned into a handsome prince, who went with them to the river. There the old woman was still standing. She rejoiced much to see them again, and carried them all over the water, and then she too went away, for now she was freed. The others, however, went to the old fisherman, and all were glad that they had found each other again, but they hung the bird on the wall. But the second son could not settle at home, and took his crossbow and went a-hunting. When he was tired, he took his flute and made music. The king was hunting, too, and heard that, and went thither, and when he met the youth, he said, Who has given thee leave to hunt here? Oh, no one. To whom dost thou belong, then? I am the fisherman's son. But he has no children. If thou wilt not believe, come with me. That the king did, and questioned the fisherman, who told everything to him, and the little bird on the wall began to sing. The mother sits alone, there in the prison small, O king of royal blood, these are thy children all. The sisters twain so false, they wrought the children woe, there in the waters deep, where the fishermen come and go. Then they were all terrified, and the king took the bird, the fishermen, and the three children back with him to the castle and ordered the prison to be opened, and brought his wife out again. She had, however, grown quite ill and weak. Then the daughter gave her some of the water from the fountain to drink, and she became strong and healthy. But the two false sisters were burnt, and the daughter married the prince. End of story 96《Story 97 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Water of Life there was once a king who had an illness, and no one believed that he would come out of it with his life. He had three sons who were much distressed about it, 
and went down into the palace garden and wept. There they met an old man who inquired as to the cause of their grief. They told him that their father was so ill that he would most certainly die, for nothing seemed to cure him. Then the old man said, I know of one more remedy, and that is the water of life. If he drinks of it, he will become well again, but it is hard to find, the eldest said. I will manage to find it, and went to the sick king and begged to be allowed to go forth in search of the water of life, for that alone could save him. No, said the king, the danger is too great. I would rather die. But he begged so long that the king consented. The prince thought in his heart, If I bring the water, then I shall be best beloved of my father, and shall inherit the kingdom. So he set out, and when he had ridden forth a little distance, a dwarf stood there in the road who called to him and said, Whither away so fast? Silly shrimp, said the prince, very haughtily, it is nothing to do with you, and rode on. But the little dwarf had grown angry, and had wished an evil wish. Soon after this the prince entered a ravine, and the further he rode, the closer the mountains drew together, and at last the road became so narrow that he could not advance a step further. It was impossible either to turn his horse or to dismount from the saddle, and he was shut in there as if in prison. The sick king waited long for him, but he came not. Then the second son said, Father, let me go forth to seek the water, and thought to himself, If my brother is dead, then the kingdom will fall to me. At first the king would not allow him to go either, but at last he yielded, so the prince set out on the same road that his brother had taken, and he too met the dwarf who stopped him and asked whether he was going in such haste. Little shrimp, said the prince, that is nothing to thee, and rode on without giving him another look. But the dwarf bewitched him, and he, like the other, rode into a ravine, and could neither go forwards nor backwards. So fair, haughty people. As the second son also remained away, the youngest begged to be allowed to go forth to fetch the water, and at last the king was obliged to let him go. When he met the dwarf, and the latter asked him whither he was going in such haste, he stopped, gave him an explanation, and said, I am seeking the water of life, for my father is sick unto death. Dost thou know, then, where that is to be found? No, said the prince. As thou hast borne thyself as is seemly, and not haughtily like thy false brothers, I will give thee the information and tell thee how thou mayest obtain the water of life. It springs from a fountain in the courtyard of an enchanted castle. Thou wilt not be able to make thy way to it if I do not give thee an iron wand and two small loaves of bread. Strike thrice with the wand on the iron door of the castle, and it will spring open. Inside lie two lions with gaping jaws. But if thou throwest a loaf to each of them, they will be quieted. Then hasten to fetch some of the water of life before the clock strikes twelve, else the door will shut again, and thou wilt be imprisoned. The prince thanked him took the wand and the bread, and set out on his way. When he arrived, everything was as the dwarf had said. The door sprang open at the third stroke of the wand, and when he had appeased the lions with the bread, he entered the castle, and came to a large and splendid hall, wherein sat some enchanted princes, whose rings he drew off their fingers. A sword and a loaf of bread were lying there, which he carried away. After this he entered a chamber, in which was a beautiful maiden, who rejoiced when she saw him, kissed him, and told him that he had delivered her, and should have the whole of her kingdom, and that, if he would return in a year, 
their wedding should be celebrated. Likewise she told him where the spring of water of life was, and that he was to hasten and draw some of it before the clock struck twelve. Then he went onwards, and at last entered a room where there was a beautiful, newly made bed, and as he was very weary, he felt inclined to rest a little, so he lay down and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was striking a quarter to twelve. He sprang up in fright, ran to the spring, drew some water in a cup which stood near, and hastened away. But just as he was passing through the iron door, the clock struck twelve, and the door fell to with such violence that it carried away a piece of his heel. He, however, rejoicing at having obtained the water of life, went homewards, and again passed the dwarf. When the latter saw the sword and the loaf, he said, With these thou hast won great wealth. With the sword thou canst slay whole armies, and the bread will never come to an end. But the prince would not go home to his father without his brothers, and said, Dear dwarf, canst thou not tell me where my two brothers are? They went out before I did in search of the water of life, and have not returned. They are imprisoned between two mountains, said the dwarf. I have condemned them to stay there, because they were haughty. Then the prince begged until the dwarf released them, and he warmed him, however, and said, Beware of them, for they have bad hearts. When his brothers came, he rejoiced and told them how things had gone with him, that he had found the water of life and had brought a cup full away with him, and had rescued a beautiful princess who was willing to wait a year for him, and then their wedding was to be celebrated and he would obtain a great kingdom. After that they rode on together and chanced upon the land where war and famine reigned, and the king already thought he must perish for the scarcity was so great. Then the prince went to him and gave him the loaf, wherewith he fed and satisfied the whole of his kingdom. And then the prince gave him the sword also, wherewith he slew the hosts of his enemies, and could now live in rest and peace. The prince then took back his loaf and his sword, and the three brothers rode on. But after this they entered two more countries, where war and famine reigned, and each time the prince gave his loaf and his sword to the kings, and had now delivered three kingdoms, and after that they went on board a ship and sailed over the sea. During the passage, the two eldest conversed apart and said, The youngest has found the water of life, and not we. For that our father will give him the kingdom, the kingdom which belongs to us, and he will rob us of all our fortune. They then began to seek revenge and plotted with each other to destroy him. They waited until they found him fast asleep. Then they poured the water of life out of the cup and took it for themselves. But into the cup they poured salt sea water. Now, therefore, when they arrived home, the youngest took his cup to the sick king in order that he might drink out of it and be cured. But scarcely had he drunk a very little of the salt sea water than he became still worse than before. And as he was lamenting over this, the two eldest brothers came and accused the youngest of having intended to poison him, and said that they had brought him the true water of life and handed it to him. He had scarcely tasted it when he felt his sickness departing and became strong and healthy as in the days of his youth. After that they both went to the youngest, mocked him, and said, You certainly found the water of life, but you have had the pain, and we the gain. You should have been sharper, and should have kept your eyes open. We took it from you whilst you were asleep at sea, and when the year is over, one of us will go and fetch the beautiful princess. But beware that you do not disclose aught of this to our father. Indeed, he does not trust you. And if you say a single word, you shall lose your life into the bargain. But if you keep silent, you shall have it as a gift. 
The old king was angry with his youngest son, and thought he had plotted against his life. So he summoned the court together, and had sentence pronounced upon his son that he should be secretly shot. And once, when the prince was riding forth to the chase, suspecting no evil, the king's huntsman had to go with him. And when they were quite alone in the forest, the huntsman looked so sorrowful that the prince said to him, Dear huntsman, what ails you? The huntsman said, I cannot tell you, and yet I ought. Then the prince said, Say openly what it is, I will pardon you. Alas, said the huntsman, I am to shoot you dead. The king has ordered me to do it. Then the prince was shocked and said, Dear huntsman, let me live. There, I give you my royal garments. Give me your common ones in their stead. The huntsman said, I will willingly do that. Indeed, I should not have been able to shoot you. Then they exchanged clothes, and the huntsman entered the home. The prince, however, went further into the forest. After a time, three wagons of gold and precious stones came to the king, for his youngest son, which were sent by the three kings who had slain their enemies with the prince's sword and maintained their people with his bread and who wished to show their gratitude for it. The old king then thought, Can my son have been innocent? And said to his people, Would that he were still alive. How it grieves me that I have suffered him to be killed. He still lives, said the huntsman. I could not find it in my heart to carry out your command, and told the king how it had happened. Then a stone fell from the king's heart, and he had it proclaimed in every country that his son might return and be taken into favor again. The princess, however, had a road made up to her palace which was quite bright and golden, and told her people that whosoever came riding straight along it to her would be the right wooer and was to be admitted, and whoever rode by the side of it was not the right one and was not to be admitted. As the time was now close at hand, the eldest thought he would hasten to go to the king's daughter and give himself out as her deliverer and thus win her for his bride and the kingdom to boot. Therefore he rode forth, and when he arrived in front of the palace, he saw the splendid golden road and thought, It would be a sin and a shame if I were to ride over that, and turned aside, and rode on the right side of it. But when he came to the door, the servants told him that he was not the right man, and was to go away. Soon after this the second prince set out, and when he came to the golden road, and his horse had put one foot on it, he thought, It would be a sin and a shame to tread a piece of it off. And he turned aside and rode on the left side of it. And when he reached the door, the attendants told him he was not the right one, and he was to go away. When at last the year had entirely expired, the third son likewise wished to ride out of the forest to his beloved and with her forget his sorrows. So he set out and thought of her so incessantly and wished to be with her so much that he never noticed the golden road at all. So his horse rode onwards up the middle of it, and when he came to the door it was opened and the princess received him with joy and said he was her deliverer and the lord of the kingdom, and their wedding was celebrated with great rejoicing. When it was over, she told him that his father invited him to come to him, and had forgiven him. So he rode thither, and told him everything, how his brothers had betrayed him, and how he had nevertheless kept silence. The old king wished to punish them, but they had put to sea, and never came back as long as they lived. End of story 97。story 98 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Dr. Knowall There was once upon a time a poor peasant called Crab, who drove with two oxen a load of wood to the town, and sold it to a doctor for two thalers. When the money was being counted out to him, it so happened that the doctor was sitting at table, and when the peasant saw how daintily he ate and drank, his heart desired what he saw, and he would willingly have been a doctor too. So he remained standing a while, and at length inquired if he too could not become a doctor. "'Oh, yes,' said the doctor. "'That is soon managed.' "'What must I do?' asked the peasant. "'In the first place, buy thyself an ABC book of the kind which has a cock on the frontispiece. In second, turn thy cart and thy oxen into money, and get thyself some clothes, and whatever else pertains to medicine. Thirdly, have a sign painted for thyself with the words, I am Dr. Knowall, and have that nailed up above thy house door. The peasant did everything that he had been told to do. When he had doctored people a while, but not long, a rich and great lord had some money stolen. Then he was told about Dr. Knowall, who lived in such and such a village, and must know what had become of the money. So the lord had the horses put in his carriage, drove out to the village, and asked Crab if he were Dr. Knowall. Yes, he was, he said. Then he was to go with him and bring back the stolen money. Oh yes, but Greta, my wife, must go too. The lord was willing and let both of them have a seat in the carriage, and they all drove away together. When they came to the nobleman's castle, the table was spread, and Crab was told to sit down and eat. "'Yes, but my wife, Greta, too,' he said, and seated himself with her at the table. And when the first servant came with a dish of delicate fare, the peasant nudged his wife and said, "'Greta, that was the first, meaning that was the servant who brought the first dish.' The servant, however, thought he intended by that to say, "'That is the first thief,' and as he actually was so, he was terrified and said to his comrade outside, the doctor knows all, we shall fare ill, he said I was the first. The second did not want to go in at all, but was forced. When he went in with his dish, the peasant nudged his wife and said, Greta, that is the second. This servant was just as much alarmed, and he got out. The third did not fare better, for the peasant again said, Greta, that is the third. The fourth had to carry in a dish that was covered, and the lord told the doctor that he was to show his skill and guess what was beneath the cover. The doctor looked at the dish, had no idea what to say, and cried, Ah, poor crab! When the lord heard that, he cried, There! He knows it! He knows who has the money! On this, the servants looked terribly uneasy, and made a sign to the doctor that they wished him to step outside for a moment. When therefore he went out, all four of them confessed to him that they had stolen the money, and said that they would willingly restore it and give him a heavy sum into the bargain, if he would not denounce them, for if they did, they would be hanged. They led him to the spot where the money was concealed. With this, the doctor was satisfied, and returned to the hall, sat down to the table, and said, My lord, now I will search in my book where the gold is hidden. The fifth servant, however, crept into the stove to hear if the doctor knew still more. The doctor, however, sat still and opened his ABC book, turned the pages backwards and forwards, and looked for the cock. As he could not find it immediately, he said, I know you are there, so you had better show yourself. Then the fellow in the stove thought that the doctor met him, and, full of terror, sprang out, crying, That man knows everything! Then Dr. Knowall showed the count where the money was, but did not say who had stolen it, and received from both sides much money in reward, and became a renowned man. End of story number 98「Story number 99 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Spirit in the Bottle 
there was once a poor woodcutter who toiled from early morning till late night when at last he had laid by some money he said to his boy you are my only child i will spend the money which i have earned with the sweat of my brow on your education if you learn some honest trade you can support me in my old age when my limbs have grown stiff and i am obliged to stay at home then the boy went to a high school and learned diligently so that his masters praised him and he remained there a long time when he had worked through two classes but was still not yet perfect in everything the little pittance which the father had earned was all spent and the boy was obliged to return home to him ah said the father sorrowfully i can give you no more and in these hard times i cannot earn a farthing more than will suffice for our daily bread dear father answered the son don't trouble yourself about it if it is god's will it will turn to my advantage i shall soon accustom myself to it when the father wanted to go into the forest to earn money by helping to pile and stack wood and also chop it the son said i will go with you and help you nay my son said the father that would be hard for you you are not accustomed to rough work and will not be able to bear it besides i have only one axe and no money left wherewith to buy another just go to the neighbour answered the son he will lend you his axe until i have earned one for myself the father then borrowed an axe of the neighbour and next morning at break of day they went out into the forest together the son helped his father and was quite merry and brisk about it but when the sun was right over their heads the father said we will rest and have our dinner and then we shall work as well again the son took his bread in his hands and said just you rest father i am not tired i will walk up and down a little in the forest and look for birds nests oh you fool said the father why should you want to run about there afterwards you will be tired and no longer able to raise your arm stay here and sit down beside me the son however went into the forest ate his bread was very merry and peered in among the green branches to see if he could discover a bird's nest anywhere so he went up and down to see if he could find a bird's nest until at last he came to a great dangerous looking oak which certainly was already many hundred years old and which five men could not have spanned he stood still and looked at it and thought many a bird must have built its nest in that then all at once it seemed to him that he heard a voice he listened and became aware that someone was crying in a very smothered voice let me out let me out he looked around but could discover nothing nevertheless he fancied that the voice came out of the ground then he cried where art thou the voice answered i am down here amongst the roots of the oak tree let me out let me out the scholar began to loosen the earth under the tree and search among the roots until at last he found a glass bottle in a little hollow he lifted it up and held it against the light and then saw a creature shaped like a frog springing up and down in it let me out let me out it cried anew and the scholar thinking no evil drew the cork out of the bottle immediately a spirit ascended from it and began to grow and grew so fast that in a very few moments he stood before the scholar a terrible fellow as big as half the tree by which he was standing knowest thou he cried in an awful voice what thy wages are for having let me out no replied the scholar fearlessly how should i know that then i will tell thee cried the spirit i must strangle thee for it thou shouldst have told me that sooner said the scholar for i should then have left thee shut up 
but my head shall stand fast for all thou canst do more persons than one must be consulted about that more persons here more persons there said the spirit thou shalt have the wages thou hast earned dost thou think that i was shut up there for such a long time as a favour no it was a punishment for me i am the mighty mercurius whoso releases me him must i strangle softly answered the scholar not so fast i must first know that thou really wert shut up in that little bottle and that thou art the right spirit if indeed thou canst get in again i will believe and then thou mayest do as thou wilt with me the spirit said haughtily that is a very trifling feat drew himself together and made himself as small and slender as he had been at first so that he crept through the same opening and right through the neck of the bottle in again scarcely was he within than the scholar thrust the cork he had drawn back into the bottle and threw it among the roots of the oak into its old place and the spirit was betrayed and now the scholar was about to return to his father but the spirit cried very piteously ah do let me out ah do let me out no answered the scholar not a second time he who has once tried to take my life shall not be set free by me now that i have caught him again if thou wilt set me free said the spirit i will give thee so much that thou wilt have plenty all the days of thy life no answered the boy thou wouldst cheat me as thou didst the first time thou art playing away with thy own good luck said the spirit i will do thee no harm but will reward thee richly the scholar thought i will venture it perhaps he will keep his word and anyhow he shall not get the better of me then he took out the cork and the spirit rose up from the bottle as he had done before stretched himself out and became as big as a giant now thou shalt have thy reward said he and handed the scholar a little bag just like a plaster and said if thou spreadest one end of this over a wound it will heal and if thou rubbest steel or iron with the other end it will be changed into silver i must just try that said the scholar and went to a tree tore off the bark with his axe and rubbed it with one end of the plaster it immediately closed together and was healed now it is all right he said to the spirit and we can part the spirit thanked him for his release and the boy thanked the spirit for his present and went back to his father where hast thou been racing about said the father why hast thou forgotten thy work i said at once that thou wouldst never get on with anything be easy father i will make it up make it up indeed said the father angrily there's no art in that take care father i will soon hew that tree there so that it will split then he took his plaster rubbed the axe with it and dealt a mighty blow but as the iron had changed into silver the edge turned hello father just look what a bad axe you've given me it has become quite crooked the father was shocked and said ah what hast thou done now i shall have to pay for that and have not the wherewithal and that is all the good i have got by thy work don't get angry said the son i will soon pay for the axe oh thou blockhead cried the father wherewith wilt thou pay for it thou hast nothing but what i give thee these are students tricks that are sticking in thy head but thou hast no idea of woodcutting after a while the scholar said father i can really work no more we had better take a holiday eh what answered he dost thou think i will sit with my hands lying in my lap like thee i must go on working but thou mayest take thyself off home father i am here in this wood for the first time i don't know my way alone do go with me 
as his anger had now abated the father at last let himself be persuaded and went home with him then he said to the son go and sell thy damaged axe and see what thou canst get for it and i must earn the difference in order to pay the neighbour the son took the axe and carried it into town to a goldsmith who tested it laid it in the scales and said it is worth four hundred talers i have not so much as that by me the son said give me what thou hast i will lend you the rest the goldsmith gave him three hundred talers and remained a hundred in his debt the son thereupon went home and said father i have got the money go and ask the neighbour what he wants for the axe i know that already answered the old man one taler six groschen then give him two talers twelve groschen that is double and enough see i have money in plenty and he gave the father a hundred talers and said you shall never know want live as comfortably as you like good heavens said the father how hast thou come by these riches the scholar then told how all had come to pass and how he trusting in his luck had made such a good hit but with the money that was left he went back to the high school and went on learning more and as he could heal all wounds with his plaster he became the most famous doctor in the whole world End of story number 99「So he went out into the forest, and when he had walked for a short time, he met a little man who was, however, the devil. The little man said to him, What ails you? You seem so very sorrowful. Then the soldier said, I am hungry, but have no money. The devil said, If you will hire yourself to me and be my serving man, you shall have enough for all your life. You shall serve me for seven years, and after that you shall again be free. But one thing I must tell you, and that is, you must not wash, comb, or trim yourself, or cut your hair or nails, or wipe the water from your eyes. The soldier said, All right, if there's no help for it, and went off with the little man, who straightway led him down into hell. Then he told him what he had to do. He was to poke the fire under the kettles wherein the hell broth was stewing, keep the house clean, drive all the sweepings behind the doors, and see that everything was in order. But if he once peeped into the kettles, it would go ill with him. The soldier said, Good, I will take care. And then the old devil went out again on his wanderings, and the soldier entered upon his new duties, made the fire and swept the dirt well behind the doors, just as he had been bidden. When the old devil came back again, he looked to see if all had been done, appeared satisfied, and went forth a second time. The soldier now took a good look on every side. The kettles were standing all round hell with a mighty fire below them, and inside they were boiling and sputtering. He would have given anything to look inside them, if the devil had not so particularly forbidden him. At last, he could no longer restrain himself, slightly raised the lid of the first kettle and peeped in. And there he saw his former corporal shut in. Aha, uh -huh, old bird, said he, do I meet you here? You once had me in your power, now I have you. And he quickly let the lid fall, poked the fire, and added a fresh log. After that, he went to the second kettle raised its lid also a little, and peeped in. His former ensign was in that. Aha, uh -huh, old bird, 
so i find you here you once had me in your power and now i have you he closed the lid again and fetched yet another log to make it really hot then he wanted to see who might be sitting up in the third kettle it was actually a general aha old bird do i meet you here once you had me in your power now i have you and he fetched the bellows and made hell-fire blaze right under him so he did his work seven years in hell did not wash comb or trim himself or cut his hair or nails or wash the water out of his eyes and the seven years seemed so short to him that he thought he had only been half a year now when the time had fully gone by the devil came and said well hans what have you done i poked the fire under the kettles and i have swept all the dirt well behind the doors but you have peeped into the kettles as well it is lucky for you that you added fresh logs to them or else your life would have been forfeited now that your time is up will you go home again yes said the soldier i should very much like to see what my father is doing at home the devil said in order that you may receive the wages you have earned go and fill your knapsack full of the sweepings and take it home with you you must also go unwashed and uncombed with long hair on your head and beard and with uncut nails and dim eyes and when you are asked whence you come you must say from hell and when you are asked who you are you are to say the devil's sooty brother and my king as well the soldier held his peace and did as the devil bade him but he was not at all satisfied with his wages then as soon as he was up in the forest again he took his knapsack from his back to empty it but on opening it the sweepings had become pure gold i should never have expected that said he and was well pleased and entered the town the landlord was standing in front of the inn and when he saw the soldier approaching he was terrified because hans looked so horrible worse than a scarecrow he called to him and asked whence comest thou from hell who art thou the devil's sooty brother and my king as well then the host would not let him enter but when hans showed him the gold he came and unlatched the door himself hans then ordered the best room and attendance ate and drank his fill but neither washed nor combed himself as the devil had bidden him and at last lay down to sleep but the knapsack full of gold remained before the eyes of the landlord and left him no peace and during the night he crept in and stole it away next morning however when hans got up and wanted to pay the landlord and travel further behold his knapsack was gone but he soon composed himself and thought thou hast been unfortunate from no fault of thine own and straightway went back again to hell complained of his misfortune to the old devil and begged for his help the devil said seat yourself i will wash comb and trim you cut your hair and nails and wash your eyes for you and when he had done with him he gave him the knapsack back again full of sweepings and said go and tell the landlord that he must return you your money or else i will come and fetch him and he shall poke the fire in your place hans went up and said to the landlord thou hast stolen my money if thou dost not return it thou shalt go down to hell in my place and wilt look as horrible as i then the landlord gave him the money and more besides only begging him to keep it secret and hans was now a rich man he set out on his way home to his father bought himself a shabby smock frock to wear and strolled about making music for he had learned to do that while he was with the devil in hell there was however an old king in that country before whom he had to play and the king was so delighted with his playing that he promised him his eldest daughter in marriage but when she heard that she was to be married to a common fellow in a smock frock she said rather than do that i would go into the deepest water then the king gave him the youngest who was quite willing to do it to please her father and thus the devil's sooty brother got the king's daughter 
and when the aged king died, the whole kingdom likewise. End of story 100「Story 101 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Bearskin. There was once a young fellow who enlisted as a soldier conducted himself bravely and was always the foremost when it rained bullets so long as the war lasted all went well but when peace was made he received his dismissal and the captain said he might go where he liked his parents were dead and he had no longer a home so he went to his brothers and begged them to take him in and keep him until war broke out again the brothers however were hard-hearted and said what can we do with thee thou art of no use to us go and make a living for thyself the soldier had nothing left but his gun he took that on his shoulder and went forth into the world he came to a wide heath on which nothing was to be seen but a circle of trees under these he sat sorrowfully down and began to think over his fate i have no money thought he i have learnt no trade but that of fighting and now that they have made peace they don't want me any longer, so I see beforehand that I shall have to starve. All at once he heard a rustling, and when he looked around, a strange man stood before him, who wore a green coat and looked right stately, but had a hideous cloven foot. I know already what thou art in need of, said the man. Gold and possession shall thou have, as much as thou canst make away with. Do what thou wilt." But first I must know if thou art fearless, that I may not bestow my money in vain. A soldier and fear? How can those two things go together? he answered. Thou canst put me to the proof. Very well, then, answered the man. Look behind thee. The soldier turned round and saw a large bear, which came growling towards him. Oh, cried the soldier, I will tickle thy nose for thee so that thou shalt soon lose thy fancy for growling. And he aimed at the bear and shot it through the muzzle. It fell down and never stirred again. I see quite well, said the stranger, that thou art not wanting in courage, but there is still another condition which thou wilt have to fulfill. If it does not endanger my salvation, replied the soldier, who knew very well who was standing by him, if it does, I'll have nothing to do with it. Thou wilt look to that for thyself, answered the green coat. Thou shalt for the next seven years neither wash thyself, nor comb thy beard, nor thy hair, nor cut thy nails, nor say one paternoster. I will give thee a coat and a cloak, which during this time thou must wear. If thou diest during these seven years, thou art mine. If thou remainest alive, thou art free, and rich to boot for all the rest of thy life. The soldier thought of the great extremity in which he now found himself, and as he so soon often had gone to meet death, he resolved to risk it now also, and agreed to the terms. The devil took off his green coat, gave it to the soldier, and said, If thou hast this coat on thy back, and puttest thy hand into the pocket, thou wilt always find it full of money. Then he pulled the skin off the bear and said, this shall be thy cloak, and thy bed also, for thereon shalt thou sleep, and in no other bed shalt thou lie, and because of this apparel shalt thou be called bearskin. After this the devil vanished. The soldier put the coat on, felt at once in the pocket, and found that the thing was really true. Then he put on the bearskin and went forth into the world, and enjoyed himself refraining from nothing that did him good and his money harm. During the first year his appearance was passable, but during the second he began to look like a monster. His hair covered nearly the whole of his face. His beard was like a piece of coarse felt. His fingers had claws, and his face was so covered with dirt that if cress had been sewn on it, it would have come up. Whosoever saw him ran away, 
but as he everywhere gave the poor money to pray that he might not die during the seven years, and as he paid well for everything, he still always found shelter. In the fourth year, he entered an inn where the landlord would not receive him, and would not even let him have a place in the stable, because he was afraid the horses would be scared. But as Bearskin thrust his hand into his pocket and pulled out a handful of ducats, the host let himself be persuaded and gave him a room in the outhouse. Bearskin was, however, obliged to promise not to let himself be seen, lest the inn should get a bad name. As Bearskin was sitting alone in the evening, and wishing from the bottom of his heart that the seven years were over, he heard a loud lamenting in a neighboring room. He had a compassionate heart, so he opened the door and saw an old man weeping bitterly and wringing his hands. Bearskin went nearer, but the man sprang to his feet and tried to escape from him. At last, when the man perceived that Bearskin's voice was human, he let himself be prevailed on, and by kind words, Bearskin succeeded so far that the old man revealed the cause of his grief. His property had dwindled away by degrees. He and his daughters would have to starve, and he was so poor that he could not pay the innkeeper and was to be put in prison. If that is your only trouble, said Bearskin, I have plenty of money. He caused the innkeeper to be brought thither, paid him, and put a purse full of gold into the poor old man's pocket besides. When the old man saw himself set free from all his troubles, he did not know how to be grateful enough. Come with me, said he to Bearskin. My daughters all have miracles of beauty. Choose one of them for thyself as a wife. When she hears what thou hast done for me, she will not refuse thee. Thou dost in truth look a little strange, but she will soon put thee to rights again. This pleased Bearskin well, and he went. When the eldest saw him, she was so terribly alarmed at his face that she screamed and ran away. The second stood still and looked at him from head to foot, but then she said, How can I accept a husband who no longer has a human form? The shaven bear that once was here and passed itself off for a man pleased me far better for at any rate it wore a hussar's dress and white gloves. If it were nothing but ugliness, I might get used to that. The youngest, however, said, Dear father, that must be a good man to have helped you out of your trouble. So if you have promised him a bride for doing it, your promise must be kept. It was a pity that Bearskin's face was covered with dirt and with hair, for if not, they might have seen how delighted he was when he heard those words he took a ring from his finger broke it in two and gave her one half the other he kept for himself he wrote his name however on her half and hers on his and begged her to keep her peace carefully and then he took his leave and said i must still wander about for three years and if i do not return then thou art free for i shall be dead but pray to God to preserve my life. The poor betrothed bride dressed herself entirely in black, and when she thought of her future bridegroom, tears came into her eyes. Nothing but contempt and mockery fell to her lot from her sisters. Take care, said the eldest, if thou givest him thy hand, he will strike his claws into it. Beware, said the second, bears like sweet things and if he takes a fancy to thee, he will eat thee up. Thou must always do as he likes, begged the elder again, or else he will growl. And the second continued, But the wedding will be a merry one, for bears dance well. The bride was silent and did not let them vex her. Bearskin, however, traveled about the world from one place to another, did good where he was able, and gave generously to the poor that they might pray for him. At length, as the last day of the seven years dawned, he went once more out on to the heath, and seated himself beneath the circle of trees. It was not long before the wind whistled, and the devil stood before him and looked angrily at him. Then he threw Bearskin his old coat, and asked for his own green one back. We have not got so far as that yet, answered Bearskin. 
thou must first make me clean whether the devil liked it or not he was forced to fetch water and wash bearskin comb his hair and cut his nails after this he looked like a brave soldier and was much handsomer than he had ever been before when the devil had gone away bearskin was quite light-hearted he went into the town put on a magnificent velvet coat seated himself in a carriage drawn by four white horses and drove to his bride's house no one recognized him the father took him for a distinguished general and led him into the room where his daughters were sitting he was forced to place himself between the two eldest they helped him to wine gave him the best pieces of meat and thought that in all the world they had never seen a handsomer man the bride however sat opposite to him in her black dress and never raised her eyes nor spoke a word when at length he asked the father if he would give him one of his daughters to wife the two eldest jumped up ran to their bedrooms and put on splendid dresses for each of them fancied she was the chosen one the stranger as soon as he was alone with his bride brought out his half of the ring and threw it in a glass of wine which he reached across the table to her she took the wine but when she had drunk it and found the half ring lying at the bottom her heart began to beat she got the other half which she wore on a ribbon round her neck joined them and saw that the two pieces fitted exactly together then said he i am thy betrothed bridegroom whom thou sawest as bearskin but through god's grace i have again received my human form and have once more become clean he went up to her embraced her and gave her a kiss in the meantime the two sisters came back in full dress and when they saw that the handsome man had fallen to the share of the youngest and heard that he was bearskin they ran out full of anger and rage one of them drowned herself in the well the other hanged herself on a tree in the evening some one knocked at the door and when the bridegroom opened it it was the devil in his green coat who said seest thou i have now got two souls in the place of thy one End of story 101story 102 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by thomas peter household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the willow wren and the bear once in summer time the bear and the wolf were walking in the forest and the bear heard a bird singing so beautifully that he said brother wolf what bird is it that sings so well that is the king of birds said the wolf before whom we must bow down it was however in reality the willow wren sang Kunik. if that's the case said the bear I should very much like to see his royal palace. Come, take me thither. That is not done quite as you seem to think, said the wolf. You must wait until the queen comes. Soon afterwards, the queen arrived with some food in her beak, and the lord king came too, and they began to feed their young ones. The bear would have liked to go at once, but the wolf held him back by the sleeve and said, No. You must wait until the Lord and Lady Queen have gone away again. So they observed the hole in which was the nest, and trotted away. The bear, however, could not rest until he had seen the royal palace, and when a short time had passed, again went to it. The king and queen had just flown out, so he peeped in, and saw five or six young ones lying in it. "'Is that the royal palace?' cried the bear. "'It is a wretched palace, and you are not king's children.' You are disreputable children. When the young wrens heard that, they were frightfully angry, and screamed, No, that we are not. Our parents are honest people. Bear, thou wilt have to pay for that. The bear and the wolf grew uneasy, 
and turned back and went into their holes. The young willow wrens, however, continued to cry and scream, and when their parents again brought food, they said, We will not so much as touch one fly's leg. No, not if we were dying of hunger, until you have settled whether we are respectable children or not. The bear has been here and has insulted us. Then the old king said, Be easy, he shall be punished. And he at once flew with the queen to the bear's cave and called in, Old growler! Why hast thou insulted my children? Thou shalt suffer for it. We will punish thee by a bloody war. Thus war was announced to the bear, and all four-footed animals were summoned to take part in it. Oxen, asses, cows, deer, and every other animal the earth contained. And the willow wren summoned everything which flew in the air. Not only birds, large and small, but midges and hornets, bees and flies had to come. When the time came for the war to begin, the willow wren sent out spies to discover who was the enemy's commander-in-chief. The gnat, who was the most crafty, flew into the forest where the enemy was assembled, and hid herself beneath the leaf of the tree where the watchword was to be given. There stood the bear, and he called the fox before him, and said, Fox, thou art the most cunning of all animals. Thou shalt be general and lead us. Good, said the fox, but what signal shall we agree upon? No one knew that, so the fox said, I have a fine, long, bushy tail, which almost looks like a plume of red feathers. When I lift my tail up quite high, all is going well, and you must charge. But if I let it hang down... Run away as fast as you can. When the gnat had heard that, she flew away again, and revealed everything with the greatest minuteness to the willow wren. When day broke, and the battle was to begin, all the four-footed animals came running up with such a noise that the earth trembled. The willow wren also came flying through the air with his army with such a humming and whirring and swarming that everyone was uneasy and afraid and on both sides they advanced against each other. But the willow wren sent down the hornet, with orders to get beneath the fox's tail, and sting with all his might. When the fox felt the first sting, he started so that he drew up one leg, with the pain, but he bore it, and still kept his tail high in the air. At the second sting, he was forced to put it down for a moment. At the third, he could hold out no longer and screamed out, and put his tail between his legs. When the animals saw that, they thought all was lost, and began to fly, each into his hole, and the birds had won the battle. Then the king and queen flew home to their children, and cried, Children, rejoice! Eat and drink to your heart's content. We have won the battle. But the young wrens said, We will not eat yet! The bear must come to the nest, and beg for pardon, and say that we are honorable children before we will do that. Then the willow wren flew to the bear's hole and cried, Growler, thou art to come to the nest to my children, and beg their pardon, or else every rib of thy body shall be broken. So the bear crept thither in the greatest fear, and begged their pardon. And now at last the young wrens were satisfied and sat down together, and ate, and drank, and made merry till quite late into the night. End of story 102。Story 103 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Sweet Porridge. There was a poor but good little girl who lived alone with her mother, and they no longer had anything to eat. So the child went into the forest, and there an aged woman met her who was aware of her sorrow and presented her with a little pot which when she said, Cook, little pot, cook, would cook good, sweet porridge, and when she said, Stop, little pot, it ceased to cook. 
The girl took the pot home to her mother, and now they were freed from their poverty and hunger, and ate sweet porridge as often as they chose. Once on a time when the girl had gone out, her mother said, Cook, little pot, cook. And it did cook, and she ate till she was satisfied, and then she wanted the pot to stop cooking, but did not know the word. So it went on cooking, and the porridge rose over the edge, and still it cooked on until the kitchen and whole house were full, and then the next house, and then the whole street, just as if it wanted to satisfy the hunger of the whole world, and there was the greatest distress, but no one knew how to stop it. At last, when only one single house remained, the child came home and just said, Stop, little pot, and it stopped and gave up cooking, and whosoever wished to return to the town had to eat his way back. End of Story 103「Story 104 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Wise Folks. One day a peasant took his good hazel stick out of the corner and said to his wife, Trina, I am going across country, and shall not return for three days. If, during that time, the cattle dealer should happen to call, and want to buy our three cows, you may strike a bargain at once, but not unless you can get two hundred thalers for them. Nothing less, do you hear? For heaven's sake, just go in peace, answered the woman. I will manage that. You indeed, said the man. You once fell on your head when you were a little child and that affects you even now. But let me tell you this. If you do anything foolish, I will make your back black and blue, and not with paint, I assure you, but with the stick which I have in my hand, and the coloring shall last a whole year. You may rely on that. And having said that, the man went on his way. Next morning the cattle dealer came, and the woman had no need to say many words to him. When he had seen the cows and heard the price, he said, I am quite willing to give that. Honestly speaking, they are worth it. I will take the beasts away with me at once. He unfastened their chains and drove them out of the byre. But just as he was going out of the yard door, the woman clutched him by the sleeve and said, You must give me the two hundred thalers now, or I cannot let the cows go. True, answered the man, but I have forgotten to buckle on my money belt. Have no fear, however. You shall have security for my paying. I will take two cows with me and leave one, and then you will have a good pledge. The woman saw the force of this and let the man go away with the cows, and thought to herself, How pleased Hans will be when he finds out how cleverly I have managed it. The peasant came home on the third day as he had said he would, and at once inquired if the cows were sold. Yes, indeed, dear Hans, answered the woman. And... As you said, for two hundred thalers. They are scarcely worth so much, but the man took them without making any objection. Where is the money? asked the peasant. Oh, I have not got the money, replied the woman. He had happened to forget his money belt, but he will soon bring it, and he left good security behind him. What kind of security? asked the man. One of the three cows, which he shall not have until he is paid for the other two. I have managed very cunningly, for I have kept the smallest which eats the least. The man was enraged and lifted up his stick, and was just going to give her the beating he had promised her. Suddenly he let the stick fall and said, You are the stupidest goose that ever waddled on God's earth, but I am sorry for you. I will go out into the highways and wait there for three days to see if I find anyone who is still stupider than you. If I succeed in doing so, you shall go scot-free, but if I do not find him, you shall receive your well-deserved reward without any discount. He went out into the great highways and sat down on a stone and waited for what would happen. Then he saw a peasant's wagon coming towards him, and a woman was standing upright in the middle of it, instead of sitting on the bundle of straw which was lying beside her. 
or walking near the oxen and leading them. The man thought to himself, This is certainly one of the kind I am in search of, and jumped up and ran backwards and forwards in front of the wagon like one who is not very wise. But what do you want, my friend? said the woman to him. I don't know you. Where do you come from? I have fallen down from heaven, replied the man, and don't know how to get back again. Couldn't you drive me up? No, said the woman. I don't know the way. But if you come from heaven, you can surely tell me how my husband, who has been there these three years, is. You must have seen him. Oh, yes, I have seen him. But all men can't get on well. He keeps sheep, and the sheep give him a great deal to do. They run up to the mountains and lose their way in the wilderness, and he has to run after them and drive them together again. His clothes are all torn to pieces, too, and will soon fall off his body. There is no tailor there, for St. Peter won't let any of them in, as you know by the story. Who would have thought it? cried the woman. I tell you what, I will fetch his Sunday coat, which is still hanging at home in the cupboard, and he can wear that and look respectable. You will be so kind as to take it with you. That won't do very well, answered the peasant. People are not allowed to take clothes into heaven. They are taken away from one at the gate. Then hark you, said the woman. I sold my fine wheat yesterday and got a good lot of money for it. I will send that to him. If you hide the purse in your pocket, no one will know that you have it. If you can't manage it any other way, said the peasant, I will do you that favor. Just sit still where you are, said she, and I will drive home and fetch the purse. I shall soon be back again. I do not sit down on the bundle of straw, but stand up in the wagon because it makes it lighter for the cattle. She drove her oxen away, and the peasant thought, that woman has a perfect talent for folly. If she really brings the money, my wife may think herself fortunate, for she will get no beating. It was not long before she came in a great hurry with the money, and with her own hands put it in his pocket. Before she went away, she thanked him again a thousand times for his courtesy. When the woman got home again, she found her son, who had come in from the field. She told him what unlooked-for things had befallen her, and then added, I am truly delighted at having found an opportunity of sending something to my poor husband. Who would ever have imagined that he could be suffering for want of anything up in heaven? The son was full of astonishment. Mother, said he, it is not every day that a man comes from heaven in this way. I will go out immediately and see if he's still to be found. He must tell me what it is like up there and how the work is done. He saddled the horse and rode off with all speed. He found the peasant who was sitting under a willow tree and was just going to count the money in the purse. Have you seen the man who has fallen down from heaven? cried the youth to him. Yes, answered the peasant. He has set out on his way back there and has gone up that hill from whence it will be rather nearer. You could still catch him up if you were to ride fast. Alas, said the youth. I have been doing tiring work all day, and the ride here has completely worn me out. You know the man. Be so kind as to get on my horse and go and persuade him to come here. Ah, thought the peasant, here is another who has no wick in his lamp. Why should I not do this favor, said he, and mounted the horse and rode off in a quick trot. The youth remained sitting there till night fell, but the peasant never came back. The man from heaven must certainly have been in a great hurry, and would not turn back, thought he. And the peasant has no doubt given him the horse to take to my father. He went home and told his mother what had happened, and that he had sent his father the horse so that he might not have always be running about. Thou hast done well, answered she. Thy legs are younger than his, and thou canst go on foot. When the peasant got home, he put the horse in the stable beside the cow, which he had as a pledge, and then went to his wife and said, Trina, as your luck would have it, I have found two who are still sillier fools than you. This time you escape without a beating. I will store it up for another occasion. When he lighted his pipe, sat down in his grandfather's chair and said, It was a great stroke of business to get a sleek horse and a great purse full of money into the bargain 
for two lean cows. If stupidity always brought in as much as that, I would be quite willing to hold it in honor. So, thought the peasant, but you no doubt prefer the simple folks. End of Story 104「Story 105 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Stories about Snakes First Story there was once a little child, whose mother gave her every afternoon a small bowl of milk and bread, and the child seated herself in the yard with it. When she began to eat, however, a snake came creeping out of a crevice in the wall, dipped its little head in the dish, and ate with her. The child had pleasure in this, and when she was sitting there with her little dish, and the snake did not come at once, she cried, "'Snake!' snake come swiftly hither come thou tiny thing thou shalt have thy crumbs of bread thou shalt refresh thyself with milk then the snake came in haste and enjoyed its food moreover it showed gratitude for it brought the child all kinds of pretty things from its hidden treasures bright stones pearls and golden playthings the snake however only drank the milk and left the bread crumbs alone then one day the child took its little spoon, and struck the snake gently on its head with it, and said, "'Eat the breadcrumbs as well, little thing!' The mother, who was standing in the kitchen, heard the child talking to someone, and when she saw that she was striking a snake with her spoon, ran out with a log of wood, and killed the good little creature. From that time forth a change came over the child. As long as the snake had eaten with her, she had grown tall and strong but now she lost her pretty rosy cheeks and wasted away. It was not long before the funeral bird began to cry in the night, and the red breast to collect little branches and leaves for a funeral garland, and soon afterwards the child lay on her bier. Second Story An orphan child was sitting on the town walls, spinning, when she saw a snake coming out of a hole low down in the wall. Swiftly she spread out beside this one of the blue silk handkerchiefs which snakes have such a strong liking for, and which are the only things they will creep on. As soon as the snake saw it, it went back, then returned, bringing with it a small golden crown, laid it on the handkerchief, and then went away again. The girl took up the crown. It glittered, and was of delicate golden filigree work. It was not long before the snake came back for the second time, but when it no longer saw the crown, it crept up to the wall, and in its grief smote its little head against it as long as it had strength to do so, until at last it lay there dead. If the girl had but left the crown where it was, the snake would certainly have brought still more of his treasures out of the hole. Third Story A snake cries, Hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo, a child says, Come out! The snake comes out, then the child inquires about her little sister. Hast thou not seen little red stockings? The snake says, No, neither have I. Then I am like you. Hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo. End of Story 105「Story 106 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Poor Miller's Boy and the Cat. In a certain mill lived an old miller who had neither wife nor child, and three apprentices served under him. As they had been with him several years, he one day said to them, I am old and want to sit in the chimney corner. 
go out, and whichsoever of you brings me the best horse home, to him will I give the mill, and in return for it he shall take care of me till my death. The third of the boys was, however, the drudge, who was looked on as foolish by the others. They begrudged the mill to him, and afterwards he would not have it. Then all three went out together, and when they came to the village, the two said to the stupid Hans, Thou mayest just as well stay here. As long as thou livest, thou wilt never get a horse. Hans, however, went with them, and when it was night, they came to a cave in which they lay down to sleep. The two sharp ones waited until Hans had fallen asleep, then they got up and went away, leaving him where he was, and they thought they had done a very clever thing, but it was certain to turn out ill for them. When the sun arose, and Hans woke up, he was lying in a deep cavern. He looked around on every side and exclaimed, Oh, heavens, where am I? Then he got up and clambered out of the cave, went into the forest and thought, Here I am quite alone and deserted. How shall I obtain a horse now? Whilst he was thus walking full of thought, he met a small tabby cat, which said quite kindly, Hans, where are you going? Alas, thou canst not help me. I well know thy desire, said the cat. You wish to have a beautiful horse. Come with me and be my faithful servant for seven years long, and then I will give you one more beautiful than any you have ever seen in your whole life. Well, this is a wonderful cat, thought Hans, but I am determined to see if she is telling the truth. So she took him with her into her enchanted castle, where there were nothing but cats who were her servants. They leapt nimbly upstairs and downstairs, and were merry and happy. In the evening, when they sat down to dinner, three of them had to make music. One played the bassoon, the other the fiddle, and the third put the trumpet to his lips and blew out his cheeks as much as he possibly could. When they had dined, the table was carried away, and the cat said, Now, Hans, come and dance with me. No, said he, I won't dance with a pussy cat. I have never done that yet. Then take him to bed, said she to the cats. So one of them lighted him to his bedroom. One pulled off his shoes, one his stockings, and at last one of them blew out the candle. Next morning they returned and helped him out of bed. One put his stockings on for him, one tied his garters, one brought his shoes and washed him, and one dried his face with her tail. That feels very soft, said Hans. He, however, had to serve the cat and chop some wood every day, and to do that he had an axe of silver, and a wedge and saw were of silver, and the mallet of copper. So he chopped the wood small, stayed there in the house, and had good meat and drink, but never saw anyone but the tabby cat and her servants. Once she said to him, Go and mow my meadow, and dry the grass, and gave him a scythe of silver, and a wet stone of gold, but bade him deliver them up again carefully. So Hans went thither, and did what he was bidden, and when he had finished the work, he carried the scythe, whetstone, and hay to the house, and asked if it was not yet time for her to give him his reward. No, said the cat, you must first do something more for me of the same kind. There is timber of silver, carpenter's axe, square, and everything that is needful, all of silver. With these build me a small house. Then Hans built the small house and said that he had now done everything, and still he had no horse. Nevertheless, the seven years had gone by with him as if they were six months. The cat asked him if he would like to see her horses. Yes, said Hans. Then she opened the door of the small house, and when she had opened it, there stood twelve horses, such horses so bright and shining that his heart rejoiced at the sight of them. And now she gave him to eat and drink, and said, Go home, I will not give thee thy horse away with thee, but in three days' time I will follow thee and bring it. So Hans set out, and she showed him the way to the mill. 
She had, however, never once given him a new coat, and he had been obliged to keep on his dirty old smock frock, which he had brought with him, and which, during the seven years, had everywhere become too small for him. When he reached home, the other two apprentices were there again as well, and each of them certainly had brought a horse with him, but one of them was a blind one, and the other one lame. They asked Hans where his horse was. It will follow me in three days' time. And they laughed and said, Indeed, stupid Hans, where wilt thou get a horse? It will be a fine one. Hans went into the parlor, but the miller said he should not sit down to table, for he was so ragged and torn that they would all be ashamed of him if any one came in. So they gave him a mouthful of food outside, and at night, when they went to rest, the two others would not let him have a bed, and at last he was forced to creep into the goose house and lie down on a little hard straw. In the morning he awoke. The three days had passed, and a coach came with six horses, and they shone so bright that it was delightful to see them, and a servant brought a seventh as well, which was for the poor miller's boy, and a magnificent princess alighted from the coach and went into the mill, and this princess was the little tabby cat whom poor Hans had served for seven years. She asked the miller where the miller's boy and drudge was. Then the miller said, We cannot have him here in the mill, for he is so ragged. He is lying in the goose house. Then the king's daughter said that they were to bring him immediately. So they brought him out, and he had to hold his little smock frock together to cover himself. The servants unpacked splendid garments and washed him and dressed him, and when he was done, no king could have looked more handsome. Then the maiden desired to see the horses which the other apprentices had brought home with them, and one of them was blind and the other lame. So she ordered the servant to bring the seventh horse, and when the miller saw it, he said that such a horse as that had never yet entered his yard. And that is for the third miller's boy, said she. Then he must have the mill, said the miller. But the king's daughter said that the horse was there, and that he was to keep the mill as well, and took her faithful Hans, and set him in the coach, and drove away with him. They first drove to the little house, which he had built with the silver tools, and behold it was a great castle, and everything inside it was of silver and gold, and she married him, and he was rich, so rich that he had enough for all the rest of his life. After this, let no one ever say that anyone who is silly can never become a person of importance. End of Story 106 Story 107 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Two Travelers. Hill and Vale do not come together, but the children of men do, good and bad. In this way a shoemaker and a tailor once met with each other in their travels. The tailor was a handsome little fellow who was always merry and full of enjoyment. He saw the shoemaker coming toward him from the other side, and as he observed by his bag what kind of a trade he plied, he sang a little mocking song to him. Sew me the seam, draw me the thread, spread it over with pitch, knock the nail on the head. The shoemaker, however, could not endure a joke. He pulled a face as if he had drunk vinegar, and made a gesture as if he were about to seize the tailor by the throat. But the little fellow began to laugh, reached him his bottle, and said, No harm was meant, take a drink, and swallow your anger down. The shoemaker took a very hearty drink, and the storm on his face began to clear away. He gave the bottle back to the tailor and said, I spoke civilly to you. 
one speaks well after much drinking but not after much thirst shall we travel together all right answered the tailor if only it suits you to go into a big town where there is no lack of work that is just where i want to go answered the shoemaker in a small nest there is nothing to earn and in the country people like to go barefoot they travelled therefore onwards together and always set one foot before the other like a weasel in the snow both of them had time enough but little to bite and to break when they reached a town they went about and paid their respects to the tradesmen and because the tailor looked so lively and merry and had such pretty red cheeks every one gave him work willingly and when luck was good the master's daughters gave him a kiss beneath the porch as well when he again fell in with the shoemaker the tailor had always the most in his bundle the ill-tempered shoemaker made a wry face and thought the greater the rascal the more the luck but the tailor began to laugh and to sing and shared all he got with his comrade if a couple of pence jingled in his pockets he ordered good cheer and thumped the table in his joy till the glasses danced and it was lightly come lightly go with him when they had travelled for some time they came to a great forest through which passed the road to the capital two footpaths however led through it one of which was a seven days journey and the other only two but neither of the travellers knew which way was the short one they seated themselves beneath an oak tree and took counsel together how they should forecast and for how many days they should provide themselves with bread the shoemaker said one must look before one leaps i will take with me bread for a week what said the tailor drag bread for seven days on one's back like a beast of burden and not be able to look about i shall trust in god and not trouble myself about anything the money i have in my pocket is as good in summer as in winter but in hot weather bread gets dry and mouldy into the bargain even my coat does not go as far as it might besides why should we not find the right way bread for two days and that's enough each therefore bought his own bread and then they tried their luck in the forest it was as quiet there as in a church no wind stirred no brook murmured no bird sang and through the thickly leaved branches no sunbeam forced its way the shoemaker never spoke a word the heavy bread weighed down his back until the perspiration streamed down his cross and gloomy face the tailor however was quite merry he jumped about whistled on a leaf or sang a song and thought to himself god in heaven must be pleased to see me so happy this lasted two days but on the third the forest would not come to an end and the tailor had eaten up all his bread so after all his heart sank down a yard deeper in the meantime he did not lose courage but relied on god and on his luck on the third day he lay down in the evening hungry under a tree and rose again next morning hungry still so also passed the fourth day and when the shoemaker seated himself on a fallen tree and devoured his dinner the tailor was only a looker-on if he begged for a little piece of bread the other laughed mockingly and said thou hast always been so merry now thou canst try for one what it is to be sad the birds which sing too early in the morning are struck by the hawk in the evening in short he was pitiless but on the fifth morning the poor tailor could no longer stand up and was hardly able to utter one word for weakness his cheeks were white and his eyes red then the shoemaker said to him i will give thee a bit of bread to-day but in return for it i will put out thy right eye the unhappy tailor who still wished to save his life could not do it in any other way he wept once more with both eyes and then held them out and the shoemaker who had a heart of stone put out his right eye with a sharp knife the tailor called to remembrance what his mother had formerly said to him when he had been eating secretly in the pantry eat what one can and suffer what one must when he had consumed his dearly bought bread he got on his legs again forgot his misery and comforted himself with the thought that he could always see enough with one eye but on the sixth day hunger made itself felt again and gnawed him almost to the heart in the evening he fell down by a tree and on the seventh morning he could not raise himself up for faintness and death was close at hand 
Then said the shoemaker, I will show mercy and give thee bread once more, but thou shalt not have it for nothing, I shall put out thy other eye for it. And now the tailor felt how thoughtless his life had been, prayed to God for forgiveness, and said, Do what thou wilt, I will bear what I must, but remember that our Lord God does not always look on passively, and that an hour will come when the evil deed which thou hast done to me, and which I have not deserved of thee, will be requited. When times were good with me, I shared what I had with thee. My trade is of that kind that each stitch must always be exactly like the other. If I no longer have my eyes and can sew no more, I must go a-begging. At any rate, do not leave me here alone when I am blind, or I shall die of hunger. The shoemaker, however, who had driven God out of his heart, took the knife and put out his left eye. Then he gave him a bit of bread to eat, held out a stick to him, and drew him on behind him. When the sun went down, they got out of the forest, and before them in the open country stood the gallows. Thither the shoemaker guided the blind tailor, and then left him alone and went his way. Weariness, pain, and hunger made the wretched man fall asleep, and he slept the whole night. When day dawned he awoke, but knew not where he lay. Two poor sinners were hanging on the gallows, and a crow sat on the head of each of them. Then one of the men who had been hanged began to speak, and said, Brother, art thou awake? Yes, I am awake, answered the second. Then I will tell thee something, said the first. The dew which this night has fallen down over us from the gallows gives every one who washes himself with it his eyes again. If blind people did but know this, how many would regain their sight who do not believe that to be possible? When the tailor heard that, he took his pocket handkerchief, pressed it on the grass, and when it was moist with dew, washed the sockets of his eyes with it. Immediately was fulfilled what the man on the gallows had said, and a couple of healthy new eyes filled the sockets. It was not long before the tailor saw the sun rise behind the mountains. In the plain before him lay the great royal city with its magnificent gates and hundred towers, and the golden balls and crosses which were on the spires began to shine. He could distinguish every leaf on the trees, saw the birds which flew past, and the midges which danced in the air. He took a needle out of his pocket, and as he could thread it as well as he ever had done, his heart danced with delight. He threw himself on his knees, thanked God for the mercy he had shown him, and said his morning prayer. He did not forget to also pray for the poor sinners who were hanging there swinging against each other in the wind like the pendulums of clocks. Then he took his bundle on his back, and soon forgot the pain of heart he had endured, and went on his way singing and whistling. The first thing he met was a brown foal running about the fields at large. He caught it by the mane, and wanted to spring on it and ride into the town. The foal, however, begged to be set free. I am still too young, it said. Even a light tailor such as thou art would break my back in two. Let me go till I have grown strong. A time may perhaps come when I may reward thee for it. Run off, said the tailor. I see thou art still a giddy thing. He gave it a touch with a switch over its back, whereupon it kicked up its hind legs for joy, leapt over hedges and ditches, and galloped away into the open country. But the little tailor had eaten nothing since the day before. The sun, to be sure, fills my eyes, said he, but the bread does not fill my mouth. The first thing that comes across me and is even half edible will have to suffer for it. In the meantime a stork stepped solemnly over the meadow towards him. Halt! Halt! cried the tailor, and seized him by the leg. I don't know if thou art good to eat or not, but my hunger leaves me no great choice. I must cut thy head off and roast thee. Don't do that, replied the stork. I am a sacred bird which brings mankind great profit, and no one does me an injury. Leave me my life, and I may do thee good in some other way. Well, be off, cousin Longlegs, said the tailor. The stork rose up, let its long legs hang down, and flew gently away. What's to be the end of this, said the tailor to himself at last. My hunger grows greater and greater, and my stomach more and more empty. Whatsoever comes in my way now is lost. At this moment he saw a couple of young ducks which were on a pond come swimming towards him. 
you come just at the right moment said he and laid hold of one of them and was about to wring its neck on this an old duck which was hidden among the reeds began to scream loudly and swam to him with open beak and begged him urgently to spare her dear children canst thou not imagine said she how thy mother would mourn if any one wanted to carry thee off and give thee thy finishing stroke only be quiet said the good-tempered tailor thou shalt keep thy children and put the prisoner back into the water when he turned round he was standing in front of an old tree which was partly hollow and saw some wild bees flying in and out of it there i shall at once find the reward of my good deed said the tailor the honey will refresh me but the queen bee came out threatened him and said if thou touchest my people and destroyest my nest our stings shall pierce thy skin like ten thousand red-hot needles but if thou wilt leave us in peace and go thy way we will do thee a service for it another time the little tailor saw that here also nothing was to be done three dishes empty and nothing on the fourth is a bad dinner he dragged himself therefore with his starved out stomach into the town and as it was just striking twelve all was ready cooked for him at the inn and he was able to sit down at once to dinner when he was satisfied he said now i will get to work he went round the town sought a master and soon found a good situation as however he had thoroughly learnt his trade it was not long before he became famous and every one wanted to have his new coat made by the little tailor whose importance increased daily i can go no further in skill said he and yet things improve every day at last the king appointed him court tailor but how things do happen in the world on the very same day his former comrade the shoemaker also became court shoemaker when the latter caught sight of the tailor and saw that he had once more two healthy eyes his conscience troubled him before he takes revenge on me thought he to himself i must dig a pit for him he however who digs a pit for another falls into it himself in the evening when work was over and it had grown dusk he stole to the king and said lord king the tailor is an arrogant fellow and has boasted that he will get the gold crown back again which was lost in ancient times that would please me very much said the king and he caused the tailor to be brought before him the next morning and ordered him to get the crown back again or to leave the town for ever oh ho thought the tailor a rogue gives more than he has got if the surly king wants me to do what can be done by no one i will not wait till morning but will go out of the town at once to-day he packed up his bundle therefore but when he was without the gate he could not help being sorry to give up his good fortune and turn his back on the town in which all had gone so well with him he came to the bond where he had made the acquaintance of the ducks at that very moment the old one whose young ones he had spared was sitting there by the shore pluming herself with her beak she knew him again instantly and asked why he was hanging his head so thou wilt not be surprised when thou hearest what has befallen me replied the tailor and told her his fate if that be all said the duck we can help thee the crown fell into the water and lies down below at the bottom we will soon bring it up again for thee in the meantime just spread out thy handkerchief on the bank she dived down with her twelve young ones and in five minutes she was up again and sat with the crown resting on her wings and the twelve young ones were swimming round about and had put their beaks under it and were helping to carry it they swam to the shore and put the crown on the handkerchief no one can imagine how magnificent the crown was when the sun shone on it it gleamed like a hundred thousand carbuncles the tailor tied his handkerchief together by the four corners and carried it to the king who was full of joy and put a gold chain round the tailor's neck when the shoemaker saw that one stroke had failed he contrived a second and went to the king and said lord king the tailor has become insolent again he boasts that he will copy in wax the whole of the royal palace with everything that pertains to it loose or fast inside and out the king sent for the tailor and ordered him to copy in wax the whole of the royal palace with everything that pertained to it movable or immovable within and without and if he did not succeed in doing this 
for if so much as one nail on the wall were wanting, he should be imprisoned for his whole life underground. The tailor thought, it gets worse and worse. No one can endure that, and threw his bundle on his back and went forth. When he came to the hollow tree, he sat down and hung his head. The bees came flying out, and the queen bee asked him if he had a stiff neck, since he held his head so awry. Alas, no, said the tailor, something quite different weighs me down, and he told her what the king had demanded of him. The bees began to buzz and hum amongst themselves, and the queen bee said, Just go home again, but come back tomorrow at this time, and bring a large sheet with you, and then all will be well. So he turned back again, but the bees flew to the royal palace and straight into it through the open windows, crept round about into every corner, and inspected everything most carefully. Then they hurried back and modelled the palace in wax with such rapidity that anyone looking on would have thought it was growing before his eyes. By the evening all was ready, and when the tailor came next morning, the whole of the splendid building was there, and not one nail in the wall or tile of the roof was wanting, and it was delicate withal, and white as snow, and smelt sweet as honey. The tailor wrapped it carefully in his cloth and took it to the king, who could not admire it enough, placed it in his largest hall, and in return for it presented the tailor with a large stone house. The shoemaker, however, did not give up, but went for the third time to the king and said, Lord King, it has come to the tailor's ears that no water will spring up in the courtyard of the castle, and he has boasted that it shall rise up in the midst of the courtyard to a man's height and be clear as crystal. Then the king ordered the tailor to be brought before him and said, If a stream of water does not rise in my courtyard by tomorrow, as thou hast promised, the executioner shall in that very place make thee shorter by the head. The poor tailor did not take long to think about it, but hurried out to the gate, and because this time it was a matter of life and death to him, tears rolled down his face. Whilst he was thus going forth full of sorrow, the foal to which he had formerly given its liberty, and which had now become a beautiful chestnut horse, came leaping towards him. The time has come, it said to the tailor, when I can repay thee for thy good deed. I know already what is needful to thee but thou shalt soon have help. Get on me, my back can carry two such as thou. The tailor's courage came back to him. He jumped up in one bound, and the horse went full speed into the town, and right up to the courtyard of the castle. It galloped as quick as lightning thrice round it, and at the third time it fell violently down. At the same instant, however, there was a terrific clap of thunder, a fragment of the earth in the middle of the courtyard sprang like a cannonball into the air and over the castle, and directly after it a jet of water rose as high as a man on horseback, and the water was as pure as crystal, and the sunbeams began to dance on it. When the king saw that, he arose in amazement and went and embraced the tailor in sight of all men. But good fortune did not last long. The king had daughters in plenty still one prettier than the other, but he had no son. So the malicious shoemaker betook himself for the fourth time to the king, and said, Lord King, the tailor has not given up his arrogance. He has now boasted that if he liked, he could cause a son to be brought to the Lord King through the air. The king commanded the tailor to be summoned, and said, If thou causest a son to be brought to me within nine days, thou shalt have my eldest daughter to wife the reward is indeed great thought the little tailor one would willingly do something for it but the cherries grow too high for me if i climb for them the bough will break beneath me and i shall fall he went home seated himself cross-legged on his work table and thought over what was to be done it can't be managed he cried at last i will go away after all i can't live in peace here he tied up his bundle and hurried away to the gate. When he got to the meadow, he perceived his old friend the stork, who was walking backwards and forwards like a philosopher. Sometimes he stood still, took a frog into close consideration, and at length swallowed it down. The stork came to him and greeted him. I see, he began, that thou hast thy pack on thy back. Why art thou leaving the town? The tailor told him what the king had required of him, 
and how he could not perform it and lamented his misfortune don't let thy hair grow grey about that said the stork i will help thee out of thy difficulty for a long time now i have carried the children in swaddling clothes into the town so for once in a way i can fetch a little prince out of the well go home and be easy in nine days from this time repair to the royal palace and there i will come the little tailor went home and at the appointed time was at the castle it was not long before the stork came flying thither and tapped at the window the tailor opened it and cousin longlegs came carefully in and walked with solemn steps over the smooth marble pavement he had moreover a baby in his beak that was as lovely as an angel and stretched out its little hands to the queen the stork laid it in her lap and she caressed it and kissed it and was beside herself with delight before the stork flew away he took his travelling bag off his back and handed it over to the queen in it there were little paper parcels with coloured sweetmeats and they were divided amongst the little princesses the eldest however had none of them but got the merry tailor for a husband it seems to me said he just as if i had won the highest prize my mother was if right after all she always said that whoever trusts in god and only has good luck can never fail the shoemaker had to make the shoes in which the little tailor danced at the wedding festival after which he was commanded to quit the town for ever the road to the forest led him to the gallows worn out with anger rage and the heat of the day he threw himself down when he had closed his eyes and was about to sleep the two crows flew down from the heads of the men who were hanging there and pecked his eyes out in his madness he ran into the forest and must have died there of hunger for no one has ever either seen him again or heard of him end of story 107Story 108 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Hans the Hedgehog. There was once a countryman who had money and land in plenty. But how rich soever he was, one thing was still wanting in his happiness. He had no children. Often, when he went into the town with the other peasants, they mocked him and asked why he had no children. At last he became angry, and when he got home he said, I will have a child, even if it be a hedgehog. Then his wife had a child. That was a hedgehog in the upper part of his body, and a boy in the lower. And when she saw the child, she was terrified, and said, See, there thou hast brought ill luck on us. Then said the man, What can be done now? The boy must be christened, but we shall not be able to get a godfather for him. The woman said, And we cannot call him anything else but Hans the Hedgehog. When he was christened, the parson said, He cannot go into any ordinary bed because of his spikes. So a little straw was put behind the stove, and Hans the Hedgehog was laid on it. His mother could not suckle him, for he would have pricked her with his quills. So he lay there behind the stove for eight years, and his father was tired of him and thought, If he would but die... He did not die, however, but remained lying there. Now it happened that there was a fair in the town, and the peasant was about to go to it and asked his wife what he should bring back with him for her. A little meat and a couple of white rolls which are wanted for the house, said she. Then he asked the servant, and she wanted a pair of slippers and some stockings with clocks. At last he said also, And what wilt thou have? Hans, my hedgehog. Dear father, he said, do bring me bagpipes. When, therefore, the father came home again, he gave his wife what he had bought for her, meat and white rolls, and 
he gave the maid the slippers and the stockings with clocks, and lastly he went behind the stove and gave Hans the hedgehog the bagpipes. And when Hans the hedgehog had the bagpipes, he said, Dear father, do go to the forge and get the cock shod, and then I will ride away and never come back again. On this the father was delighted to think that he was going to get rid of him, and had the cock shod for him, and when it was done Hans the hedgehog got on it and rode away, but took swine and asses with him which he intended to keep in the forest. When they got there he made the cock fly on to a high tree with him, and there he sat for many a long year, and watched his asses and swine until the herd was quite large, and his father knew nothing about him. While he was sitting in the tree, however, he played his bagpipes, and made music which was very beautiful. Once a king came travelling by, who had lost his way and heard the music. He was astonished by it, and sent his servant forth to look all round and see from whence this music came. He spied about, but saw nothing but a little animal sitting up aloft on the tree, which looked like a cock with a hedgehog on it, which made this music. Then the king told the servant he was to ask why he sat there, and if he knew the road which led to his kingdom. So Hans the hedgehog descended from the tree, and said he would show the way, if the king would write a bond, and promise him whatever he first met in the royal courtyard as soon as he arrived at home. Then the king thought, I can easily do that. Hans the hedgehog understands nothing, and I can write what I like. So the king took pen and ink and wrote something, and when he had done it, Hans the hedgehog showed him the way, and he got safely home. But his daughter, when she saw him from afar, was so overjoyed that she ran to meet him and kissed him. Then he remembered Hans the hedgehog, and told her what had happened, and that he had been forced to promise whatsoever first met him when he got home to a very strange animal which sat on a cock as if it were a horse, and made beautiful music but that instead of writing that he should have what he wanted, he had written that he should not have it. Thereupon the princess was glad, and said he had done well, for she never would have gone away with the hedgehog. Hans the hedgehog, however, looked after his asses and pigs, and was always merry, and sat on the tree, and played his bagpipes. Now it came to pass that another king came journeying by with his servants and runners, and he had also lost his way, and did not know how to get home again because the forest was so large. He likewise heard the beautiful music from a distance, and asked his runner what that could be, and told him to go and see. Then the runner went under the tree, and saw the cock sitting at the top of it, and Hans the hedgehog on the cock. The runner asked him what he was about up there. I am keeping my asses and my pigs. But what is your desire? The messengers said that they had lost their way, and could not get back into their own kingdom, and asked if he would not show them the way. Then Hans the Hedgehog got down the tree with the cock, and told the aged king that he would show him the way, if he would give him for his own whatsoever first met him in front of his royal palace. The king said, Yes, and wrote a promise to Hans the Hedgehog that he should have this. That done, Hans rode on before him on the cock, and pointed out the way, and the king reached his kingdom again in safety. When he got to the courtyard, there were great rejoicings. Now he had an only daughter who was very beautiful. She ran to meet him, threw her arms around his neck, and was delighted to have her old father back again. She asked him where in the world he had been so long. So he told her how he had lost his way and had very nearly not come back at all, but that as he was travelling through a great forest, a creature, half hedgehog, half man, who was sitting astride a cock in a high tree, and making music, had shown him the way, and helped him to get out, but that in return he had promised him whatsoever first met him in the royal courtyard, and how that was she herself, which made him unhappy now. But on this she promised that, for love of her father, she would willingly go with this Hans, if he came. Hans the hedgehog, however, took care of his pigs, and the pigs multiplied until they became so many in number that the whole forest was filled with them. 
Then Hans the Hedgehog resolved not to live in the forest any longer, and sent word to his father to have every sty in the village emptied, for he was coming with such a great herd that all might kill who wished to do so. When his father heard that, he was troubled, for he thought Hans the Hedgehog had died long ago. Hans the Hedgehog, however, seated himself on the cock, and drove the pigs before him into the village, and ordered the slaughter to begin. Ha! But there was a killing and a chopping that might have been heard two miles off. After this Hans the Hedgehog said, Father, let me have the cock shod once more at the forge, and then I will ride away, and never come back as long as I live. Then the father had the cock shod once more, and was pleased that Hans the Hedgehog would never return again. Hans the Hedgehog rode away to the first kingdom. There the king had commanded that whatsoever came mounted on a cock and had bagpipes with him should be shot at, cut down, or stabbed by everyone, so that he might not enter the palace. When, therefore, Hans the Hedgehog came riding thither, they all pressed forward against him with their pikes, but he spurred the cock and it flew up over the gate in front of the king's window and lighted there, and Hans cried that the king must give him what he had promised, or he would take both his life and his daughter's. Then the king began to speak his daughter fair, and beg her to go away with Hans in order to save her own life and her father's. So she dressed herself in white, and her father gave her a carriage with six horses and magnificent attendants together with gold and possessions. She seated herself in the carriage, and placed Hans the Hedgehog beside her with the cock and the bagpipes. And then they took leave and drove away, and the king thought he should never see her again. He was, however, deceived in his expectation, for when they were at a short distance from the town, Hans the Hedgehog took her pretty clothes off and pierced her with his hedgehog skin until she bled all over. "'That is the reward of your falseness,' said he. "'Go your way, I will not have you.' and on that he chased her home again, and she was disgraced for the rest of her life. Hans the Hedgehog, however, rode on further on the cock with his bagpipes to the dominions of the second king to whom he had shown the way. This one, however, had arranged that if any one resembling Hans the Hedgehog should come, they were to present arms, give him safe conduct, cry long life to him and lead him to the royal palace. But when the king's daughter saw him, she was terrified for he looked quite so strange. She remembered, however, that she could not change her mind, for she had given her promise to her father. So Hans the Hedgehog was welcomed by her, and married to her, and had to go with her to the royal table, and she seated herself by his side, and they ate and drank. When the evening came and they wanted to go to sleep, she was afraid of his quills, but he told her she was not to fear, for no harm would befall her and he told the old king that he was to appoint four men to watch by the door of the chamber, and light a great fire, and when he entered the room and was about to get into bed, he would creep out of his hedgehog's skin and leave it lying there by the bedside, and that the men were to run nimbly to it, throw it on the fire, and stay by it until it was consumed. When the clock struck eleven, he went into the chamber, stripped off the hedgehog's skin, and left it lying by the bed. Then came the men and fetched it swiftly, and threw it in the fire, and when the fire had consumed it, he was delivered, and lay there in bed in human form, but he was coal-black, as if he had been burnt. The king sent for his physician, who washed him with precious salves, and anointed him, and he became white, and was a handsome young man. When the king's daughter saw that, she was glad, and the next morning they arose joyfully, ate and drank, and then the marriage was properly solemnized, and Hans the Hedgehog received the kingdom from the aged king. When several years had passed, he went with his wife to his father, and said that he was his son. The father, however, declared that he had no son, he had never had but one, and he had been born like a hedgehog with spikes, and had gone forth into the world. Then Hans made himself known, and the old father rejoiced, and went with him to his kingdom. My tale is done, and away it is run, to little August's house. End of story 108
Story 109 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Shroud. There was once a mother who had a little boy of seven years old who was so handsome and lovable that no one could look at him without liking him, and she herself worshipped him above everything in the world. Now it so happened that he suddenly became ill, and God took him to himself, and for this the mother could not be comforted, and wept both day and night. But soon afterwards, when the child had been buried, it appeared by night in the places where it had sat and played during its life, and if the mother wept, it wept also and when morning came, it disappeared. As, however, the mother would not stop crying, it came one night, in the little white shroud in which it had been laid in its coffin, and with its wreath of flowers round its head, and stood on the bed at her feet, and said, "'Oh, mother, do stop crying, or I shall never fall asleep in my coffin, for my shroud will not dry because of all thy tears which fall upon it.' The mother was afraid when she heard that, and wept no more. The next night the child came again, and held a little light in its hand, and said, Look, mother, my shroud is nearly dry, and I can rest in my grave. Then the mother gave her sorrow into God's keeping, and bore it quietly and patiently. And the child came no more, but slept in its little bed beneath the earth. End of story 109。story 110 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox org。household tales。by jacob and wilhelm grimm。translated by margaret hunt。THE JEW AMONG THORNS There was once a rich man who had a servant who served him diligently and honestly. He was every morning the first out of bed and the last to go to rest at night, and whenever there was a difficult job to be done, which nobody cared to undertake, he was always the first to set himself to it. Moreover, he never complained, but was contented with everything, and always merry. When a year was ended, his master gave him no wages, for he said to himself, That is the cleverest way, for I shall have saved something, and he will not go away, but stay quietly in my service. The servant said nothing, but did his work the second year, as he had done it in the first, and when at the end of this, likewise, he received no wages, he made himself happy, and still stayed on. When the third year also was passed, the master considered, put his hand in his pocket, but pulled nothing out. Then at last the servant said, Master, for three years I have served you honestly. Be so good as to give me what I ought to have, for I wish to leave and look about me a little more in the world. Yes, my good fellow, answered the old miser, you have served me industriously and therefore you shall be cheerfully rewarded. And he put his hand into his pocket, but counted out only three farthings, saying, There, you have a farthing for each year. That is a large and liberal pay, such as you would have received from few masters. The honest servant, who understood little about money, put his fortune into his pocket, and thought, Ah, now that I have my purse full, why need I trouble and plague myself any longer with hard work? So on he went, up hill and down dale, and sang and jumped to his heart's content. Now it came to pass that as he was going by a thicket, a little man stepped out and called to him, Whither away, merry brother? I see you do not carry many cares. Why should I be sad? answered the servant. I have enough. Three years' wages are jingling in my pocket. "'How much is your treasure?' the dwarf asked him. 
how much three farthings sterling all told look here said the dwarf i am a poor needy man give me your three farthings i can work no longer but you are young and can easily earn your bread and as the servant had a good heart he felt pity for the old man and gave him the three farthings saying take them in the name of heaven i shall not be any the worse for it then the little man said as i see you have a good heart i grant you three wishes one for each farthing they shall all be fulfilled aha said the servant you are one of those who can work wonders well then if it is to be so i wish first for a gun which shall hit everything that i aim at secondly for a fiddle which when i play on it shall compel all who hear it to dance thirdly that if i ask a favor of any one he shall not be able to refuse it all that you shall have said the dwarf and put his hand into the bush and only think there lay a fiddle and gun all ready just as if they had been ordered these he gave to the servant and then said to him whatever you may ask at any time no man in the world shall be able to deny you heart alive what can one desire more said the servant to himself and went merrily onwards soon afterwards he met a jew with a long goat's beard who was standing listening to the song of a bird which was sitting up at the top of a tree good heavens he was exclaiming that such a small creature should have such a fearfully loud voice if it were but mine if only some one would sprinkle some salt upon its tail if that is all said the servant the bird shall soon be down here and taking aim he pulled the trigger and down fell the bird into the thorn bushes go you rogue he said to the jew and fetch the bird out for yourself oh said the jew leave out the rogue my master and i will do it at once i will get the bird out for myself as you have really hit it then he lay down on the ground and began to crawl into the thicket when he was fast among the thorns the good servant's humor so tempted him that he took up his fiddle and began to play in a moment the jew's legs began to move and to jump into the air and the more the servant fiddled the better went the dance but the thorns tore his shabby coat from him combed his beard and pricked and plucked him all over the body oh dear cried the jew what do i want with your fiddling leave the fiddle alone master i do not want to dance but the servant did not listen to him and thought you have fleeced people often enough now the thorn bushes shall do the same to you and he began to play over again so that the jew had to jump higher than ever and scraps of his coat were left hanging on the thorns oh woe's me cried the jew i will give the gentleman whatsoever he asks if only he leaves off fiddling a purse full of gold if you are so liberal said the servant i will stop my music but this i must say to your credit that you dance to it so well that it is quite an art and having taken the purse he went his way the jew stood still and watched the servant quietly until he was far off and out of sight and then he screamed out with all his might you miserable musician you beer-house fiddler wait till i catch you alone i will hunt you till the soles of your shoes fall off you ragamuffin just put five farthings in your mouth and then you may be worth three halfpence and went on abusing him as fast as he could speak as soon as he had refreshed himself a little in this way and got his breath again he ran into the town to the justice my lord judge he said i have come to make a complaint see how a rascal has robbed and ill-treated me on the public highway a stone on the ground might pity me my clothes all torn my body pricked and scratched my little all gone with my purse good ducats each piece better than the last for god's sake let the man be thrown into prison was it a soldier said the judge who cut you thus with his sabre nothing of the sort said the jew it was no sword that he had but a gun hanging at his back and a fiddle at his neck 
the wretch may easily be known. So the judge sent his people out after the man, and they found the good servant, who had been going quite slowly along, and they found too the purse with the money upon him. As soon as he was taken before the judge, he said, I did not touch the Jew, nor take his money. He gave it to me of his own free will, that I might leave off fiddling, because he could not bear my music. Heaven defend us, cried the Jew. His lies are as thick as flies upon the wall. But the judge also did not believe his tale, and said, This is a bad defense. No Jew would do that. And because he had committed robbery on the public highway, he sentenced the good servant to be hanged. As he was being led away, the Jew again screamed after him, You vagabond! You dog of a fiddler! Now you're going to receive your well-earned reward. The servant walked quietly with the hangman up the ladder, but upon the last step he turned round and said to the judge, Grant me one request before I die. Yes, if you do not ask for your life, said the judge. I do not ask for my life, answered the servant, but as a last favor let me play once more upon my fiddle. The Jew raised a great cry of murder, murder, for goodness sake, do not allow it, do not allow it. But the judge said, why should I not let him have this short pleasure? It has been granted to him, and he shall have it. However, he could not have refused, on the account of the gift which had been bestowed on the servant. Then the Jew cried, Oh, woe is me, tie me, tie me fast, while the good servant took his fiddle from his neck and made ready. As he gave the first scrape, they all began to quiver and shake. The judge, his clerk, and the hangman, and his men, and the cord fell out of the hand of the one who was going to tie the Jew fast. At the second scrape, all raised their legs, and the hangman let go his hold of the good servant, and made himself ready to dance. At the third scrape, they all leaped up, and began to dance, the judge and the Jew being the best at jumping. Soon, all who had gathered into the marketplace out of curiosity, were dancing with them, young and old, fat and lean, one with the other. The dogs likewise, which had run there, got up on their hind legs and capered about, and the longer he played, the higher sprang the dancers, so that they knocked against each other's heads and began to shriek terribly. At length the judge cried, quite out of breath, I will give you your life if you will only stop fiddling. The good servant thereupon had compassion, took his fiddle and hung it round his neck again, and stepped down the ladder. Then he went up to the Jew who was lying upon the ground, panting for breath, and said, You rascal, now confess, whence you got the money, or I will take my fiddle and begin to play again. I stole it, I stole it, cried he, but you have honestly earned it. So the judge had the Jew taken to the gallows and hanged as a thief. End of story 110《Story 111 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee.《Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Skillful Huntsman There once was a young fellow who had learnt the trade of locksmith and told his father he would now go out into the world and seek his fortune. Very well, said the father. I am quite content with that, and gave him some money for his journey. So he traveled about and looked for work. After a time, he resolved not to follow the trade of locksmith any more, for he no longer liked it, but he took a fancy for hunting. Then there met him in his rambles a huntsman dressed in green, who asked whence he came and whither he was going. The youth said he was a locksmith's apprentice, but that the trade no longer pleased him, and he had a liking for huntsmanship. Would he teach it to him? Oh, yes, said the huntsman, if thou wilt go with me. Then the young fellow went with him, bound himself to him for some years, and learnt the art of hunting. After this he wished to try his luck elsewhere, and the huntsman gave him nothing in the way of payment 
but an air gun, which had, however, this property, that it hit its mark without fail whenever he shot with it. Then he set out and found himself in a very large forest, which he could not get to the end of in one day. When evening came, he seated himself in a high tree in order to escape from the wild beasts. Towards midnight, it seemed to him as if a tiny little light glimmered in the distance. Then he looked down through the branches towards it and kept well in his mind where it was. But in the first place, he took off his hat and threw it down in the direction of the light so that he might go to the hat as a mark when he had descended. Then he got down and went to his hat, put it on again, and went straight forwards. The farther he went, the larger the light grew, and when he got close to it he saw that it was an enormous fire, and that three giants were sitting by it, who had an ox on the spit, and were roasting it. Presently one of them said, I must just taste if the meat will soon be fit to eat, and pulled a piece off and was about to put it in his mouth when the huntsman shot it out of his hand. Well, really, said the giant, if the wind has not blown the bit out of my hand, and helped himself to another. But when he was just about to bite into it, the huntsman again shot it away from him. On this the giant gave the one who was sitting next to him a box on the ear and cried angrily, Why art thou snatching my piece away from me? I have not snatched it away, said the other. A sharpshooter must have shot it away from thee. The giant took another piece, and could not, however, keep it in his hand, for the huntsman shot it out. Then the giant said, That must be a good shot, to shoot the bit out of one's very mouth. Such an one would be useful to us. And he cried aloud, Come here, thou sharpshooter, seat thyself at the fire beside us, and eat thy fill. We will not hurt thee. But if thou wilt not come, and we have to bring thee by force, thou art a lost man. On this the youth went up to them and told them he was a skilled huntsman, and that whatever he aimed at with his gun, he was certain to hit it. Then they said, if he would go with them, he should be well treated. And they told him that outside the forest there was a great lake, behind which stood a tower, and in the tower was imprisoned a lovely princess, whom they wished very much to carry off. Yes, said he, I will soon get her for you. Then they added, But there is still something else. There is a tiny little dog, which begins to bark directly any one goes near, and as soon as it barks, every one in the royal palace wakens up, and for this reason we cannot get there. Canst thou undertake to shoot it dead? Yes, said he, that will be a little bit of fun for me. After this he got into a boat and rowed over the lake, and as soon as he landed, the little dog came running out and was about to bark. But the huntsman took his air gun and shot it dead. When the giants saw that, they rejoiced, and thought they already had the king's daughter safe. But the huntsman wished first to see how matters stood, and told them that they must stay outside until he called them. Then he went into the castle, and all was perfectly quiet within, and every one was asleep. When he opened the door of the first room, a sword was hanging on the wall, which was made of pure silver, and there was a golden star on it, and the name of the king, and on the table near it lay a sealed letter which he broke open, and inside it was written that whosoever had the sword could kill everything which opposed him. So he took the sword from the wall, hung it at his side, and went onwards. Then he entered the room where the king's daughter was lying sleeping, and she was so beautiful that he stood still and, holding his breath, looked at her. He thought to himself, How can I give an innocent maiden into the power of the wild giants, who have evil in their minds? He looked about further, and under the bed stood a pair of slippers, on the right one was her father's name with a star, and on the left her own name with a star. She wore also a great neckerchief of silk embroidered with gold, and on the right side was her father's name, and on the left her own, all in gold letters. Then the huntsman took a pair of scissors and cut the right corner off and put it in his knapsack, and then he also took the right slipper 
with the king's name and thrust that in. Now the maiden still lay sleeping, and she was quite sewn into her nightdress, and he cut a morsel from this also, and thrust it in with the rest. But he did all without touching her. Then he went forth and left her lying asleep undisturbed, and when he came to the gate again, the giants were still standing outside waiting for him, and expecting that he was bringing the princess. But he cried to them, that they were to come in, for the maiden was already in their power, that he could not open the gate to them, but there was a hole through which they must creep. Then the first approached, and the huntsman wound the giant's hair round his hand, pulled the head in, and cut it off at one stroke with his sword, and then drew the rest of him in. He called to the second, and cut his head off likewise, and then he killed the third also and he was well pleased that he had freed the beautiful maiden from her enemies, and he cut out their tongues and put them in his knapsack. Then thought he, I will go home to my father and let him see what I have already done, and afterwards I will travel about the world. The luck which God is pleased to grant me will easily find me. But when the king in the castle awoke, he saw the three giants lying there dead, so he went into the sleeping room of his daughter, awoke her, and asked who could have killed the giants. Then said she, Dear father, I know not, I have been asleep. But when she arose and would have put on her slippers, the right one was gone, and when she looked at her neckerchief, it was cut, and the right corner was missing, and when she looked at her night dress, a piece was cut out of it. The king summoned the whole court together, soldiers and every one else who was there, and asked who had set his daughter at liberty and killed the giants. Now it happened that he had a captain who was one-eyed and a hideous man, and he said that he had done it. Then the old king said that as he had accomplished this, he should marry his daughter. But the maiden said, Rather than marry him, dear father, I will go away into the world, as far as my legs can carry me. But the king said that if she would not marry him, she should take off her royal garments and wear a peasant's clothing, and go forth, and that she should go to a potter and begin a trade of earthen vessels. So she put off her royal apparel and went to a potter and borrowed crockery enough for a stall, and she promised him also that if she had sold it by the evening, she would pay for it. Then the king said she was to seat herself in a corner with it and sell it, and he arranged with some peasants to drive over with their carts, so that everything should be broken into a thousand pieces. When therefore the king's daughter had placed her stall in the street, by came the carts, and broke all she had into tiny fragments. She began to weep and said, Alas! How shall I ever pay for the pots now? The king had, however, wished by this to force her to marry the captain. But instead of that, she went again to the potter and asked him if he would lend her once more. He said no. She must first pay for the things she had already had. Then she went to her father and cried and lamented and said she would go forth into the world. Then said he, I will have a little hut built for thee in the forest outside and in it thou shalt stay all thy life long, and cook for every one, but thou shalt take no money for it. When the hut was ready, a sign was hung on the door, whereon was written, Today given, tomorrow sold. There she remained a long time, and it was rumored about the world that a maiden was there who cooked without asking for payment, and that this was set forth on a sign outside her door. The huntsman heard it likewise, and thought to himself, That would suit thee. Thou art poor, thou hast no money. So he took his air-gun and his knapsack, wherein all the things which he had formerly carried away with him from the castle as tokens of his truthfulness were still lying, and went into the forest and found the hut with the sign, Today given, tomorrow sold. He had put on the sword with which he had cut off the heads of the three giants, and thus entered the hut and ordered something to eat to be given to him. He was charmed with the beautiful maiden, who was indeed as lovely as any picture. 
She asked him whence he came, and whither he was going, and he said, I am roaming about the world. Then she asked him where he had got the sword, for that truly her father's name was on it. He asked her if she were the king's daughter. Yes, answered she. With this sword, said he, did I cut off the heads of the three giants, and he took their tongues out of his knapsack in proof. Then he also showed her the slipper, and the corner of the neckerchief, and the bit of the night dress, whereon she was overjoyed, and said that he was the one who had delivered her. On this they went together to the old king, and fetched him to the hut. She led him into her room, and told him that the huntsman was the man who had really set her free from the giants. And when the aged king saw all the proofs of this, he could no longer doubt, and said that he was very glad he knew how everything had happened, and that the huntsman should have her to wife, on which the maiden was glad at heart. Then she dressed the huntsman as if he were a foreign lord, and the king ordered a feast to be prepared. When they went to table, the captain sat on the left side of the king's daughter, but the huntsman was on the right, and the captain thought he was a foreign lord who had come to visit. When they had eaten and drunk, the old king said to the captain that he would set before him something which he must guess. Supposing anyone said that he had killed the three giants and were asked where the giant's tongues were, and he were forced to go out and look, and there were none in their heads. How could that happen? The captain said. Then they cannot have had any. Not so, said the king. Every animal has a tongue. And then he likewise asked what any one would deserve who made such an answer. The captain replied, He ought to be torn in pieces. Then the king said he had pronounced his own sentence, and the captain was put in prison and then torn in four pieces. But the king's daughter was married to the huntsman, and after this he brought his father and mother, and they lived with their son in happiness. And after the death of the old king, he received the kingdom. End of story 111Story 112 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Flail from Heaven A countryman was once going out to plow with a pair of oxen. When he got to the field, both the animal's horns began to grow, and went on growing, and when he wanted to go home, they were so big that the oxen could not get through the gateway for them. By good luck, a butcher came by just then, and he delivered them over to him, and made the bargain in this way, that he should take the butcher a measure of turnip seed, and then the butcher was to count him out a Brabant thaler for every seed. I call that well sold. The peasant now went home, and carried the measure of turnip seed to him on his back. On the way, however, he lost one seed out of the bag. The butcher paid him justly as agreed on, and if the peasant had not lost the seed, he would have had one thaler the more. In the meantime, when he went on his way back, the seed had grown into a tree which reached up to the sky. Then thought the peasant, As thou hast the chance, thou must just see what the angels are doing up there above, and for once have them before thine eyes. So he climbed up, and saw that the angels above were threshing oats. And he looked on. While he was thus watching them, he observed that the tree on which he was standing was beginning to totter. He peeped down, and saw that someone was just going to cut it down. If I were to fall down from hence, it would be a bad thing, thought he. And, in his necessity, he did not know how to save himself better 
than by taking the chaff of the oats, which lay there in heaps, and twisting a rope of it. He likewise snatched a hoe and a flail, which were lying about in heaven, and let himself down by the rope. But he came down on the earth exactly in the middle of a deep, deep hole. So it was a real piece of luck that he had brought the hoe, for he hoed himself a flight of steps with it, and mounted up, and took the flail with him, as a token of his truth, so that no one could have any doubt of his story. End of Story 112「the two king's children there was once on a time a king who had a little boy of whom it had been foretold that he should be killed by a stag when he was sixteen years of age and when he had reached that age the huntsmen once went hunting with him in the forest the king's son was separated from the others and all at once he saw a great stag which he wanted to shoot but could not hit at length he chased the stag so far that they were quite out of the forest and then suddenly a great tall man was standing there instead of the stag and said it is well that i have thee i have already ruined six pairs of glass gates with running after thee and have not been able to get thee then he took the king's son with him and dragged him through a great lake to a great palace and then he had to sit down to table with him and eat something when they had eaten something together the king said i have three daughters thou must keep watch over the eldest for one night from nine in the evening till six in the morning and every time the clock strikes i will come myself and call and if thou then givest me no answer to-morrow morning thou shalt be put to death but if thou always givest me an answer thou shalt have her to wife when the young folks went to the bedroom there stood a stone image of saint christopher and the king's daughter said to it my father will come at nine o'clock and every hour till it strikes three when he calls give him an answer instead of the king's son then the stone image of saint christopher nodded its head quite quickly and then more and more slowly until at last it stood still the next morning the king said to him thou hast done the business well but i cannot give my daughter away thou must now watch a night by my second daughter and then i will consider with myself whether thou canst have my eldest daughter to wife but i shall come every hour myself and when i call thee answer me and if i call thee and thou dost not reply thy blood shall flow then they both went into the sleeping room and there stood a still larger stone image of saint christopher and the king's daughter said to it if my father calls do you answer him then the great stone image of saint christopher again nodded its head quite quickly and then more and more slowly until at last it stood still again and the king's son lay down on the threshold put his hand under his head and slept the next morning the king said to him thou hast done the business really well but i cannot give my daughter away thou must now watch a night by the youngest princess and then i will consider with myself whether thou canst have my second daughter to wife but i shall come every hour myself and when i call thee answer me and if i call thee and thou answerest not thy blood shall flow for me then they once more went to the sleeping room together and there was a much greater and much taller image of saint christopher than the two first had been the king's daughter said to it when my father calls do thou answer then the great tall stone image of saint christopher nodded quite half an hour with its head 
until at length the head stood still again. And the king's son laid himself down on the threshold of the door and slept. The next morning the king said, Thou hast indeed watched well, but I cannot give thee my daughter now. I have a great forest. If thou cuttest it down for me between six o'clock this morning and six at night, I will think about it. Then he gave him a glass axe, a glass wedge, and a glass mallet. When he got into the wood, he began at once to cut, but the axe broke in two. Then he took the wedge and struck it once with the mallet, and it became as short and as small as sand. Then he was much troubled and believed he would have to die, and sat down and wept. Now when it was noon, the king said, One of you girls must take him something to eat. No, said the two eldest, we will not take it to him. The one by whom he last watched can take him something. Then the youngest was forced to go and take him something to eat. When she got into the forest, she asked him how he was getting on. Oh, said he, I am getting on very badly. Then she said he was to come and just eat a little. Nay, said he, I cannot do that. I shall still have to die, so I will eat no more. Then she spoke so kindly to him and begged him just to try that he came and ate something. When he had eaten something, she said, I will comb thy hair a while, and then thou wilt feel happier. So she combed his hair, and he became weary and fell asleep. And then she took her handkerchief and made a knot in it, and struck it three times on the earth, and said, Earth workers, come forth! In a moment, numbers of little earthmen came forth and asked what the king's daughter commanded. Then said she, In three hours' time the great forest must be cut down, and the whole of the wood laid in heaps. So the little earthmen went about and got together the whole of their kindred to help them with the work. They began at once, and when the three hours were over, all was done, and they came back to the king's daughter and told her so. Then she took her white handkerchief again and said, Earth workers, go home. On this they all disappeared. When the king's son awoke, he was delighted, and she said, Come home when it has struck six o'clock. He did as she told him, and then the king asked, Hast thou made away with the forest? Yes, said the king's son. When they were sitting at table, the king said, I cannot yet give thee my daughter to wife. Thou must still do something more for her sake. So he asked, What was it to be then? I have a great fish pond, said the king. Thou must go to it tomorrow morning, and clear it of all mud, until it is as bright as a mirror, and fill it with every kind of fish. The next morning the king gave him a glass shovel and said, The fish pond must be done by six o'clock. So he went away, and when he came to the fish pond, he stuck his shovel in the mud and broke it in two. Then he stuck his hoe in the mud and broke it also. Then he was much troubled. At noon the youngest daughter brought him something to eat and asked him how he was getting on. So the king's son said everything was going very ill with him, and he would certainly have to lose his head. My tools have broken to pieces again. Oh, said she. Thou must just come and eat something, and then thou wilt be in another frame of mind. No, said he, I cannot eat. I am far too unhappy for that. Then she gave him many good words, until at last he came and ate something. Then she combed his hair again, and he fell asleep, so once more she took her handkerchief, tied a knot in it, and struck the ground thrice with the knot, and said, Earth workers, come forth! In a moment a great many little earthmen came, and asked what she desired, and she told them that in three hours' time they must have the fish pond entirely cleaned out, and it must be so clear that people could see themselves reflected in it, and every kind of fish must be in it. The little earthmen went away and summoned all their kindred to help them, and in two hours it was done. Then they returned to her and said, we have done as thou hast commanded. The king's daughter took the handkerchief, and once more struck thrice on the ground with it, and said, Earth workers, go home again. Then they all went away. When the king's son awoke, the fish pond was done. 
Then the king's daughter went away also, and told him that when it was six, he was to come to the house. When he arrived at the house, the king asked, Hast thou got the fish pond done? Yes, said the king's son. That was very good. When they were again sitting at table, the king said, Thou hast certainly done the fish pond, but I cannot give thee my daughter yet. Thou must just do one thing more. What is that, then? asked the king's son. The king said he had a great mountain, on which there was nothing but briars, which must all be cut down, and at the top of it the youth must build up a great castle, which must be as strong as could be conceived, and all the furniture and fittings belonging to a castle must be inside it. And when he arose the next morning, the king gave him a glass axe and a glass gimlet with him, and he was to have all done by six o'clock. As he was cutting down the first briar with the axe, it broke off short, and so small that the pieces flew all round about, and he could not use the gimlet either. Then he was quite miserable, and waited for his dearest to see if she would not come and help him in his need. When it was midday, she came and brought him something to eat. He went to meet her, and told her all, and ate something, and let her comb his hair, and fell asleep. Then she once more took the knot, and struck the earth with it, and said, Earth workers, come forth. Then came once again numbers of earthmen, and asked what her desire was. Then said she, In the space of three hours, they must cut down the whole of the briars, and a castle must be built on top of the mountain that must be as strong as any one could conceive, and all the furniture that pertains to a castle must be inside it. They went away and summoned their kindred to help them, and when the time was come, all was ready. Then they came to the king's daughter and told her so, and the king's daughter took her handkerchief and struck thrice on the earth with it and said, Earth workers, go home, on which they all disappeared. When, therefore, the king's son awoke and saw everything done, he was as happy as a bird in the air. When it had struck six, they went home together. Then, said the king, is the castle ready? Yes, said the king's son. When they sat down to table, the king said, I cannot give away my youngest daughter until the two eldest are married. Then the king's son and the king's daughter were quite troubled, and the king's son had no idea what to do. But he went by night to the king's daughter and ran away with her. When they had got a little distance away, the king's daughter peeped round and saw her father behind her. Oh, said she, what are we to do? My father is behind us and will take us back with him. I will at once change thee into a briar and myself into a rose, and I will shelter myself in the midst of the bush. When the father reached the place, there stood a briar with one rose on it. Then he was about to gather the rose when the thorn came and pricked his finger so that he was forced to go home again. His wife asked why he had not brought their daughter back with him. So he said he had nearly got up to her, but that all at once he had lost sight of her, and a briar with one rose was growing on the spot. Then said the queen, If thou hadst but gathered the rose, the briar would have been forced to come too. So he went back again to fetch the rose. But in the meantime the two were already far over the plain, and the king ran after them. Then the daughter once more looked round and saw her father coming and said, Oh, what shall we do now? I will instantly change thee into a church, and myself into a priest, and I will stand up in the pulpit and preach. When the king got to the place, there stood a church, and in the pulpit was a priest preaching. So he listened to the sermon, and then went home again. Then the queen asked why he had not brought their daughter with him, and he said, Nay, I ran a long time after her, and just as I thought I should soon overtake her, a church was standing there, and a priest was in the pulpit preaching. Thou shouldst just have brought the priest, said his wife, and then the church would soon have come. It is no use to send thee, I must go there myself. When she had walked for some time and could see the two in the distance, the king's daughter peeped round and saw her mother coming and said, Now we are undone for my mother is coming herself, 
I will immediately change thee into a fish pond and myself into a fish. When the mother came to the place, there was a large fish pond, and in the midst of it a fish was leaping about and peeping out of the water, and it was quite merry. She wanted to catch the fish, but she could not. Then she was very angry and drank up the whole pond in order to catch the fish, but it made her so ill that she was forced to vomit and vomited the whole pond out again. Then she cried, I see very well that nothing can be done now, and said that now they might come back to her. Then the king's daughter went back again, and the queen gave her daughter three walnuts and said, with these thou canst help thyself when thou art in thy greatest need. So the young folks went once more away together, and when they had walked quite ten miles, they arrived at the castle from whence the king's son came, and close by it was a village. When they reached it, the king's son said, Stay here, my dearest. I will just go to the castle, and then I will come with a carriage and with attendants to fetch thee. When he got to the castle, they all rejoiced greatly at having the king's son back again, and he told them he had a bride who was now in the village, and they must go with the carriage to fetch her. Then they harnessed the horses at once, and many attendants seated themselves outside the carriage. When the king's son was about to get in, his mother gave him a kiss, and he forgot everything which had happened, and also what he was about to do. On this his mother ordered the horses to be taken out of the carriage again, and every one went back into the house. But the maiden sat in the village and watched and watched and thought he would come and fetch her, but no one came. Then the king's daughter took service in the mill which belonged to the castle, and was obliged to sit by the pond every afternoon and clean the tubs. And the queen came one day on foot from the castle and went walking by the pond, and saw the well-grown maiden sitting there, and said, What a fine, strong girl that is! She pleases me well. Then she and all with her looked at the maid, but no one knew her. So a long time passed by, during which the maiden served the miller honorably and faithfully. In the meantime the queen had sought a wife for her son, who came from quite a distant part of the world. When the bride came, they were at once to be married, and many people hurried together, all of whom wanted to see everything. Then the girl said to the miller that he might be so good as to give her leave to go also. So the miller said, Yes, do go there. When she was about to go, she opened one of the three walnuts, and a beautiful dress lay inside it. She put it on and went into the church and stood by the altar. Suddenly came the bride and the bridegroom and seated themselves before the altar. And when the priest was just going to bless them, the bride peeped half round and saw the maiden standing there. Then she stood up again and said she would not be given away until she also had as beautiful a dress as that lady there. So they went back to the house again and sent to ask the lady if she would sell that dress. No, she would not sell it, but the bride might perhaps earn it. Then the bride asked her how she was to do this. Then the maiden said if she might sleep one night outside the king's son's door, the bride might have what she wanted. So the bride said, yes, she was willing to do that. But the servants were ordered to give the king's son a sleeping drink. And then the maiden laid herself down in the threshold and lamented all night long. She had had the forest cut down for him. She had had the fish pond cleaned out for him. She had had the castle built for him. She had changed him into a briar, and then into a church, and at last into a fish pond, and yet he had forgotten her so quickly. The king's son did not hear one word of it, but the servants had been awakened, and had listened to it, and had not known what it could mean. The next morning, when they were all up, the bride put on the dress, and went away to the church with the bridegroom. In the meantime, the maiden opened the second walnut, and a still more beautiful dress was inside it. She put it on, and went and stood by the altar in the church, and everything happened as it had happened the time before. And the maiden again lay all night on the threshold, which led to the chamber of the king's son, and the servant was once more to give him a sleeping drink. The servant, however, went to him and gave him something to keep him awake. 
And then the king's son went to bed, and the miller's maiden bemoaned herself as before on the threshold of the door, and told of all that she had done. All this the king's son heard, and was sore troubled, and what was past came back to him. Then he wanted to go to her, but his mother had locked the door. The next morning, however, he went at once to his beloved, and told her everything which had happened to him, and prayed her not to be angry with him for having forgotten her. Then the king's daughter opened the third walnut, and within it was a still more magnificent dress, which she put on and went with her bridegroom to church, and numbers of children came who gave them flowers and offered them gay ribbons to bind about their feet, and they were blessed by the priest, and had a merry wedding. But the false mother and the bride had to depart, and the mouth of the person who last told all this is still warm. End of story 113「There was once on a time a princess who was extremely proud. If a wooer came, she gave him some riddle to guess, and if he could not find it out, he was sent contemptuously away. She let it be made known also that whosoever solved her riddle should marry her, let him be who he might. At length, therefore, three tailors fell in with each other the two eldest of whom thought they had done so many dexterous bits of work successfully that they could not fail to succeed in this also. The third was a little useless landloper, who did not even know his trade, but thought he must have some luck in this venture, for where else was it to come from? Then the two others said to him, Just stay at home, thou canst not do much with thy little bit of understanding. The little tailor, however, did not let himself be discouraged, and said he had set his head to work about this for once, and he would manage well enough, and he went forth, as if the whole world were his. They all three announced themselves to the princess, and said she was to propound her riddle to them, and that the right persons were now come, who had understanding so fine that they could be threaded in a needle. Then said the princess, I have two kinds of hair on my head. Of what color is it? If that be all, said the first, it must be black and white, like the cloth which is called pepper and salt. The princess said, Wrongly guessed, let the second answer. Then said the second, If it be not black and white, then it is brown and red like my father's company coat. Wrongly guessed, said the princess. Let the third give the answer, for I see very well he knows it for certain. Then the little tailor stepped boldly forth and said, The princess has a silver and a golden hair on her head, and those are the two different colors. When the princess heard that, she turned pale and nearly fell down with terror for the little tailor had guessed her riddle, and she had firmly believed that no man on earth could discover it. When her courage returned, she said, Thou hast not won me yet by that. There is still something else that thou must do. Below in the stable is a bear, with which thou shalt pass the night, and when I get up in the morning, if thou art still alive, thou shalt marry me. She expected, however, she should thus get rid of the tailor, for the bear had never yet left any one alive who had fallen into his clutches. The little tailor did not let himself be frightened away, but was quite delighted and said, Boldly ventured is half one. When therefore the evening came, our little tailor was taken down to the bear. 
the bear was about to set at the little fellow at once and give him a hearty welcome with his paws softly softly said the little tailor i will soon make thee quiet then quite composedly and as if he had not an anxiety in the world he took some nuts out of his pocket cracked them and ate the kernels when the bear saw that he was seized with the desire to have some nuts too the tailor felt in his pockets and reached him a handful they were however not nuts but pebbles the bear put them in his mouth but could get nothing out of them let him bite as he would uh, thought he what a stupid blockhead i am i cannot even crack a nut and then he said to the tailor here crack me the nuts there see what a stupid fellow thou art said the little tailor to have such a great mouth and not be able to crack a small nut then he took the pebble and nimbly put a nut in his mouth the place of it and crack it was in two i must try the thing again said the bear when i watch you i then think i ought to be able to do it too so the tailor once more gave him a pebble and the bear tried and tried to bite into it with all the strength of his body but no one will imagine that he accomplished it when that was over the tailor took out a violin from beneath his coat and played a piece of it to himself when the bear heard the music he could not help beginning to dance and when he had danced a while the thing pleased him so well that he said to the little tailor hark you is the fiddle heavy light enough for a child look with the left hand i lay my fingers on it and with the right i stroke it with the bow and then it goes merrily hop sa sa viva la lera so said the bear fiddling is a thing i should like to understand too that i might dance whenever i had a fancy what does thou think of that wilt thou give me lessons with all my heart said the tailor if thou hast a talent for it but just let me see thy claws they are terribly long i must cut thy nails a little then a vise was brought and the bear put his claws in it and the little tailor screwed it tight and said now wait until i come with the scissors and he let the bear growl as he liked and lay down in the corner on a bundle of straw and fell asleep when the princess heard the bear growling so fiercely during the night she believed nothing else but that he was growling for joy and had made an end of the tailor in the morning she arose careless and happy but when she peeped into the stable the tailor stood gaily before her and was as healthy as a fish in water now she could not say another word against the wedding because she had given a promise before everyone and the king ordered a carriage to be brought in which she was to drive to church with the tailor and there she was to be married when they had got into the carriage the two other tailors who had false hearts and envied him his good fortune went into the stable and unscrewed the bear again the bear in great fury ran after the carriage the princess heard him snorting and growling she was terrified and she cried how oh, the bear is behind us and wants to get thee the tailor was quick and stood on his head stuck his legs out of the window and cried dost thou see the vise if thou dost not be off thou shalt be put into it again when the bear saw that he turned round and ran away the tailor drove quietly to church and the princess was married to him at once and he lived with her as happy as a woodlark whosoever does not believe this must pay a tailor end of story 114「Story 115 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt. The Bright Sun Brings It to Light A tailor's apprentice was traveling about the world in search of work, and at one time he could find none, and his poverty was so great that he had not a farthing to live on. Presently he met a Jew on the road, and he thought he would have a great deal of money about him. The tailor thrust God out of his heart, fell on the Jew, and said, Give me thy money, or I will strike thee dead. Then said the Jew, Grant me my life, I have no money but eight farthings. But the tailor said, Money thou hast, and it shall be produced, and used violence, and beat him until he was near death. And when the Jew was dying, the last words he said were, The bright sun will bring it to light. And thereupon he died. The tailor's apprentice felt in his pockets and sought for money, but he found nothing but eight farthings, as the Jew had said. Then he took him up and carried him behind a clump of trees and went onwards to seek work. After he had traveled about a long while, he got work in a town with a master who had a pretty daughter with whom he fell in love, and he married her, and lived in good and happy wedlock. After a long time, when he and his wife had two children, the wife's father and mother died, and the young people kept house alone. One morning, when the husband was sitting on the table before the window, his wife brought him his coffee, and when he had poured it out into the saucer and was just going to drink, the sun shone on it, and the reflection gleamed hither and thither on the wall above and made circles on it. Then the tailor looked up and said, Yes, it would like very much to bring it to light, and cannot. The woman said, Oh, dear husband, and what is that, then? What dost thou mean by that? He answered, I must not tell thee. But she said, If thou lovest me, thou must tell me and used her most affectionate words, and said that no one should ever know it, and left him no rest. Then he told her how years ago, when he was traveling about seeking work, and quite worn out and penniless, he had killed a Jew, and that in the last agonies of death the Jew had spoken the words, The bright sun will bring it to light. And now the sun had just wanted to bring it to light, and had gleamed and made circles on the wall, but had not been able to do it. After this he again charged her particularly never to tell this, or he would lose his life, and she did promise. When, however, he had sat down to work again, she went to her great friend and confided the story to her. But she was never to repeat it to any human being, but before two days were over the whole town knew it and the tailor was brought to trial and condemned. And thus, after all, the bright sun did bring it to light. End of story 115。Story 116 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Blue Light. There was once, on a time, a soldier, who for many years had served the king faithfully. But when the war came to an end, could serve no longer because of the many wounds which he had received. The king said to him, Thou mayest return to thy home. I need thee no longer, and thou wilt not receive any more money, for he only receives wages, who renders me service for them. Then the soldier did not know how to earn a living, went away greatly troubled, and walked the whole day, until in the evening he entered a forest. When darkness came on, he saw a light, which he went up to and came to a house wherein lived a witch. Do give me one night's lodging and a little eat and drink, said he to her, or I shall starve. Oh, she answered, who gives anything to a runaway soldier? Yet will I be compassionate and take you in, 
if you will do what I wish. What do you wish, said the soldier, that you should dig all round my garden for me tomorrow? The soldier consented, and next day labored with all his strength, but could not finish it by the evening. I see well enough, said the witch, that you can do no more today, but I will keep you yet another night, in payment for which you must tomorrow chop me a load of wood and make it small. The soldier spent the whole day in doing it, and in the evening the witch proposed that he should stay one night more. Tomorrow you shall only do me a very trifling piece of work. Behind my house there is an old dry well, into which my light has fallen. It burns blue, and never goes out, and you shall bring it up again for me. Next day the old woman took him to the well, and let him down in a basket. He found the blue light, and made her a signal to draw him up again. She did draw him up, but when he came near the edge, she stretched down her hand, and wanted to take the blue light away from him. No, said he, perceiving her evil intention, I will not give thee the light until I am standing with both feet upon the ground. The witch fell into a passion, let him down again into the well, and went away. The poor soldier fell without injury on the moist ground, and the blue light went on burning. But of what use was that to him? He saw very well that he could not escape death. He sat for a while very sorrowfully. Then suddenly he fell in his pocket and found his tobacco pipe, which was still half full. This shall be my last pleasure, thought he, pulled it out, lit it at the blue light, and began to smoke. When the smoke had circled about the cavern, suddenly a little black dwarf stood before him and said, Lord, what are thy commands? What commands have I to give thee? replied the soldier, quite astonished. I must do everything thou biddest me, said the little man. Good, said the soldier. Then in the first place, help me out of this well. The little man took him by the hand and led him through an underground passage, but he did not forget to take the blue light with him. On the way, the dwarf showed him the treasures which the witch had collected and hidden there, and the soldier took as much gold as he could carry. When he was above, he said to the little man, Now, go and bind the old witch, and carry her before the judge. In a short time, she, with frightful cries, came riding by as swift as the wind on a wild tomcat. Nor was it long after that before the little man reappeared. It is all done, said he, and the witch is already hanging on the gallows. What further commands has my lord? inquired the dwarf. At this moment none, answered the soldier. Thou canst return home, only be at hand immediately if I summon thee. Nothing more is needed than that thou shouldest light thy pipe at the blue light, and I will appear before thee at once. Thereupon he vanished from his sight. The soldier returned to the town from which he had come. He went to the best inn, ordered himself handsome clothes, and then bade the landlord furnish him a room as handsomely as possible. When it was ready and the soldier had taken possession of it, he summoned the little black mannikin and said, I have served the king faithfully, but he has dismissed me and left me to hunger, and now I want to take my revenge. What am I to do? asked the little man. Late at night, when the king's daughter is in bed, bring her here in her sleep. She shall do servant's work for me. The mannikin said, That is an easy thing for me to do, but a very dangerous thing for you, for if it is discovered, you will fare ill. When twelve o'clock had struck, the door sprang open, and the mannikin carried in the princess. Ah, art thou there? cried the soldier. Get to thy work at once. Fetch the broom and sweep the chamber. When she had done this, he ordered her to come to his chair. Then he stretched out his feet and said, Pull off my boots for me. And then he threw them in her face, and made her pick them up and clean and brighten them. She, however, did everything he bade her without opposition, silently and with half-shut eyes. When the first cock crowed, the mannikin carried her back to the royal palace and laid her in her bed. Next morning, when the princess arose, she went to her father and told him that she had had a very strange dream. I was carried through the streets with the rapidity of lightning, she said, and taken into a soldier's room, and I had to wait upon him like a servant, 
sweep his room, clean his boots, and do all kinds of menial work. It was only a dream, and yet I am just as tired as if I really had done everything. The dream may have been true, said the king. I will give thee a piece of advice. Fill thy pocket full of peas, and make a small hole in it, and then, if thou art carried away again, they will fall out and leave a track in the streets. But unseen by the king, the mannequin was standing beside him when he said that, and heard all. At night, when the sleeping princess was again carried through the streets, some peas certainly did fall out of her pocket, but they made no track, for the crafty mannequin had just before scattered peas in every street there was. And again, the princess was compelled to do servant's work until cock crow. Next morning the king sent his people out to seek the track, but it was all in vain, for in every street poor children were sitting, picking up peas, and saying, It must have rained peas last night. We must think of something else, said the king. Keep thy shoes on when thou goest to bed, and before thou comest back from the place where thou art taken, hide one of them there. I will soon contrive to find it. The black mannequin heard this plot, and at night, when the soldier again ordered him to bring the princess, revealed it to him, and told him that he knew of no expedient to counteract this stratagem, and if the shoe were found in the soldier's house, it would go badly with him. Do what I bid thee, replied the soldier, and again this third night the princess was obliged to work like a servant. Before she went away, she hid her shoe under the bed. Next morning the king had the entire town searched for his daughter's shoe. It was found at the soldier's, and the soldier himself, who, at the entreaty of the dwarf, had gone outside the gate, was soon brought back and thrown into prison. In his flight he had forgotten the most valuable things he had, the blue light and the gold, and had only one ducat in his pocket. And now, loaded with chains, he was standing at the window of his dungeon, when he chanced to see one of his comrades passing by. The soldier tapped at the pane of glass, and when this man came up, said to him, Be so kind as to fetch me the small bundle I have left lying in the inn, and I will give you a ducat for doing it. His comrade ran thither, and brought him what he wanted. As soon as the soldier was alone again, he lighted his pipe, and summoned the black mannequin. Have no fear, said the latter to his master. Go wheresoever they take you, and let them do what they will. Only take the blue light with you. Next day the soldier was tried, and though he had done nothing wicked, the judge condemned him to death. When he was led forth to die, he begged the last favor of the king. What is it? answered the king. That I mayest smoke one more pipe on my way. Thou mayest smoke three, answered the king, but do not imagine that I will spare thy life. Then the soldier pulled out his pipe and lighted it at the blue light, and as soon as a few wreaths of smoke had ascended, the mannequin was there with a small cudgel in his hand and said, What does my lord command? Strike down to earth that false judge there, and his constable, and spare not the king, who has treated me so ill. Then the mannequin fell on them like lightning, darting this way and that, and whosoever was so much as touched by his cudgel fell to the earth, and did not venture to stir again. The king was terrified. He threw himself on the soldier's mercy, and merely to be allowed to live at all, gave him his kingdom for his own, and the princess to wife. End of story. One sixteen. Story one hundred and seventeen of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt, The Willful Child Once upon a time there was a child who was willful and would not do as her mother wished. For this reason, God had no pleasure in her and let her become ill. 
and no doctor could do her any good, and in a short time she lay on her death bed. When she had been lowered into her grave and the earth was spread over her, all at once her arm came out again and stretched upwards, and when they had put it in and spread fresh earth over it, it was all to no purpose, for the arm always came out again. Then the mother herself was obliged to go to the grave and strike the arm with a rod, and when she had done that, it was drawn in, and then at last the child had rest beneath the ground. End of story 117Story 118 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Three Army Surgeons. Three army surgeons who thought they knew their art perfectly were travelling about the world, and they came to an inn where they wanted to pass the night. The host asked whence they came, and whither they were going. We are roaming about the world and practising our art. Just show me for once in a way what you can do, said the host. Then the first said he would cut off his hand and put it on again early next morning. The second said he would tear out his heart and replace it next morning. The third said he would cut out his eyes and heal them again next morning. "'If you can do that,' said the innkeeper, "'you have learnt everything.' They, however, had a salve, with which they rubbed themselves, which joined parts together, and they carried the little bottle in which it was constantly with them. Then they cut the hand, heart, and eyes from their bodies as they had said they would, and laid them all together on a plate, and gave it to the innkeeper. The innkeeper gave it to a servant, who was to set it in the cupboard and take good care of it. The girl, however, had a lover in secret, who was a soldier. When, therefore, the innkeeper, the three army surgeons, and everyone else in the house were asleep, the soldier came and wanted something to eat. The girl opened the cupboard and brought him some food, and in her love forgot to shut the cupboard door again. She seated herself at the table by her lover, and they chattered away together. While she sat so contentedly there, thinking of no ill luck, the cat came creeping in, found the cupboard open, took the hand and heart and eyes of the three army surgeons, and ran off with them. When the soldier had done eating, and the girl was taking away the things and going to shut the cupboard, she saw that the plate which the innkeeper had given her to take care of was empty. Then she said in a fright to her lover, oh, "'Miserable girl! What shall I do?' The hand is gone, the heart and the eyes are gone too. What will become of me in the morning? Be easy, said he. I will help thee out of thy trouble. There is a thief hanging outside on the gallows. I will cut off his hand. Which hand was it? The right one. Then the girl gave him a sharp knife, and he went and cut the poor sinner's right hand off, and brought it to her. After this he caught the cat and cut its eyes out and now nothing but the heart was wanting. "'Have you not been killing, and are not the dead pigs in the cellar?' said he. "'Yes,' said the girl. "'That's well,' said the soldier, and he went down and fetched a pig's heart. The girl placed all together on the plate, and put it in the cupboard, and when after this her lover took leave of her, she went quietly to bed. In the morning, when the three army surgeons got up, they told the girl she was to bring them the plate on which the hand— heart and eyes were lying. Then she brought it out of the cupboard, and the first fixed the thief's hand on and smeared it with his salve, and it grew to his arm directly. The second took the cat's eyes and put them in his own head. The third fixed the pig's heart firm in the place where his own had been, and the innkeeper stood by, admired their skill, and said he had never yet seen such a thing as that done, and would sing their praises and recommend them to everyone. Then they paid their bill and travelled farther. As they were on their way, the one with the pig's heart did not stay with them at all, but wherever there was a corner he ran to it, 
and rooted about in it with his nose as pigs do. The others wanted to hold him back by the tail of his coat, but that did no good. He tore himself loose and ran wherever the dirt was thickest. The second also behaved very strangely. He rubbed his eyes and said to the others, "'Comrades, uh, what is the matter? I don't see at all. Will one of you lead me so that I do not fall?' Then with difficulty they travelled on till evening, when they reached another inn. They went into the bar together, and there at a table in the corner sat a rich man counting money. The one with the thief's hand walked round about him, made a sudden movement twice with his arm, and at last, when the stranger turned away, he snatched at the pile of money and took a handful from it. One of them saw this and said, "'Comrade, what art thou about? Thou must not steal. Shame on thee!' "'Eh?' said he. But how can I stop myself? My hand twitches, and I am forced to snatch things whether I will or not. After this they lay down to sleep, and while they were lying there it was so dark that no one could see his own hand. All at once the one with the cat's eyes awoke, aroused the others, and said, Brothers, just look up. Do you see the white mice running about there? The two sat up, but could see nothing. Then said he, Things are not right with us. We have not got back again what is ours. We must return to the innkeeper. He has deceived us. They went back, therefore, the next morning, and told the host they had not got what was their own again, that the first had a thief's hand, the second cat's eyes, and the third a pig's heart. The innkeeper said that the girl must be to blame for that, and was going to call her, but when she had seen the three coming, she had run out by the back door and not come back. Then the three said he must give them a great deal of money, or they would set his house on fire. He gave them what he had, and whatever he could get together, and the three went away with it. It was enough for the rest of their lives, but they would rather have had their own proper organs. End of story 118《Story 119 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Seven Swabians. Seven Swabians were once together. The first was Master Schultz, the second, Jakli, the third, Marli, the fourth, Jergli, the fifth, Michal, the sixth, Hans, the seventh, Vetli. All seven had made up their minds to travel about the world to seek adventures and perform great deeds, but in order that they might go in security and with arms in their hands, they thought it would be advisable that they should have one solitary but very strong and very long spear made for them. This spear all seven of them took in their hands at once. In front walked the boldest and bravest, and that was Master Schultz. All the others followed in a row, and Vitli was the last. Then it came to pass one day in the haymaking month, July, when they had walked a long distance, and still had a long way to go before they reached the village, where they were to pass the night, that as they were in a meadow in the twilight, a great beetle or hornet flew by them from behind a bush, and hummed in a menacing manner. Master Schultz was so terrified that he all but dropped the spear, and a cold perspiration broke out over his whole body. "'Hark! hark!' cried he to his comrades. "'Good heavens! I hear a drum!' Yakli, who was behind him holding the spear, and who perceived some kind of a smell, said, "'Something is most certainly going on, for I taste powder and matches.' At these words Master Schultz began to take to flight, and in a trice jumped over a hedge. But as he just happened to jump on to the teeth of a rake which had been left lying there after the haymaking, the handle of it struck against his face, and gave him a tremendous blow. "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear!' screamed Master Schultz. "'Take me prisoner! I surrender! I surrender!' The other six all leapt over, one on the top of the other, crying, "'If you surrender, I surrender too! If you surrender, I surrender too!' 
At length, as no enemy was there to bind and take them away, they saw that they had been mistaken, and in order that the story might not be known, and they be treated as fools and ridiculed, they all swore to each other to hold their peace about it until one of them accidentally spoke of it. Then they journeyed onwards. The second danger which they survived cannot be compared with the first. Some days afterwards, their path led them through a fallow field, where a hare was sitting, sleeping in the sun. Her ears were standing straight up, and her great glassy eyes were wide open. All of them were alarmed at the sight of the horrible wild beast, and they consulted together as to what it would be the least dangerous to do. For if they were to run away, they knew that the monster would pursue and swallow them whole. So they said, We must go through a great and dangerous struggle. Boldly ventured is half won. And all seven grasped the spear, Master Schultz in front and Vaitley behind. And Master Schultz was always trying to keep the sphere back, but Vaitley had become quite brave all behind, and wanted to dash forward, and cried, Strike home in every Swabian's name, or else I wish she may be lame. But Hans knew how to meet this, and said, Thunder and lightning, it's fine to prate, but for dragon hunting, thou'rt I too late. Mikkel cried, Nothing is wanting, not even a hair. Be sure the devil himself is there. Then it was Yergli's turn to speak. If it be not, it's at least his brother, or else it's the devil's own stepbrother. Now Marley had a bright thought, and said to Vaitley, Advance, Vaitley, advance, advance, and I behind will hold the launch. Vaitley, however, did not attend to that, and Yergli said, "'Tis Schultz's place the first to be. No one deserves that honour but he. Then Master Schultz plucked up his courage and said gravely, Then let us boldly advance to the fight, and thus we shall show our valour and might. Hereupon they all together set on the dragon. Master Schultz crossed himself and prayed for God's assistance, but as all this was of no avail, and he was getting nearer and nearer to the enemy, he screamed, Ho ho, ho ho, ho ho, ho, in the greatest anguish. This awakened the hare, which in great alarm darted swiftly away. When Master Schultz saw her thus flying from the field of battle, he cried in his joy, Quick, Vitli, quick, look there, look there, the monster's nothing but a hare. But the Swabian allies went in search of further adventures, and came to the Moselle, a mossy, quiet, deep river, over which there are few bridges, and which in many places people have to cross in boats. As the seven Swabians did not know this, they called to a man who was working on the opposite side of the river to know how people contrived to get across. The distance and the way of speaking made the man unable to understand what they wanted, and he said, What? What? In the way people speak in the neighborhood of Treves. Master Schultz thought he was saying, Wade, wade through the water. And as he was the first, began to set out and went into the Moselle. It was not long before he sank in the mud and the deep waves which drove against him, but his hat was blown on the opposite shore by the wind, and a frog sat down beside it and croaked, What? 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 The other six on the opposite side heard that and said, Oh, ho, comrades! Master Schultz is calling us. If he can wade across, why cannot we? So they all jumped into the water together in a great hurry, and were drowned. And thus one frog took the lives of all six of them, and not one of the Swabian allies ever reached home again. End of story 119。story 120 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Three Apprentices. There were once three apprentices who had agreed to keep always together while traveling and always to work in the same town. At one time, however, their masters had no more work to give them, so that at last they were in rags and had nothing to live on. Then one of them said, "'What shall we do? We cannot stay here any longer. We will travel once more, 
and if we do not find any work in the town we go to, we will arrange with the innkeeper there that we are to write and tell him where we are staying, so that we can always have news of each other, and then we will separate. And that seemed best to the others also. They went forth and met on the way a richly dressed man who asked who they were. We are apprentices looking for work. Up to this time we have kept together, but if we cannot find anything to do, we are going to separate. There is no need for that, said the man. If you will do what I tell you, you shall not want for gold or for work. Nay, you shall become great lords and drive in your carriages. One of them said, If our souls and salvation be not endangered, we will certainly do it. They will not, replied the man. I have no claim on you. One of the others had, however, looked at his feet, and when he saw a horse's foot and a man's foot, he did not want to have anything to do with him. The devil, however, said, Be easy, I have no designs on you, but on another soul, which is half my own already, and whose measure shall be run full. As they were now secure, they consented, and the devil told them what he wanted. The first was to answer, All three of us, to every question. The second was to say, For money. And the third, And quite right, too. They were always to say this one after the other, but they were not to say one word more, and if they disobeyed this order, all their money would disappear at once, but so long as they observed it, their pockets would always be full. As a beginning, he at once gave them as much as they could carry, and told them to go to such and such an inn when they got to the town. They went to it, and the innkeeper came to meet them and asked if they wished for anything to eat. The first replied, All three of us! Yes, said the host, that is what I mean. The second said, For money! Of course, said the host. The third said, And quite right, too. Certainly it is right, said the host. Good meat and drink were now brought to them, and they were well waited on. After the dinner came the payment, and the innkeeper gave the bill to the one who said, All three of us. The second said, For money! And the third, And quite right, too. Indeed it is right, said the host. All three pay, and with that money I can give nothing. They, however, paid still more than he had asked. The lodgers, who were looking on, said, These people must be mad. Yes, indeed they are, said the host. They are not very wise. So they stayed some time in the inn, and said nothing else but, All three of us, for money, and, and quite right, too. But they saw and knew all that was going on. It so happened that a great merchant came with a large sum of money and said, Sir host, take care of my money for me. Here are three crazy apprentices who might steal it from me. The host did as he was asked. As he was carrying the trunk into his room, he felt that it was heavy with gold. Thereupon he gave the three apprentices a lodging below, but the merchant came upstairs into a separate apartment. When it was midnight, and the host thought that all were asleep, he came with his wife. They had an axe, and struck the rich merchant dead, and after they had murdered him, they went to bed again. When it was day, there was a great outcry. The merchant lay dead in bed, bathed in blood. All the guests ran at once, but the host said, The three crazy apprentices have done this. The lodgers confirmed it, and said, It can have been no one else. The innkeeper, however, had them called, and said to them, Have you killed the merchant? All three of us, said the first. For money, said the second, and the third added, And quite right, too. There now, you hear, said the host. They confess it themselves. They were taken to prison, therefore, and were to be tried. When they saw that things were going so seriously, they were, after all, afraid. But at night the devil came and said, Bear it just one day longer, and do not play away your luck. Not one hair of your head shall be hurt. The next morning they were led to the bar, and the judge said, Are you the murderers? All three of us. Why did you kill the merchant? For money. You wicked wretches, you have no horror of your sins. And quite right, too. They have confessed and are still stubborn, said the judge. 
Lead them to death instantly. So they were taken out, and the host had to go with them into the circle. When they were taken hold of by the executioner's men, and were just going to be led up to the scaffold where the headsman was standing with a naked sword, a coach drawn by four blood-red chestnut horses came up suddenly, driving so fast that fire flashed from the stones, and someone made signs from the window with a white handkerchief. Then said the headsman, It is a pardon coming, and pardon, pardon was called from the carriage also. Then the devil stepped out as a very noble gentleman, beautifully dressed, and said, You three are innocent. You may now speak. Make known what you have seen and heard. Then said the eldest, We did not kill the merchant. The murderer is standing there in the circle. And he pointed to the innkeeper. In proof of this, go into a cellar, where many others whom he has killed are still hanging. Then the judge sent the executioner's men thither, and they found it was as the apprentices said, and when they had informed the judge of this, he caused the innkeeper to be led up, and his head was cut off. Then said the devil to the three, Now I have got the soul which I wanted to have, and you are free, and have money for the rest of your lives. End of story 120。Yeah, Translated by Margaret Hunt, the king's son who feared nothing. There once was a king's son who was no longer content to stay at home in his father's house, and as he had no fear of anything, he thought, "I will go forth into the wide world. There, the time will not seem long to me, and I shall see wonders enough." So he took leave of his parents and went forth, and on and on from morning till night, and whichever way his path led. It was the same to him. It came to pass that he got to the house of a giant, and as he was so tired, he sat down by the door and rested. And as he let his eyes roam here and there, he saw the giant's playthings lying in the yard. These were a couple of enormous balls and nine pins, as tall as a man. After a while, he had a fancy to set the nine pins up, and then rolled the balls at them, and screamed and cried out when the nine pins fell. And had a merry time of it. The giant heard the noise, stretched his head out of the window, and saw a man who was not taller than other men, and yet played with his nine pins. Little worm cried he, "Why art thou playing with my balls? Who gave thee strength to do it?" The king's son looked up, saw the giant, and said, "O、oh, thou blockhead! Thou thinkest indeed that thou only hast strong arms. I can do everything I want to do." The giant came down and watched the bowling with great admiration, and said, "Child of man, if thou art one of that kind, go and bring me an apple of the tree of life." "What dost thou want with it?" said the king's son. "I do not want the apple for myself," answered the giant, "but I have a betrothed bride who wishes for it. I have travelled far about the world and cannot find the tree. I will soon find it," said the king's son. And I do not know what is to prevent me from getting the apple down. The giant said, "Thou really believest it to be so easy? The garden in which the tree stands is surrounded by an iron railing, and in front of the railing lie wild beasts, each close to the other, and they keep watch and let no man go in. They will be sure to let me in," said the king's son. "Yes, but even if thou dost get into the garden." And seest the apple hanging to the tree, it is still not thine. A ring hangs in front of it, through which any one who wants to reach the apple and break it off must put his hand. And no one has yet had the luck to do it. That luck will be mine," said the king's son. Then he took leave of the giant and went forth over mountain and valley, and through plains and forests until at length he came to the wondrous garden. The beasts lay round about it. But they had put their heads down and were asleep. Moreover, they did not awake when he went up to them. So he stepped over them, climbed the fence, and got safely into the garden. 
There in the very middle of it stood the tree of life, and the red apples were shining upon the branches. He climbed up the trunk to the top, and as he was about to reach out for an apple, he saw a ring hanging before it, but he thrust his hand through that without any difficulty, and gathered the apple. The ring closed tightly on his arm, and all at once he felt a prodigious strength flowing through his veins. When he had come down again from the tree with the apple, he would not climb over the fence, but grasped the great gate, and had no need to shake it more than once before it sprang open with a loud crash. Then he went out, and the lion which had been lying down before was awake and sprang after him, not in rage and fierceness, but following him humbly as its master. The king's son took the giant the apple he had promised him and said, Seest thou, I have brought it without difficulty. The giant was glad that his desire had been so soon satisfied, hastened to his bride, and gave her the apple for which she had wished. She was a beautiful and wise maiden, and as she did not see the ring on his arm, she said, I shall never believe that thou hast brought the apple until I see the ring on thine arm. The giant said, I have nothing to do but go home and fetch it, and thought it would be easy to take away by force from the weak man what he would not give of his own free will. He therefore demanded the ring from him, but the king's son refused it. Where the apple is, the ring must be also, said the giant. If thou wilt not give it of thine own accord, thou must fight with me for it. They wrestled with each other for a long time, but the giant could not get the better of the king's son, who was strengthened by the magical power of the ring. Then the giant thought of a stratagem and said, I have got warm with fighting, and so hast thou. We will bathe in the river and cool ourselves before we begin again. The king's son, who knew nothing of falsehood, went with him to the water, and pulled off his clothes and the ring also from his arm, and sprang into the river. The giant instantly snatched the ring and ran away with it, but the lion, which had observed the theft, pursued the giant, tore the ring out of his hand, and brought it back to his master. Then the giant placed himself behind an oak tree, and while the king's son was busy putting on his clothes again, surprised him, and put both his eyes out. And now the unhappy king's son stood there, and was blind and knew not how to help himself. Then the giant came back to him, took him by the hand, as if he were someone who wanted to guide him, and led him to the top of a high rock. There he left him standing, and thought, Just two steps more, and he will fall down and kill himself, and I can take the ring from him. But the faithful lion had not deserted its master. It held him fast by the clothes, and drew him gradually back again. When the giant came and wanted to rob the dead man, he saw that his cunning had been in vain. Is there no way, then, of destroying a weak child of man like that? said he angrily to himself, and seized the king's son, and led him back up to the precipice by another way. But the lion, which saw his evil design, helped its master out of danger here also. When they had got close to the edge, the giant let the blind man's hand drop, and was going to leave him behind alone. But the lion pushed the giant so that he was thrown down, and fell, dashed to pieces on the ground. The faithful animal again drew its master back from the precipice, and guided him to a tree by which flowed a clear brook. The king's son sat down there, but the lion lay down, and sprinkled the water in his face with its paws. Scarcely had a couple of drops wetted the sockets of his eyes than he was once more able to see something, and remarked a little bird flying quite close by, which wounded itself against the trunk of a tree. On this it went down to the water, and bathed itself therein, and then it soared upwards, and swept between the trees without touching them, as if it had recovered its sight again. Then the king's son recognized a sign from God, and stooped down to the water, and washed, and bathed his face in it. And when he arose, he had his eyes once more brighter and clearer than they had ever been. The king's son thanked God for his great mercy, and traveled with his lion onwards through the world. And it came to pass that he arrived before a castle which was enchanted. 
in the gateway stood a maiden of beautiful form and fine face but she was quite black she spoke to him and said ah if thou couldst but deliver me from the evil spell which is thrown over me what shall i do said the king's son the maiden answered thou must pass three nights in the great hall of this enchanted castle but thou must let no fear enter thy heart when they are doing their worst to torment thee if thou bearest it without letting a sound escape thee i shall be free thy life they dare not take then said the king's son i have no fear with god's help i will try it so he went gaily into the castle and when it grew dark he seated himself in the large hall and waited everything was quiet however until midnight when all at once a great tumult began and out of every hole and corner came little devils they behaved as if they did not see him seated themselves in the middle of the room lighted a fire and began to gamble when one of them lost he said it is not right some one is here who does not belong to us it is his fault that i am losing wait you fellow behind the stove i am coming said another the screaming became still louder so that no one could have heard it without terror the king's son stayed sitting quite quietly and was not afraid but at last the devils jumped up from the ground and fell on him and there were so many of them that he could not defend himself from them they dragged him about on the floor pinched him pricked him beat him and tormented him but no sound escaped from him towards morning they disappeared and he was so exhausted that he could scarcely move his limbs but when day dawned the black maiden came to him she bore in her hand a little bottle wherein was the water of life wherewith she washed him and he at once felt all pain depart and new strength flow through his veins she said thou hast held out successfully for one night but two more lie before thee then she went away again and as she was going he observed that her feet had become white the next night the devils came out and began their gambols anew they fell on the king's son and beat him much worse severely than the night before until his body was covered with wounds but as he bore it all quietly they were forced to leave him and when dawn appeared the maiden came and healed him with the water of life and when she went away he saw with joy that she had already become white to the tips of her fingers and now he had only one night more to go through but it was the worst the hobgoblins came again art thou there still cried they thou shalt be tormented till thy breath stops they pricked him and beat him and threw him here and there and pulled him by the arms and legs as if they wanted to tear him to pieces but he bore everything and never uttered a cry at last the devils vanished but he lay fainting there and did not stir nor could he raise his eyes to look at the maiden who came in and sprinkled and bathed him with the water of life but suddenly he was freed from all pain and felt fresh and healthy as if he had awakened from sleep and when he opened his eyes he saw the maiden standing by him snow white and fair as day rise said she and swing thy sword three times over the stairs and then all will be delivered and when he had done that the whole castle was released from enchantment and the maiden was a rich king's daughter the servants came and said that the table was already set in the great hall and dinner served up then they sat down and ate and drank together and in the evening the wedding was solemnized with great rejoicings end of story one twenty one story one twenty two of household tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Donkey Cabbages. There was once a young huntsman who went into the forest to lie in wait. 
He had a fresh and joyous heart, and as he was going thither, whistling upon a leaf, an ugly old crone came up, who spoke to him and said, Good day, dear huntsman. Truly, you are merry and contented, but I am suffering from hunger and thirst. Do give me an alms. The huntsman had compassion on the poor old creature, felt in his pocket, and gave her what he could afford. He was then about to go further, but the old woman stopped him and said, Listen, dear huntsman, to what I tell you, I will make you a present in return for your kindness. Go on your way now, but in a little while you will come to a tree, whereon nine birds are sitting which have a cloak in their claws, and are plucking at it. Take your gun and shoot into the midst of them. They will let the cloak fall down to you, but one of the birds will be hurt, and will drop down dead. Carry away the cloak. It is a wishing cloak. When you throw it over your shoulders, you only have to wish to be in a certain place, and you will be there in the twinkling of an eye. Take out the heart of the dead bird and swallow it whole, and every morning early when you get up, you will find a gold piece under your pillow. The huntsman thanked the wise woman and thought to himself, Those are fine things that she has promised me, if all does but come true. And verily, when he had walked about a hundred paces, he heard in the branches above him such a screaming and twittering that he looked up and saw there a crowd of birds who were tearing a piece of cloth about with their beaks and claws and tugging and fighting as if each wanted to have it all to himself. Well, said the huntsman, this is wonderful. It has really come to pass just as the old wife foretold. And he took the gun from his shoulder, aimed and fired it right into the midst of them, so that the feathers flew about. The birds instantly took to flight with loud outcries, but one dropped down dead, and the cloak fell at the same time. Then the huntsman did as the old woman had directed him, cut open the bird, sought the heart, swallowed it down, and took the cloak home with him. Next morning, when he awoke, the promise occurred to him, and he wished to see if it also had been fulfilled. When he lifted up the pillow, the gold piece shone in his eyes, and the next day he found another, and so it went on every time he got up. He gathered together a heap of gold, but at the last moment he thought, of what use is all my gold to me if I stay at home? I will go forth and see the world. He then took leave of his parents, buckled on his huntsman's pouch and gun, and went out into the world. It came to pass that one day he traveled through a dense forest, and when he came to the end of it, in the plain before him stood a fine castle. An old woman was standing with a wonderfully beautiful maiden, looking out of one of the windows. The old woman, however, was a witch, and said to the maiden, There comes one out of the forest who has a wonderful treasure in his body. We must filch it from him, my dear daughter. It is more suitable for us than for him. He has a bird's heart about him, by means of which a gold piece lies every morning under his pillow. She told her what she was to do to get it, and what part she had to play and finally threatened her and said with angry eyes, And if you do not attend to what I say, it will be worse for you. Now, when the huntsman came nearer, he descried the maiden, and said to himself, I have traveled about for such a long time. I will take a rest for once, and enter that beautiful castle. I have certainly money enough. Nevertheless, the real reason was that he had caught sight of the pretty girl. He entered the house and was well received and courteously entertained. Before long he was so much in love with the young witch that he no longer thought of anything else, and only saw things as she saw them, and did what she desired. The old woman then said, Now we must have the bird's heart. He will never miss it. She prepared a drink, and when it was ready, poured it into a cup and gave it to the maiden, who was to present it to the huntsman. She did so, saying, Now, my dearest, drink to me. So he took the cup, and when he had swallowed the draught, he brought up the heart of the bird. The girl had to take it away secretly, and swallow it herself, for the old woman would have it so. 
Thenceforward he found no more gold under his pillow, but it lay instead under that of the maiden, from whence the old woman fetched it away every morning. But he was so much in love and so befooled that he thought of nothing else but of passing his time with the girl. Then the old witch said, We have the bird's heart, but we must also take the wishing cloak away from him. The girl answered, We will leave him that. He has lost his wealth. The old woman was angry and said, Such a mantle is a wonderful thing, and is seldom to be found in this world. I must and will have it. She gave the girl several blows, and said that if she did not obey, it should fare ill with her. So she did the old woman's bidding, placed herself at the window, and looked on the distant country, as if she were very sorrowful. The huntsman asked, Why dost thou stand there so sorrowfully? Ah, oh, my beloved, was her answer, over yonder lies the Garnet Mountain, where the precious stones grow. I long for them so much that when I think of them I feel quite sad. But who can get them? Only the birds. They fly and can reach them. But a man never. Hast thou nothing else to complain of? said the huntsman. I will soon remove that burden from thy heart. With that he drew her under his mantle, wished himself on the Garnet Mountain, and in the twinkling of an eye they were sitting on it together. Precious stones were glistening on every side, so that it was a joy to see them, and together they gathered the finest and the costliest of them. Now the old woman had, through her sorceries, contrived that the eyes of the huntsman should become heavy. He said to the maiden, We will sit down and rest a while. I am so tired that I can no longer stand on my feet. Then they sat down, and he laid his head in her lap and fell asleep. When he was asleep, she unfastened the mantle from his shoulders and wrapped herself in it, picked up the garnets and stones, and wished herself back at home with them. But when the huntsman had had his sleep out, and awoke, and perceived that his sweetheart had betrayed him, and left him alone on the wild mountain, he said, Oh, what treachery there is in the world! and sat down there, in care and sorrow, not knowing what to do. But the mountain belonged to some wild and monstrous giants, who dwelt thereon and lived their lives there, and he had not sat long before he saw three of them coming towards him. So he lay down as if he were sunk in a deep sleep. Then the giants came up, and the first kicked him with his foot, and said, What sort of an earthworm is lying curled up here? The second said, step upon him and kill him. But the third said, That would indeed be worth your while. Just let him live. He cannot remain here. And when he climbs higher toward the summit of the mountain, the clouds will lay hold of him and bear him away. So saying, they passed by. But the huntsman had paid heed to their words, and as soon as they were gone, he rose and climbed up the summit of the mountain. And when he had sat there a while, a cloud floated towards him, caught him up, carried him away, and travelled about for a long time in the heavens. Then it sank lower, and let itself down on a great cabbage garden, girt around by walls, so that he came softly to the ground on cabbages and vegetables. Then the huntsman looked about him and said, If I had but something to eat, I am so hungry, and my hunger will increase in course of time. But I see here neither apples nor pears, nor any sort of fruit, everywhere nothing but cabbages. But at length he thought, At a pinch I can eat some of the leaves. They do not taste particularly good, but they will refresh me. With that he picked himself out a fine head of cabbage, and ate it. But scarcely had he swallowed a couple of mouthfuls, than he felt very strange and quite different. Four legs grew on him, a large head and two thick ears, and he saw with horror that he was changed into an ass. Still, as his hunger increased every minute, 
and as the juicy leaves were suitable to his present nature, he went on eating with great zest. At last he arrived at a different kind of cabbage, but as soon as he had swallowed it, he again felt a change, and reassumed his former human shape. Then the huntsman lay down and slept off his fatigue. When he awoke next morning, he broke off one head of the bad cabbages and another of the good ones, and thought to himself, This shall help me to get my own again and punish treachery. When he took the cabbages with him, climbed over the wall, and went forth to seek for the castle of his sweetheart. After wandering about for a couple of days, he was lucky enough to find it again. He dyed his face brown, so that his own mother would not have known him, and begged for shelter. I am so tired, he said, that I can go no further. The witch asked, Who are you, countryman, and what is your business? I am a king's messenger, and was sent out to seek the most delicious salad which grows beneath the sun. I have even been so fortunate as to find it, and am carrying it about with me. But the heat of the sun is so intense that the delicate cabbage threatens to wither, and I do not know if I can carry it any further. When the old woman heard of the exquisite salad, she was greedy and said, Dear countryman, let me just taste this wonderful salad. Why not? answered he. I have brought two heads with me, and will give you one of them. And he opened his pouch and handed her the bad cabbage. The witch suspected nothing amiss, and her mouth watered so for this new dish that she herself went into the kitchen and dressed it. When it was prepared, she could not wait until it was set on the table, but took a couple of leaves at once and put them in her mouth, but hardly had she swallowed them than she was deprived of her human shape, and she ran out into the courtyard in the form of an ass. Presently the maid servant entered the kitchen, saw the salad standing there ready prepared, and was about to carry it up. But on the way, according to habit, she was seized by the desire to taste, and she ate a couple of leaves. Instantly the magic power showed itself, and she likewise became an ass, and ran out to the old woman, and the dish of salad fell to the ground. Meantime, the messenger sat beside the beautiful girl, and as no one came with the salad, and she also was longing for it, she said, I don't know what has become of the salad. The huntsman thought. The salad must have already taken effect, and said, I will go to the kitchen and inquire about it. As he went down, he saw the two asses running about in the courtyard. The salad, however, was lying on the ground. All right, said he. The two have taken their portion. And he picked up the other leaves and laid them on the dish and carried them to the maiden. I bring you the delicate food myself, said he, in order that you may not have to wait longer. And she ate of it and was, like the others, immediately deprived of her human form and ran out into the courtyard in the shape of an ass. After the huntsman had washed his face, so that the transformed ones could recognize him, he went down into the courtyard and said, Now you shall receive the wages of your treachery, and bound them together, all three with one rope, and drove them along until he came to a mill. He knocked at the window. The miller put out his head and asked what he wanted. I have three unmanageable beasts, answered he, which I don't want to keep any longer. Will you take them in and give them food and stable room and manage them as I tell you? And then I will pay you what you ask. The miller said, Why not? But how am I to manage them? The huntsman then said that he was to give three beatings and one meal daily to the old donkey, and that was the witch one beating and three meals to the younger one, which was the servant girl, and to the youngest, which was the maiden, no beatings and three meals, for he could not bring himself to have the maiden beaten. After that he went back into the castle and found therein everything he needed. 
After a couple of days, the miller came and said he must inform him that the old ass, which had received three beatings and only one meal daily, was dead. The two others, he continued, are certainly not dead, but are fed three times daily. But they are so sad that they cannot last much longer. The huntsman was moved to pity, put away his anger, and told the miller to drive them back again to him. And when they came, he gave them some of the good salad, so that they became human again. The beautiful girl fell on her knees before him and said, Ah, oh, my beloved, forgive me for the evil I have done you. My mother drove me to it. It was done against my will, for I love you dearly. Your wishing cloak hangs in a cupboard, and as for the bird's heart, I will take a vomiting potion. But he thought otherwise and said, Keep it. It is all the same, for I will take thee for my wife. So the wedding was celebrated, and they lived happily together until their death. End of story 122「Story number 123 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Household Tales by Jacob and William Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Old Woman in the Wood A poor servant girl was once traveling with the family with which she was in service through a great forest and when they were in the midst of it robbers came out of the thicket and murdered all they found all perished together except the girl who had jumped out of the carriage in a fright and hidden herself behind a tree when the robbers had gone away with their booty she came out and beheld the great disaster then she began to weep bitterly and said what can a poor girl like me do now? I do not know how to get out of the forest. No human being lives in it, so I must certainly starve. She walked about and looked for a road, but could find none. When it was evening, she seated herself under a tree, gave herself into God's keeping, and resolved to sit waiting there and not go away, let what might happen. When, however, she had sat there for a while, and a white dove came flying to her with a little golden key in its mouth. It put the little key into her hand and said, Doubt thou see that great tree? Therein is a little lock. It opens with the tiny key. And there thou wilt find food enough, and suffer no more hunger. Then she went to the tree and opened it, and found milk in a little dish, and white bread to break into it, so that she could eat her fill. When she was satisfied, she said, it is now the time when the hens at home go to roost. I am so tired I could go to bed too. Then the dove flew to her again, and brought another golden key in its bill, and said, Open that tree there, and thou wilt find a bed. So she opened it, and found a beautiful white bed, and prayed God to protect her during the night, and lay down and slept. In the morning the dove came for the third time, and again brought a little key, and said, Open that tree there and thou wilt find clothes. And when she opened it, she found garments beset with gold and with jewels, more splendid than those of any king's daughter. So she lived there for some time, and the dove came every day, and provided her with all she needed, and it was a quiet good life. Once, however, the dove came and said, Wilt thou do something for my sake? With all my heart, said the girl. Then said the little dove, I will guide thee to a small house, enter it, and inside it an old woman will be sitting by the fire and will say, Good day. But on thy life give her no answer. Let her do what she will, but pass by her on the right side. Further on there is a door, which open, and thou wilt enter into a room where a quantity of rings of all kinds are lying, amongst which are some magnificent ones with shining stones. Leave them, however, where they are, and seek out a plain one which must likewise be amongst them, and bring it here to me as quickly as thou canst. The girl went to the little house and came to the door, 
there sat an old woman who stared when she saw her and said good day my child the girl gave her no answer and opened the door whither away cried the old woman and seized her by the gown and wanted to hold to her fast saying that is my house no one can go in there if i choose not to allow it but the girl was silent and got away from her and went straight into the room now there lay on the table an enormous quantity of rings which gleamed and glittered before her eyes she turned them over and looked for the plain one but could not find it while she was seeking she saw the old woman and how she was stealing away and wanting to get off with a bird cage which she had in her hand so she went after her and took the cage out of her hand and when she raised it up and looked into it a bird was inside which had the plain ring in its bill then she took the ring and ran quite joyously home with it and thought the little white dove would come and get the ring but it did not then she leant against a tree and determined to wait for the dove and as thus stood it seemed just as if the tree was soft and pliant and was letting its branches down and suddenly the branches twined around her and were two arms and when she looked round the tree was a handsome man who embraced and kissed her heartily and said thou hast delivered me from the power of the old woman who is a wicked witch she had changed me into a tree and every day for two hours i was a white dove and as long as she possessed the ring i could not regain my human form then his servants and his horses who had likewise been changed into trees were freed from the enchantment also and stood beside him and he led them forth to his kingdom for he was a king's son and they married and lived happily end of story number 123Story 124 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Parrott. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Three Brothers. There was once a man who had three sons and nothing else in the world but the house in which he lived. Now each of the sons wished to have the house after his father's death, but the father loved them all alike and did not know what to do. He did not wish to sell the house, because it had belonged to his forefathers, else he might have divided the money amongst them. At last a plan came into his head, and he said to his sons, Go into the world, and try each of you to learn a trade, and, when you all come back, he who makes the best masterpiece shall have the house. The sons were well content with this, and the eldest determined to be a blacksmith, the second a barber, and the third a fencing master. They fixed a time when they should all come home again, and then each went his way. It chanced that they all found skilful masters, who taught them their trades well. The blacksmith had to shoe the king's horses, and he thought to himself, the house is mine without doubt. The barber only shaved great people, and he too already looked upon the house as his own. The fencing-master got many a blow, but he only bit his lip and let nothing vex him, for, said he to himself, if you are afraid of a blow, you'll never win the house. When the appointed time had gone by, the three brothers came back home to their father, but they did not know how to find the best opportunity for showing their skill, so they sat down and consulted together. As they were sitting thus, all at once a hare came running across the field. Aha! Just in time, said the barber. So he took his basin and soap, and lathered away until the hare came up. Then he soaped and shaved off the hare's whiskers, whilst he was running at the top of his speed, and did not even cut his skin or injure a hair on his body. Well done, said the old man. Your brothers will have to exert themselves wonderfully, or the house will be yours. Soon after, up came a nobleman in his coach, dashing along at full speed. "'Now you shall see what I can do, father,' said the blacksmith. So away he ran after the coach, took all four shoes off the feet of one of the horses whilst he was galloping, and put him on four new shoes without stopping him. "'You are a fine fellow, and as clever as your brother,' said his father. "'I do not know to which I ought to give the house.' Then the third son said, father let me have my turn if you please and as it was beginning to rain 
he drew his sword and flourished it backwards and forwards above his head so fast that not a drop fell upon him it rained still harder and harder till at last it came down in torrents but he only flourished his sword faster and faster and remained as dry as if he was sitting in a house when his father saw this he was amazed and said this is the masterpiece the house is yours his brothers were satisfied with this as was agreed beforehand and as they loved one another very much they all three stayed together in the house followed their trades and as they had learnt them so well and were so clever they earned a great deal of money thus they lived together happily until they grew old and at last when one of them fell sick and died the two others grieved so sorely about it that they also fell ill and soon after died and because they had been so clever and had loved one another so much they were all laid in the same grave end of story one two four story number one twenty five of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america household tales by jacob and william grimm translated by margaret hunt the devil and his grandmother there was a great war and the king had many soldiers but gave them small pay so small that they could not live upon it so three of them agreed among themselves to desert one of them said to the others if we are caught we shall be hanged on the gallows how shall we manage it another said look at the great cornfield if we were to hide ourselves there no one could find us the troops are not allowed to enter it and to-morrow they are to march away they crept into the corn only the troops did not march away but remained lying all round about it they stayed in the corn for two days and two nights and were so hungry that they all but died but if they had come out their death would have been certain then said they what is the use of our deserting if we have to perish miserably here but now a fiery dragon came flying through the air and it came down to them and asked why they had concealed themselves there they answered we are three soldiers who have deserted because the pay was so bad and now we shall have to die of hunger if we stay here or to dangle on the gallows if we go out if you will serve me for seven years said the dragon i will convey you through the army so that no one shall seize you we have no choice and are compelled to accept they replied then the dragon caught hold of them with his claws and carried them away through the air over the army and put them down again on the earth far from it but the dragon was no other than the devil he gave them a small whip and said whip with it and crack it then as much gold will spring up round about as you can wish for then you can live like great lords keep horses and drive your carriages but when the seven years have come to an end you are my property then he put before them a book which they were all three forced to sign i will however then set you a riddle said he and if you can guess that you shall be free and released from my power then the dragon flew away from them and then they went away with their whip had gold in plenty and ordered themselves rich apparel and travelled about the world wherever they were they lived in pleasure and magnificence rode on horseback drove in carriages ate and drank but did nothing wicked the time slipped quickly away and when the seven years were coming to an end two of them were terribly anxious and alarmed but the third took the affair easily and said brothers fear nothing my head is sharp enough i shall guess the riddle they went out into the open country and sat down and the two pulled sorrowful faces then an aged woman came up to them who inquired why they were so sad alas said they how can that concern you after all you cannot help us who knows said she confide your trouble to me so they told her that that they had been the devil's servants for nearly seven years and that he had provided them with gold as plentifully as if it had been blackberries but that they had sold themselves to him and were forfeited to him if at the end of seven years they could not guess a riddle the old woman said if you are to be saved one of you must go into the forest there he will come to a fallen rock 
which looks like a little house. He must enter that, and then he will obtain help. The two melancholy ones thought to themselves, that will still not save us, and stayed where they were. But the third, the merry one, got up and walked on in the forest until he found the rock house. In the little house, however, a very aged woman was sitting, who was the devil's grandmother, and asked the soldier where he came from and what he wanted there. He told her everything that had happened, and as he pleased her well, she had pity on him, and said she would help him. She lifted up a great stone which lay above a cellar and said, Conceal thyself there. Thou canst hear everything that is said here. Only sit still and do not stir. When the dragon comes, I will question him about the riddle. He tells everything to me, so listen carefully to his answer. At twelve o'clock at night, the dragon came flying thither and asked for his dinner. The grandmother laid the table and served up food and drink, so that he was pleased, and they ate and drank together. In the course of conversation, she asked him what kind of a day he had had and how many souls he had got. Nothing went very well today, he answered, but I have laid hold of three soldiers. I have them safe. Indeed, three soldiers? That's something like. But they may escape you yet. The devil said mockingly, They are mine. I will set them a riddle, which they will never in this world be able to guess. What riddle is that? she inquired. I will tell you. In the great North Sea lies a dead dogfish. That shall be your roast meat, and the rib of a whale shall be your silver spoon, and a hollow old horse's hoof shall be your wine glass. When the devil had gone to bed, the old grandmother raised up the stone and let out the soldier. Hast thou paid particular attention to everything? Yes, he said, I know enough, and will contrive to save myself. Then he had to go back another way, through the window, secretly and with all speed to his companions. He told them how the devil had been overreached by the old grandmother, and how he had learned the answer to the riddle from him. Then they were all joyous, and of good cheer, and took the whip and whipped so much gold for themselves that it ran all over the ground. When the seven years had fully gone by, the devil came with a book, showed the signatures, and said, I will take you with me to hell. There you shall have a meal. If you can guess what kind of roast meat you will have to eat, you shall be free and released from your bargain, and may keep the whip as well. Then the first soldier began, and said, In the great North Sea lies a dead dogfish, that no doubt is the roast meat. The devil was angry and began to mutter, Hmm, 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 and asked the second, But what will your spoon be? The rib of a whale, that is to be our silver spoon. The devil made a wry face again and growled, Hmm, 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 and said to the third, And do you also know what your wine glass is to be? An old horse's hoof is to be our wine glass. Then the devil flew away with a loud cry and had no more power over them. But the three kept the whip, whipped as much money for themselves with it as they wanted, and lived happily to their end. End of story number 125「Story number 126 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee Ferdinand the Faithful Once on a time lived a man and a woman who, so long as they were rich, had no children. But when they were poor, they had a little boy. They could, however, find no godfather for him. So the man said he would just go to another place to see if he could get one there. As he went, a poor man met him, who asked him where he was going. He said he was going to see if he could get a godfather, that he was poor, so no one would stand as godfather for him. Oh, said the poor man, you are poor. I am poor. I will be godfather for you but I am so ill off I can give the child nothing. Go home and tell the nurse that she is to come to the church with the child. When they all got to the church together, the beggar was already there, and he gave the child the name of Ferdinand the Faithful. When he was going out of the church, the beggar said, Now go home. I can give you nothing, and you likewise ought to give me nothing. But he gave a key to the nurse and told her 
When she got home, she was to give it to the father, who was to take care of it until the child was fourteen years old, and then he was to go on the heath where there was a castle which the key would fit, and that all which was therein should belong to him. Now when the child was seven years old and had grown up very big, he once went to play with some other boys, and each of them boasted that he had got more from his godfather than the other. But the child could say nothing and was vexed, and went home and said to his father, Did I get nothing at all then from my godfather? Oh, yes, said the father. Thou hadst a key. If there is a castle standing on the heath, just go to it and open it. Then the boy went thither, but no castle was to be seen or heard of. After seven years more, when he was fourteen years old, he again went thither, and there stood the castle. When he had opened it, there was nothing within but a horse, a white one. Then the boy was so full of joy because he had a horse, that he mounted on it and galloped back to his father. Now I have a white horse, and I will travel, said he. So he set out, and as he was on his way, a pen was lying on the road. At first he thought he would pick it up, but then again he thought to himself, Thou shouldest leave it lying there. Thou wilt easily find a pen where thou art going, if thou hast need of one. As he was thus riding away, a voice called after him, Ferdinand the Faithful, take it with thee. He looked around, but saw no one. Then he went back again and picked it up. When he had ridden a little way farther, he passed a lake, and a fish was lying on the bank, gasping and panting for breath. So he said, Wait, my dear fish, I will help thee get into the water. And he took hold of it by the tail and threw it into the lake. Then the fish put its head out of the water and said, As thou hast helped me out of the mud, I will give thee a flute. When thou art in any need, play on it and then I will help thee. And if ever thou lettest anything fall in the water, just play it, and I will reach it out to thee. Then he rode away, and there came to him a man who asked him where he was going. Oh, to the next place. Then what his name was? Ferdinand the Faithful. So then we have got almost the same name. I am called Ferdinand the Unfaithful. And they both set out to the inn in the nearest place. Now it was unfortunate that Ferdinand the Unfaithful knew everything that the other had ever thought, and everything he was about to do. He knew it by means of all kinds of wicked arts. There was, however, in the inn an honest girl, who had a bright face and behaved very prettily. She fell in love with Ferdinand the Faithful because he was a handsome man, and she asked him whither he was going. Oh, I am just traveling round about, said he. Then she said he ought to stay there, for the king of that country wanted an attendant or an outrider, and he ought to enter his service. He answered he could not very well go to any one like that and offer himself. Then said the maiden, Oh, but I will soon do it for you. And so she went straight to the king and told him that she knew of an excellent servant for him. He was well pleased with that, and had Ferdinand the Faithful brought to him, and wanted to make him his servant. He, however, liked better to be an outrider, for where his horse was, there he also wanted to be. So the king made him an outrider. When Ferdinand the Unfaithful learnt that, he said to the girl, What, dost thou help him, and not me? Oh, said the girl, I will help thee too. She thought, I must keep friends with that man, for he is not to be trusted. She went to the king and offered him as a servant, and the king was willing. Now when the king met his lords in the morning, he always lamented and said, Oh, if I had but my love with me. Ferdinand the Unfaithful was, however, always hostile to Ferdinand the Faithful. So once, when the king was complaining thus, he said, You have the outrider. Send him away to get her, and if he does not do it, his head must be struck off. Then the king sent for Ferdinand the Faithful, and told him that there was, in this place, or in that place, a girl he loved, and that he was to bring her to him, and if he did not do it, he should die. Ferdinand the Faithful went into the stable to his white horse, and complained and lamented, Oh, what an unhappy man I am! Then someone behind him cried, 
Ferdinand the Faithful, why weepest thou? He looked round, but saw no one, and went on lamenting. Oh, my dear little white horse, now must I leave thee, now must I die. Then someone cried once more, Ferdinand the Faithful, why weepest thou? Then for the first time he was aware that it was his little white horse who was putting that question. Dost thou speak, my little white horse? Canst thou do that? And again he said, I am to go to this place and to that, and am to bring the bride. Canst thou tell me how I am to set about it? Then answered the little white horse, Go thou to the king, and say, If he will give thou what thou must have, thou wilt get her for him. If he will give thee a ship full of meat, and a ship full of bread, it will succeed. Great giants dwell on the lake, and if thou takest no meat with thee for them, they will tear thee to pieces. And there are the large birds which would pick the eyes out of thy head if thou hadst no bread for them. Then the king made all the butchers in the land kill, and all the bakers bake, that the ships might be filled. When they were full, the little white horse said to Ferdinand the Faithful, Now mount me, and go with me into the ship, and then when the giants come, say, Peace, peace, my dear little giants, I have had thought of ye, something I have brought for ye. And when the birds come, thou shalt again say, Peace, peace, my dear little birds, I have had thought of ye, something I have brought for ye. Then they will do nothing to thee, and when thou comest to the castle, the giants will help thee. Then go up to the castle, and take a couple of giants with thee. There the princess lies sleeping. Thou must, however, not awaken her, but the giants must lift her up, and carry her in her bed to the ship. And when everything took place as the little white horse had said, and Ferdinand the Faithful gave the giants and the birds what he had brought with him for them, and that made the giants willing, and they carried the princess in her bed to the king. And when she came to the king, she said she could not live. She must have her writings. They had been left in her castle. Then, by the instigation of Ferdinand the Unfaithful, Ferdinand the Faithful was called, and the king told him he must fetch the writings from the castle, or he should die. Then he went once more into the stable, and bemoaned himself, and said, O oh, my dear little white horse, now I am to go away again. How am I to do it? Then the little white horse said he was just to load the ships full again, so it happened again as it had happened before, and the giants and the birds were satisfied, and made gentle by the meat. When they came to the castle, the white horse told Ferdinand the Faithful that he must go in, and that on the table in the princess's bedroom lay the writings, and Ferdinand the Faithful went in and fetched them. When they were on the lake, he let his pen fall into the water. Then said the white horse, Now I cannot help thee at all. But he remembered his flute, and began to play on it. And the fish came with a pen in its mouth, and gave it to him. So he took the writings to the castle where the wedding was celebrated. The queen, however, did not love the king, because he had no nose. But she would have much liked to love Ferdinand the Faithful. Once, therefore, when all the lords of the court were together, the queen said she could do feats of magic, that she could cut off anyone's head and put it on again, and that one of them ought just to try it. But none of them would be the first. So Ferdinand the Faithful, again at the instigation of Ferdinand the Unfaithful, undertook it, and she hewed off his head and put it on again for him, and they healed together directly, so that it looked as if it had a red thread round his throat. Then the king said to her, My child, and where hast thou learnt that? Yes, she said, I understand the art. Shall I just try it on thee also? Oh, yes, said he. But she cut off his head, and did not put it on again, but pretended that she could not get it on, and that it would not keep fixed. Then the king was buried, but she married Ferdinand the Faithful. He, however, always rode on his white horse, and once, when he was seated on it, it told him that he was to go on to the heath which he knew, and gallop three times around it. And when he had done that, the white horse stood up on its hind legs and was changed into a king's son. End of Story 126
Story 127 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Iron Stove. In the days when wishing was still of some use, a king's son was bewitched by an old witch and shut up in an iron stove in a forest. There he passed many years, and no one could deliver him. Then a king's daughter came into the forest, who had lost herself, and could not find her father's kingdom again. After she had wandered about for nine days, she at length came to the iron stove. Then a voice came forth from it, and asked her, Whence comest thou, and whither goest thou? She answered, I have lost my father's kingdom, and cannot get home again. Then a voice inside the iron stove said, I will help thee to get home again, and that indeed most swiftly, if thou wilt promise to do what I desire of thee. I am the son of a far greater king than thy father, and I will marry thee. Then was she afraid and thought, Good heavens, what can I do with an iron stove? But as she much wished to get home to her father, she promised to do as he desired. But he said, Thou shalt return here, and bring a knife with thee, and scrape a hole in the iron. Then he gave her a companion, who walked near her, but did not speak. But in two hours he took her home. There was a great joy in the castle when the king's daughter came home, and the old king fell on her neck and kissed her. She, however, was sorely troubled, and said, Dear father, what I have suffered! I should never have got home again from the great wild forest if I had not come to an iron stove, but I have been forced to give my word that I will go back to it, set it free, and marry it. Then the old king was so terrified that he all but fainted, for he had but this one daughter. They therefore resolved they would send in her place the miller's daughter, who was very beautiful. They took her there, gave her a knife, and said, she was to scrape at the iron stove. So she scraped at it for four and twenty hours, but could not bring off the least morsel of it. When the day dawned, a voice in the stove said, It seems to me it is day outside. Then she answered, It seems so to me too. I fancy I hear the noise of my father's mill. So thou art a miller's daughter. Then go thy way at once, and let the king's daughter come here. Then she went away at once, and told the old king that the man outside there would have none of her. He wanted the king's daughter. They, however, still had a swineherd's daughter, who was even prettier than the miller's daughter, and they determined to give her a piece of gold to go to the iron stove instead of the king's daughter. So she was taken thither, and she also had to scrape for four and twenty hours. She, however made nothing of it. When day broke, a voice inside the stove cried, It seems to me it is day outside, then answered she. So it seems to me also. I fancy I hear my father's horn blowing. Then thou art a swineherd's daughter. Go away at once, and tell the king's daughter to come, and tell her all must be done as promised, and if she does not come, everything the kingdom shall be ruined and destroyed and not one stone be left standing on another. When the king's daughter heard that, she began to weep. But now there was nothing for it but to keep her promise. So she took leave of her father, put a knife in her pocket, and went forth to the iron stove in the forest. When she got there, she began to scrape, and the iron gave way. And when two hours were over, she had already scraped a small hole. Then she peeped in, and saw a youth so handsome, and so brilliant with gold and with precious jewels that her very soul was delighted. Now, therefore, she went on scraping and made the hole so large that he was able to get out. Then said he, Thou art mine, and I am thine. Thou art my bride, and hast released me. He wanted to take her away with him to his kingdom, but she entreated him to let her go once again to her father, and the king's son allowed her to do so. But she was not to say more to her father than three words, 
and then she was to come back again. So she went home, but she spoke more than three words, and instantly the iron stove disappeared and was taken far away over glass mountains and piercing swords. But the king's son was set free and no longer shut up in it. After this, she bade good-bye to her father, took some money with her, but not much, and went back to the great forest and looked for the iron stove, but there was nowhere to be found. For nine days she sought it, and then her hunger grew so great that she did not know what to do, for she could no longer live. When it was evening, she seated herself in a small tree and made up her mind to spend the night there, as she was afraid of wild beasts. When midnight drew near, she saw in the distance a small light and thought, Ah, there I should be saved. She got down from the tree and went towards the light, but on the way she prayed. Then she came to a little old house, and much grass had grown all about it, and a small heap of wood lay in front of it. She thought, Ah, whither have I come? and peeped in through the window, but she saw nothing inside but toads, big and little, except a table well covered with wine and roast meat, and the plates and glasses were of silver. Then she took courage and knocked at the door. The fat toad cried, Little green waiting maid, waiting maid with limping leg, little dog of limping leg, hop hither and thither, and quickly see who is without and a small toad came walking by and opened the door to her. When she entered, they all bade her welcome, and she was forced to sit down. They asked, Where hast thou come from, and whither art thou going? And she related all that had befallen her, and how, because she had transgressed the order which had been given to her, not to say more than three words, the stove and the king's son also had disappeared. And now... She was about to seek him over hill and dale until she found him. Then the old fat one said, Little green waiting maid, waiting maid with limping leg, little dog of limping leg, hop hither and thither and bring me the great box. Then the little one went and brought the box. After this they gave her meat and drink and took her to a well-made bed which felt like silk and velvet and she laid herself therein in God's name and slept. When morning came, she arose, and the old toad gave her three needles out of the great box which she was to take with her. They would be needed by her, for she had to cross a high glass mountain and go over three piercing sores and a great lake. If she did all this, she would get her lover back again. Then she gave her three things which she was to take the greatest care of, namely three large needles, a plough wheel, and three nuts. With these she travelled onwards, and when she came to the glass mountain, which was so slippery, she stuck the three needles first behind her feet, and then before them, and so got over it. And when she was over it, she hid them in a place which she marked carefully. After this she came to the three piercing swords, and then she seated herself on her plough wheel and rolled over them. At last she arrived in front of a great lake, and when she had crossed it, she came to a large and beautiful castle. She went in and asked for a place. She was a poor girl, she said, and would like to be hired. She knew, however, that the king's son, whom she had released from the iron stove in the great forest, was in the castle. Then she was taken as a scullery maid, at low wages, but already the king's son had another maiden by his side, whom he wanted to marry, for he thought that she had long been dead. In the evening, when she had washed up and was done, she felt in her pocket and found the three nuts which the old toad had given her. She cracked one with her teeth, and was going to eat the kernel, when, lo and behold, there was a stately royal garment in it. But when the bride heard of this, she came and asked for the dress and wanted to buy it, and said, It is not a dress for a servant girl. But she said, No, she would not sell it. But if the bride would grant her one thing, she should have it. And that was, leave to sleep one night in her bridegroom's chamber. The bride gave her permission, because the dress was so pretty, 
and she had never had one like it. When it was evening, she said to her bridegroom, That silly girl will sleep in thy room. If thou art willing, so am I, said he. She, however, gave him a glass of wine in which she had poured a sleeping draught. So the bridegroom and the scullery maid went to sleep in the room, and he slept so soundly that she could not waken him. She wept the whole night and cried, I set thee free when thou wert in an iron stove in the wild forest. I sought thee, and walked over a glass mountain, and three sharp swords, and a great lake before I found thee, and yet thou wilt not hear me. The servant sat by the chamber door, and heard how she thus wept the whole night through, and in the morning they told it to their lord. And the next evening, when she had washed up, she opened the second nut, and a far more beautiful dress was in it, and when the bride beheld it, she wished to buy that also. But the girl would not take money, and begged that she might once again sleep in the bridegroom's chamber. The bride, however, gave him a sleeping drink, and he slept so soundly that he could hear nothing. But the scullery maid wept the whole night long and cried, I set thee free when thou wert in an iron stove in the wild forest. I sought thee, and walked over a glass mountain, and over three sharp swords, and a great lake before I found thee, and yet thou wilt not hear me. The servant sat by the chamber door, and heard her weeping the whole night through, and in the morning informed their lord of it. On the third evening, when she had washed up, she opened the third nut, and within it was a still more beautiful dress, which was stiff with pure gold. When the bride saw that, she wanted to have it, but the maiden only gave it up on condition that she might for the third time sleep in the bridegroom's apartment. The king's son was, however, on his guard, and threw the sleeping draught away. Now, therefore, when she began to weep and to cry, Dearest love, I set thee free when thou wert in the iron stove in the terrible wild forest. The king's son leapt up and said, Thou art the true one, thou art mine, and I am thine. Thereupon, while it was still night, he got into a carriage with her, and they took away the false bride's clothes, so that she could not get up. When they came to the great lake, they sailed across it, and when they reached the three sharp cutting swords, they seated themselves on the plow wheel, and when they got to the glass mountain, they thrust the three needles in it, and so at length, they got to the little old house. But when they went inside that, it was a great castle, and the toads were all disenchanted, and were king's children, and full of happiness. Then the wedding was celebrated, and the king's son and the princess remade in the castle, which was much larger than the castles of their fathers. As, however, the old king grieved at being left alone, they fetched him away, and brought him to live with them. They had two kingdoms, and lived in happy wedlock. A mouse did run. This story is done. End of story 127。Story 128 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Lazy Spinner. In a certain village there once lived a man and his wife, and the wife was so idle that she would never work at anything. Whatever her husband gave her to spin, she did not get done, and what she did spin, she did not wind, but let it all remain entangled in a heap. If the man scolded her, she was always ready with her tongue and said, Well, how should I wind it when I have no reel? Just you go into the forest and get me one. If that is all, said the man, then I will go into the forest and get some wood for making reels. Then the woman was afraid that if he had the wood he would make her a reel of it, and she would have to wind her yarn off and then begin to spin again. She bethought herself a little, and then a lucky idea occurred to her, and she secretly followed the man into the forest, and when he had climbed into a tree to choose and cut the wood, she crept into the thicket below, where he could not see her, and cried. 
He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who winds shall perish. The man listened, laid down his axe for a moment, and began to consider what that could mean. Hello, he said at last. What can that have been? My ears must have been singing. I won't alarm myself for nothing. So he again seized the axe and began to hew. Then again there came a cry from below. He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who winds shall perish. He stopped and felt afraid and alarmed, and pondered over the circumstance. But when a few moments had passed, he took heart again, and a third time he stretched out his hand for the axe and began to cut. But someone called out a third time and said loudly, He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who winds shall perish. That was enough for him, and all inclination had departed from him, so he hastily descended the tree and set out on his way home. The woman ran as fast as she could by byways so as to get home first. So when he entered the parlour, she put on an innocent look as if nothing had happened, and said, Well, have you brought a nice piece of wood for reels? No, said he, I see very well that winding won't do, and told her what had happened to him in the forest, and from that time forth left her in peace about it. Nevertheless, after some time, the man again began to complain of the disorder in the house. Wife, said he, it is really a shame that the spun yarn should lie there all entangled. I'll tell you what, said she, as we still don't come by any reel, you go up into the loft, and I will stand down below and will throw the yarn up to you, and you will throw it down to me, and so we shall get a skein after all. Yes, that will do, said the man. So they did that, and when it was done, he said, The yarn is in skeins, now it must be boiled. The woman was again distressed. She certainly said, Yes, we will boil it next morning early. But she was secretly contriving another trick. Early in the morning she got up, lighted a fire, and put the kettle on. Only instead of the yarn, she put in a lump of tow and let it boil. After that she went to the man, who was still lying in bed, and said to him, I must just go out. You must get up and look after the yarn which is in the kettle on the fire. But you must be at hand at once. Mind that, for if the cock should happen to crow, and you are not attending to the yarn, it will become tow. The man was willing, and took good care not to loiter. He got up as quickly as he could and went into the kitchen. But when he reached the kettle and peeped in, he saw to his horror nothing but a lump of tow. Then the poor man was as still as a mouse, thinking he had neglected it and was to blame, and in future said no more about yarn and spinning. But you yourself must own she was an odious woman. End of story 128